Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> The Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time, Harold Peary as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, a tip for you men folks who love macaroni and cheese. If you hanker for light macaroni with cheese goodness all through and through, better mention Kraft Dinner to the little woman. For with Kraft Dinner, she can make swell macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes cooking time. You see, the Kraft Dinner package holds a special kind of macaroni that cooks tender in seven minutes by the clock. And then you sprinkle the cheese goodness all through it with the Kraft grated that also comes in the Kraft Dinner box. You're all set, ready to fork in. Sound swell? It is. Just say to your wife, let's have that quick-made macaroni and cheese. Kraft Dinner. Remind her to buy Kraft Dinner tomorrow. And now let's join the great Gildersleeve, who's listening in the reception room at one of the Summerfield radio stations while his friend Judge Hooker is finishing his regular daily talk on The Child in the Home and What to Do About It. that rocks the cradle rules the world. So in conclusion, remember all you dear mothers... Oh, hurry up, you old gas bag. Remember that as the twig is bent, the tree is inclined. Now he's branching off into forestry. Let us not forget that point in molding the little mind. You've certainly got a moldy little mind, Jack. And now I see that my time is up. So, until you next gather round your radio... With an axe in your hand. <laughs> this is Judge Horace Hooker inviting you to send in your child problem. And you'll get a childish answer. <laughs> until then, good evening. Yes, maybe now we can get home and have some dinner. Imagine any silly woman listening to a... Uh, uh, now you are going to have to excuse me, ladies. You, uh, I must dash away. <laughs> it was so sweet of you to drop in. Yes, yeah, simply peachy. Come on, Judge. All right, Gilly. Goodbye, girls. Yeah. Goodbye, Goodbye, girls. Sometimes I don't understand women, and this is one of the times. Yes, what do you mean, Throckmorton? Well, how can they listen to advice on raising children... I'm a crabby old goat who hasn't any kids of his own. What's that got to do with it? Just because a hen lays them doesn't mean she's a judge of eggs, does it? <laughs> I don't know about that. You lay them too, and you're certainly an egg judge. <laughs> I know what's troubling you, Gildy. You're just jealous. Uh, jealous? Me? Of what? Of the popularity I've achieved on the air. Uh... Every time you hear some woman praise my program, you look as green as a pickle and twice as sour. <laughs> I do not. I wouldn't be jealous of you, even if you deserved all this silly attention you've been getting. Oh, now I don't deserve what I'm getting. No, and you're not getting what you deserve, either. <laughs> Why, I'd bet $100 you wouldn't last a month if people had any other program to tune in on instead of yours. Oh, you would, would you? Are you talking through your hat, or do you mean that, Gildersleeve? Of course I mean it. Okay, put your money where your mouth is. Yes, <laughs> What money? You just bet me a hundred bucks I won't stay on the air a month. Now, wait a minute. That isn't what I said at oh, all, Judge. Oh, I... crawling out of it, huh? Backwatering. It's backwatering. Why, George, I'm not. I'll go through with it. It's a bet. Okay, shake. No, sir. This is going to be a grudge bet. We'll seal the deal by not shaking hands. <laughs> And the worst part about the whole bet, Leroy, is that I was so excited I forgot to ask for odds. Is that why you're writing all those letters to station WVU, telling them Judge Hooker should be playing snooker? It, but how else can I win? Why don't you get the station to put you on the air instead of the judge? Well, what could I do, my boy? Well, maybe you could tell jokes. Who? Me? Tell jokes on the radio? What do you think I am, Leroy? A comedian? <laughs> no, but gee, there must be something you could do. You used to sing, didn't you, Uncle? Yes, in college. In fact, when I was young, I had operatic aspirations. You did? Did they hurt much, Uncle Mort? <laughs> Only the neighbors, my boy. 
Although for a while I thought I was going to be another Caruso. You mean the neighbors wanted to put you on a desert island? Yep. <laughs> no, Leroy, not Robinson Crusoe, Enrico Caruso. He was a very famous tenor. Oh, what stopped you from being a famous tenor, Unc? I was a baritone. <laughs> You know, all this brings back memories of my old singing professor, Senor Tomás Volcón. Oh, a Spaniard? No, Leroy. He was Portuguese from Brazil. I still remember how he would talk to me. Rock Morton, he would say, if only Jew had less fortissimo in the pianissimo, your merendo wouldn't have so much crescendo. <laughs> what did he mean, Unc? I never found out, but I think it was a Portuguese compliment. <laughs> Yeah, I'm convinced you're still a swell singer, Uncle Mort. You are? Well, when did you hear me sing? Well, every time you take a bath. Yes. Why, yesterday morning, Bertie stopped to listen to you, and she said she never heard anything like it. it... Say, why don't you sing on the air? Oh, Leroy. <laughs> Do you really think I could? Sure. Why don't you try the rival radio station to WVU? Uh, you mean KQQQ? Well, I never thought of that. What would I sing? Well, if you want the ladies to listen to you instead of Judge Hooker, you better sing mushy love songs. Well, I I have got a romantic voice. When the boo-boo of the boo-boo. <laughs> I have got a romantic voice, all right. Too bad I haven't got the figure to go with it. <laughs> Say, Uncle Mort. Huh? Why don't you be a mystery man and, and, and wear a mask like the Lone Ranger? Oh, yes, a mask might help. <laughs> <laughs> and there's an evening cape somewhere around the house, too. Yeah, and you could pretend you're a Brazilian, or like your teacher, the senior. It, senor. <laughs> by George, this is beginning to look like a very good idea, my boy. Of course, we'll have to keep it all a secret. Uh, not very dignified of me, you know. Sure. Now, all you need is a different name. Something uh, Portugal and romantical. Uh, Portugal and romantical. Let me see. Uh, uh, how about Ricardo? Ricardo? Yeah. Not bad at all. Sounds like the name of a cigar. What do you think I'm smoking? Eh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Does this hat look all right, Leroy? Sure, Unc. It's a super duper. Yeah. Now, now wrap the cape around you closer so you don't look so spread out. Yep. <laughs> How's that? That's swell. Now the mask. There. It's warm under here. I hope this doesn't slip down when I hit a high note. Eh, me, 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 me. Well, I guess it's all right. Now, now, don't forget your Brazilian accent, Unc. Oh, no, my boy. Well, as they say in Portuguese, adios, rapazinho. Gee, what does that mean? That's goodbye in Brazil. Oh, well, carbolic acid, Unc. <laughs> What's that, Leroy? That's goodbye in any language. <laughs> oh, for corn's sake, Leroy. <laughs> you go back and sit in the car, young man. Hello, KQQQ, the voice of Summerfield. One moment, madam. Hello, KQQQ. Ah, good evening, senorita. Oh. I am demanding to see the manager. Oh, my, my goodness, was this a hold-up? What do you mean? Uh, oh, the mask? Uh, no, senorita. I no hold-up you, and don't you hold-up me. <laughs> Where is the manager of this radio station? Mr. Newt Bauer is right in there in the studio. Ah, muchas gracias, senorita. Uh, manager Newt Bowser? Yeah? Senor, the time has come. From now on, today is pink letter day for the station KQQQ. <laughs> and because it was the day Ricardo, the mysterious romantic Brazilian baritone, she's first made the show up to sing. Oh, you're a singer. Sure. I am the best baritone this side the Amazon River. And on the other side, she's no better also. <laughs> well, you'll have to give us an audition someday. Audition? Sure. No time like the president. Please do have a sit down and relax a minute, eh? I will play and sing for you like thank goodness you never heard up till lately. <laughs> Sweet girl of my dreams, hear my song, I implore you. Soul of my soul, hear my gay serenade. Deep. Oh, I can't stand it. It's too beautiful. <laughs> How you like, senor? Terrific, no? Si, 
Say, that's wonderful. Who are you, anyway? I am not anyway. I am Ricardo. <laughs> The Ed is Nelson of South America. <laughs> Say, what are you doing here in Summerfield? Well, perhaps there is in this city a senorita for whom my heart she beats but 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 but. <laughs> Who should be telling? Oh, I see. Romance. Huh? I'm not saying yes and I'm not saying uh-uh. <laughs> Do you want me on your station? Well, that depends on how much money you want. What I care for money. All I want is to sing every day from five story to six. Well, fine, but that's not such a good time. That's when Judge Hooker talks over WVU, the rival station. What I care for George Hooker. You wait and look. Once Ricardo starts singing, no one listen to George. This Hooker, she will get the hook. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, tonight it is KQQQ's extreme pleasure to introduce for the first time on the air that sensational Brazilian baritone, the masked mystery of Melody Ricardo. Boas noites, senhoras e senhoritas. Para mi primeira cantiga, e vou cantar um balado delicado, which is meaning in plain English, ladies and girls, good night. <laughs> Greetings from Ricardo, the singing loafer. For my first song, I will murder you with a lovely ballad, La Rosita. <laughs> Sweet girl of my dreams, hear my song, I implore you. Soul of my soul, hear my gay serenade. At two clubs. <laughs> oh, girls, did you hear that gorgeous new sing on KQQQ last night? Oh, you mean Ricardo. Oh, yes, he's simply divine. Everybody in town is talking about him, two spades. Oh, yes, isn't he wonderful? And he's got the most romantic accent. I like it because it's so foreign. He's from Brazil, and I'm just too no Trump. <laughs> hey, have you heard him, Margie? No, no, I was out yesterday. Say, who is this Ricardo? You know, Miss Callahan? Well, I'm one of the owners of the station, but all I can find out is that he sneaks into the studio wearing a wide-brimmed hat down over his eyes and a black cloak up to his chin and a mask across his face. Sounds like a combination of Superman, the Shadow, and Red Rider. <laughs> oh, I mean, he's just that handsomest thing with great big brown eyes and long, long lashes to be no Trump. <laughs> <laughs> and a willowy figure. Oh, I heard he had blonde hair with blue eyes and the most athletic build. Well, Nancy Quinn says that he isn't really a real Brazilian. She claims he comes from someplace in South America for no Trump. Well, I certainly have to listen. What time is he on? At the same time as Judge Hooker. Only from now on, I'm going to listen to Ricardo. Oh, so am I. Oh, me too. I just love to listen to his voice. It's got a quality in it that just makes my scalp tingle five no Trump. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness, look at these cars. How did I ever get tricked into being five no Trump? Oh, oh my God. God. I will always adore you. I love you, my Rosita, for Adios, lovely ladies. I want to thank you for the fan letters, the telephone numbers, and everything. <laughs> Tomorrow, at the same time, I'll be with you again. Oh, how I'll be with you again. A sweet dream. Say, where'd you get all the cakes and cookies and donuts? Uh, fan mail, my boy. He's all for Ricardo. Oh, can I have some Uncle Ricardo? Yeah, shh, Leroy. Of course you can. Try that chocolate fudge cake, huh? Gee, did you see the card with it? Where? Uh, just to show you what a little oven can do little. from Miss Rosita Callahan. Little oven. Now, that old maid. <laughs> Say, she and her brother own that row of stores we've been trying to buy. Gosh, maybe now you can get it for a song, huh? No, Leroy. She wouldn't like it if she learned the truth. Oh, Mr. Gillespie, you've got visitors. Oh, uh, who is it, Bertie? There's a gentleman and also Judge Hooker. Yeah, I'll be right there. <laughs> Uh, hide the pastry, my boy. Okay, I got a swell place to hide it, Unc. Here's where I collect a hundred bucks from Judge Hooker. 
Oh, hello, Judge. How's Mother's Little Helper these days? I understand that since KQQ has had this wonderful new singer, you're getting about as much attention as Father gets on Mother's Day. Gildy, we came to talk to you about that fella. Oh, you know Pat Callahan, don't you? Oh, hello, yes, hello, hello. hello. We've had an important real estate deal pending you know, for a long time, haven't we, Callahan? Well, that can wait, Gildersleeve. We represent a group of substantial citizens who are fed up with this singer, Ricardo. Yes, we dislike his effect on our women folks. All they do is listen to Ricardo and talk about Ricardo and dream about Ricardo. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yes. Man comes home from work tired and hungry. What does he get? Ricardo. <laughs> Is that, uh, is that bad? <laughs> Terrible. Look at my sister. Just because her name's Rosita and this bum of a baritone sings a theme song called Rosita, she thinks he's warbling to her. As a result, what happens? I catch her baking cakes for this guy with sugar she got with my ration book. <laughs> But uh, ha why have you boys come to me? Well, you haven't any women folk who'd put you in the doghouse if they found out what you'd done. Why don't you get Judge Hooker to do something? Oh, I'm in a peculiar position. Everybody would think I was jealous. Yes, and everybody would be right. <laughs> Look, I'm through horsing around, Gildersleeve. Do you still want to buy that property at your own price? Why, of course. Then first you've got to see that this wandering minstrel starts wandering again, understand? Yes, I'm afraid so, but I really hate to do it. Why, Gildersleeve? Well, if I succeed in removing this wonderful artist with a golden voice from the radio, Good music in this country is going to be set back another ten years. The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few minutes. Meanwhile, let's consider that chicken or roast you had left over from dinner today. Not quite enough for dinner tomorrow? Well, let me tell you how to stretch and glamorize what is left into a thrifty main dish. Cream the leftover meat and serve it in a delicious ring of macaroni and cheese. Macaroni and cheese that you cook in just seven minutes. You do it with the product called Kraft Dinner. In every box of Kraft Dinner, there's a special quick-cooking macaroni. Also, some Kraft grated that puts the cheese flavor through and through in a jiffy. Just seven minutes at the stove, and you have fluffy, tender macaroni drenched in cheese goodness. For a smart macaroni ring, press the macaroni and cheese into a ring mold. Let it stand for a few minutes, unmold on a platter, and pour your cream meat into the center. A very exciting-looking, thrifty dish. Kraft Dinner itself costs very little, so stock up tomorrow on several packages of Kraft Dinner. And now back to Uncle Mort, who by now is about half dead from leading a double life. As Ricardo, the Romeo from Rio, he's got the wives of Summerfield throwing rocks at their husbands. And as Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve... He's promised to run Ricardo out of town. But at the moment, Ricardo is still going to town. Deep in my heart, I will always adore you. I love the jewel, my Rosita, for And so once more, Ricardo, she's saying adios, caras lindas. Which means in the language of my country, bye-bye, all you sweet ladies. My art and me, we stop beating each other till we meet again. <laughs> Good night. I'm telling you, Ricardo, that program was absolutely tops. It's tops? Oh, yes. Tops is yo-yos, what has been grounded. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was wonderful. Uh, all the telephone lines are simply flooded with messages for you. Just messages? No more cookies? Oh, yes, lots of them, too. Uh, wait a minute, Ricky. Before you sneak out the back way again, I'd like to talk business with you. No, Mr. Newsbuzzer. Music and business is don't mix. So I am keeping the music and giving you the business. <laughs> no, hold on. Don't go. Huh? I'm not going to keep asking you to reveal your identity or even take off that mask. But I'm in a spot and I need your help to get off it. Sorry, but Ricardo is not spot remover. No. <laughs> well, this is serious. One of our biggest stockholders phoned up and said that if I didn't arrange a meeting between the masked baritone and her, she'd fire me. Oh, what a dory trick. Uh, she's waiting to see you, Ricky. You'll go out and meet her, won't you? To save my job. Well, okay. But only because that's an awful dory trick on you. Oh, swell. Uh, the lady's name is Rosita Callahan. Rosita Callahan? <laughs> oh, that's an awful dory trick on me. <laughs> Yes. I 
am supposing to be having a disappointment with Senorita Rosita Callahan. <laughs> Aren't you him? Oh, yes. And yo, Ricardo, I recognize you immediately by your mask. Uh, oh, come in, come in. Well, what are you afraid of? We're all alone. That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> Well, don't just stand there. Come in. Yes, yeah, thank you. Oh, I've got a lovely dinner just for the two of us. I prepared it all with my own little hands. I'm very sorry, but I never eat such big dinners. Oh. <laughs> no, now. Uh, won't you take off your hat and your cape and uh, your mask? Oh, no. We have such nice visitation, and I got to leave. As Shakespeare, he say, parting is such sweet sorrow. Goodbye, maybe I see you doing after tomorrow. <laughs> Please don't leave so soon. But I got to go. It's not safe in this city. All the mans are jealous. They are gunning for me with a rope. Uh, a rope? Certamente. They tell me if I'm not left Somerville by noon tomorrow, they'll all take me out to Lynch. <laughs> Men. The men are your brother, George Hooker, and lots of jealous fellows. Well, the women of this town will have something to say about that. Yeah. Oh, Rosita, I came out early. Oh, oh my goodness, well, that's my brother. He mustn't find you here. Lady, you are saying a house fool. Oh, quick. Now, uh, hide someplace. Uh, get under the sofa. Sofa? Madam, I am a singer, not a midget. <laughs> Which way is the back door? Out through the dining room. And hurry, I'll try to divert his attention. Yeah, uh, goodbye, Senorita. If I never see you some more, the pleasure is all mine. <laughs> Da di 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 da da di di da da. Yes, yes. Bertie, must you sing that song? Well, it ain't compulsory, Mister Gilsey, but it's mighty pretty. That's the song that Ricardo boy used to sing. Oh yes, Ricardo boy. Huh? Uh huh. He might have been a foreigner, but he sure had a nice domesticated voice. Any news in the paper? Uh, let's see. Uh, Brazilian baritone missing. Failed to appear on schedule program last evening. Foul play feared. Women storm City Hall. Police Chief Ken Dolan orders dragnet. Well, then he sure is a goner. Any time they orders a dragnet drug, that means the worst has already happened. Now, now, Bertie, don't let this thing upset you. After all, a man was just a gypsy who probably tired of Summerfield and merely rolled up his tent and stole away. <laughs> Well, he stole him out the hop away, too. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'll just finish my dusting later. Oh, my goodness, Bertie, too. Well, maybe I shouldn't have... Uh, do you mind seeing who that is, my boy? No, 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 Oh, hello, Mr. Hooker, step right in. Where's your big fat? Oh, hello, Gildersleeve. <laughs> hey, hey, congratulations. That was a swell job you did. The job? What do you mean? Getting rid of that soft soap artist who made all of the ladies neglect my nice educational program. Uh, hey, did you hear? I'm going back on the air. Yeah, I still collect on that bet, though. Oh, I don't mind paying at all. I'll send you a check in the morning. Well, you better not forget. Or Ricardo might forget to stay away. But how did you manage it, Gildy? No, no, no. Don't don't tell me. That'd make me an accessory. Yeah. Uh, Leroy! I'm getting it up. Okay. <laughs> Brock Morton P. Gildersleeve live here. Well, of course he does. If you don't use your eyes, officer, you see it by the mayor. Oh, and look who's with him, Judge Hooker. The one poor Ricardo told me had threatened him. What's that? They were proceed to Callahan. <laughs> oh, hello, Miss Callahan. Uh, to what do we owe the pleasure of this visit to Art? Oh, don't you dare speak to me. I finally wormed the truth out of my brother. Oh, my goodness, you did? Yes. He told me how you threatened and intimidated my dear little Ricardo and probably did away with him, too. Officer, arrest that man for the murder of my fiancé, Ricardo. Yeah, now, just a second, Miss Callahan. We haven't any evidence. Yes, don't you go around accusing a man of being your fiancé unless you can back it up. <laughs> Quiet, you. <laughs> We're investigating the disappearance of that singer from KQQQ. Did you do it? Me? Why, I never even heard him sing over at KQQQQ. Have I, Leroy? Oh, no, you never heard him on the radio, huh? Yeah. Well, if that's true, lady, he hasn't got no motive for bumping the guy off. I tell you, my brother confessed the whole thing. It was a plot to keep me and my darling Ricardo apart. And Judge Hooker... Excuse me, I'm busy with an important case. So am I, Judge. Come on back here. Jim, one moment. You quit giving orders to my guests, officer. I know a little bit about law myself. If you haven't any evidence that a crime was committed, you can't come in barging in here bothering us. 
Guilty or right? Yeah, now drag those big flat feet of yours out of here. <laughs> and take Rosita with you. I'm telling them, Uncle. Uh, Come on, Miss Callahan, he's right. Hey, Kenny, how are you doing? Oh, that's my partner. Never mind coming in, Wally. We can't pin nothing on this guy. Oh, no? Well, look what I found out in this guy's garage, in the trunk of his car. <gasps> oh, it's Ricardo's tape and mask and hat. It's what? Okay, Gildersleeve, what did you do with the body? <laughs> you won't talk, huh? Why don't you tell him, Uncle? You quiet, young man. All right. We're dragging you and the kid down to headquarters. We got why you to making you guys talk. Come on. Yeah, this is going to be one of my bad days. <laughs> It's almost supper time. They'll keep us here all night if you don't tell them the truth. If I ever told the truth, young man, I'd be the laughing stock of Summerfield. Besides, I'd never collect that hundred bucks from Judge Hooker. Yeah, but if you don't confess, they're going to hang you for bumping yourself off. They can't. <laughs> they can't do that. They haven't even got a dead body. They will have after they hang you. <laughs> yeah. Shh, shh. Yeah, here come the police back again. Now, I don't know what's with this guy. Let's see what we can get out of him by throwing a scare into him, huh? Yeah, sure, Teddy. Now, okay, Gildersleeve, we're going to give you a little third degree. Teddy, you got the rubber hoses? Yeah, right here, Wally. Rubber hoses? Oh, great jumping jeeps. <laughs> All right, let's commence. Sure. Only suppose he starts yelling. Uh, we don't want any kickback. Turn on the radio real loud so nobody will hear him. Yeah, okay. You guys cut that out. Leave my uncle Mort alone. He never hurt anybody in his life. Don't you dare touch him. Oh, my In my song, I implore you. All of my soul. Hey, wait a minute. That's him. That's the guy on the radio. Turn it off. Yeah, okay. Say, what's going on around here? I'll tell you what's going on. There'll be a suit for false arrest going on here if you don't let my nephew and me out of here right now. But I don't get it. You heard that fellow Ricardo singing on the radio just now, didn't you? Oh, yeah, but... Uh, then how, you, how dare you hold me for his disappearance? Now open that door. Well, well sure, sure. Uh, no hard feelings, is there, Mr. Gildersleeve? No, not at all. But never do that to me again. <laughs> Come on, Leroy. Gee, I don't get it. I don't get it either anymore. How can you be here with me and still sing from KQQQ at the same time? Uh, shh, Leroy, let's hurry out of here before these policemen find out that they were listening to an electrical transcription. <laughs> Frankly, Marjorie, uh, what did you think of this, Ricardo? Oh, Uncle Mort, I thought you were just wonderful. Uh, uh, you knew it was me all along? But, but how did you know? That evening case you were wearing all around town happened to be mine. What? Uh, good night. <laughs> <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Ever wonder about how to cut down the food budget these days? Well, most homemakers do, so here's a hint. You can economize and please your family, too, by serving them parquet margarine, the delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. You'll find parquet margarine is a mighty good-tasting spread on bread or toast or rolls. Yes, and parquet is so economical, you can use all you want in cooking, too, to add that delicate extra flavor that only a delicious spread for bread can give. So get a pound or two of economical parquet margarine tomorrow. Remember, it's nourishing and wholesome, one of the best energy foods you can serve. And every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. Yes, tomorrow, sure, ask for Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, one of Kraft's fine foods. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> The 
Jell-O program, coming to you from Matherfield, California, presented by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny. With Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with Army Air Corps. Have you noticed in Jello is the That was Army Air Corps played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our broadcast today originates from Mather Field, near Sacramento. Mather Field, where Uncle Sam's Eagles of the Sky are trained. Yes, sir. Those young men whose flying ability and courage make them unquestioned monarchs as they soar through the clouds. <laughs> you said it. So, without further ado, we bring you a man who gets dizzy when he looks over the edge of a teacup, <laughs> Jack Benny. <laughs> Thank you, fellas, thank you. Jello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, that was a fine build-up. Imagine saying I get dizzy when I look over the edge of a teacup. <laughs> Why, well, read fortunes in a gypsy tea room. I'm no softy. Well, Jack, all I read was... I but... don't care what you meant. And for your information, Don, when I was a youngster in Waukegan, Illinois, I was the first person there to fly. To fly? Why, well, I never knew that. Well, it's a fact. When I was about seven years old, my father gave me a great big kite... I tied the string around my waist like a darn fool. A tornado came along, and I landed in St. Joe, Missouri. St. <laughs> Joe. They love you there. <laughs> now, cut out that ad living. <laughs> you orchestra boys are here just to blow your brains out. And about one more toot should do it. <laughs> But anyway, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's the truth, Don. I was on the end of that kite, and I lit in good old St. Joe. But, Jack, weren't you hurt when he came down? Uh, no, Don. You see, my ears stuck out in those days, and I glided right into a three-point landing. <laughs> Two elbows and my cigar. <laughs> oh, really, I, uh, I wasn't hurt at all. A cigar? My goodness, Jack. Did you smoke a cigar when you were seven years old? I had it in my mouth, Don, but I didn't light it until I was 21. <laughs> I had terrific willpower. Well, if it isn't our own little bundle for broadcasting. Hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hi, you fellas. Compact. <laughs> Hey, you did all right. Well, Mary, um, how do you like it at Matherfield? Oh, swell. But you know, Jack, all the boys here are so bashful. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, they, uh, they are a rather quiet group of fellows, you know. And they're so shy and reserved. That's right, that's right. All they think about is aviation. Yeah, now let's start over and quit kidding. <laughs> Now you're talking. Say, Mary, I noticed you're wearing a pair of wings on your lapel. Where'd you get them? Oh, the cutest aviator gave them to me. <laughs> what a doll. Gave them to you? Mary, these boys aren't supposed to give away their wings. Well, he didn't give them to me exactly. When he backed away, they stuck to my coat. <laughs> oh, 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 I see. You, you kissed him. And you, uh, you just met the fellow? Well, he reminded me that it was Mother's Day, so what could I do? <laughs> well, I was sweet of you, Mary. So you gave... Uh-huh. Good. Well, at least it started out that way. <laughs> Mary, why is it that every time we play a camp, you have to always... Hey, Mr. Benny, speaking of Mother's Day, you know... Oh, I... oh hello, Dennis. Hello. Well, say, Mister Benny. Speaking of Mother's Day, you uh, know, take uh, take a bow, kid. I took it already. <laughs> oh, say, Mister Benny. Speaking of Mother's Day, how um, how, <laughs> how 
Uh, how did you uh, how'd you come up here, Dennis? I, I didn't see you on the train. Don't you remember? You put me in a crate in the baggage car. <laughs> oh. Oh, that's right. You promised to bring me water once in a while, but you didn't. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm sorry, kid. It, uh, it slipped my mind. The baggage man reached in for my autograph and I bit him. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's my fault for putting Rover on the box, you know. <laughs> I should have known better. Say, Mr. Benny, speaking of Mother's Day, do you know what I sent my mother? No, what'd you send her, Dennis? A picture of me at the age of 45. <laughs> what? I drew some bags under my eyes. <laughs> oh, well, it was nice that you sent her something. Mary, I hope uh, you didn't forget Mother's Day. I should say not. I sent Mama two beautiful canaries. Two canaries? Yeah, one whistles deep in the heart of Texas, and the other one claps its wings. <laughs> well, I'm sure the old girl get a kick out of that, you know. Hi, you Jackson. Hello, fellas. Make the old man with the gray hair jealous. What a reception. They love you here, Phil. Oh, they? You're telling me. Say, Jackson, ain't this a coincidence? Here it is, Mother's Day, and we're at Mother Field. <laughs> that's, uh, that's Mather Field. And although I pronounced it wrong last week. I mean, and speaking of, uh, Mother's Day... <laughs> Speaking of Mother's Day, Phil, uh, did you remember your mother? Yeah, she's a little white-haired lady, about five foot two. I don't mean that. <laughs> I don't mean that at all. I mean, uh, what did you send her? Oh, oh, well, I'll tell you, Jackson. I cut off one of my curls, put it in a small box, and mailed it to her. Cut off one of your curls? Well, that's the corniest thing I ever heard of. I'd like to see you do it. I can do it, don't worry. Well, personally, Phil, I think that sending your mother a lock of your hair was a very sentimental gesture. I bet she got a big kick out of it. Well, I don't know. I got a wire from her this morning that said, Receive fried noodles, where's the chopped soy? <laughs> well, I'll be doggone. At least you meant well. Hey, Dennis. Yes, please? Uh, Dennis, I, uh, I think it's about time for your song, so go ahead and entertain the boys. Okay. I'm so sick of dog biscuits, I could scream. <laughs> Forget about that crate. Now go ahead with your song. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, 
his heart to smile and eyes of blue. He said, darling, take my duty to make an American beauty of a sweet Irish rose like you. was Johnny Doughboy sung by Dennis Day, and Dennis, that was swell. Thanks. And I'd like to dedicate that number to all the navigators, pilots, and enlisted men here at Mesa Field. Well, that's very nice. And now, folks... What's the navigator, Mr. Benny? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll explain it to you later, kid. Tell him now. I'd like to get the leakage. <laughs> okay. Well... The, uh, the navigator, fellas, is one of the key members of the air crew. I mean, he's the man who must plan the entire mission on what is known as a Mercator chart. Oh, I get it. Just hold for me. Well, let me explain it this way. When the plane takes off, the pilot proceeds to an initial point, and the navigator instructs him what compass course to fly from this point. The navigator must next determine the ground speed, and in order to do this, he solves what is known as a triangle. You know what a triangle is, don't you? Sure, a man, a woman, and a guy under a sofa. <laughs> Well, it's not your kind of a triangle. It's a wind triangle. Anyway, it is uh, frequently necessary to check accuracy by making celestial observations. To make these observations, the navigator uses an instrument known as a sextant. Ooh, what he said. <laughs> Dennis, pay attention. Thus, <laughs> no use, I'll have to talk to that kid. <laughs> Thus, by noting his compass and using the sextant, the navigator can determine his precise position. Now, are there any questions? Yeah, how can you use such big words without your teeth flying out? <laughs> I've got a bridge like the Golden Gate and keep still. And now, folks, as I was about to announce... Mary Livingston will read one of her famous poems. Now, wait a minute, Mary. I don't care if you did write a poem. You're not going to read it tonight. You let me read my poem, or I'll tell all these fellows that when you were in the Navy... Never mind. You went up to the crow's nest looking for eggs. <laughs> well, I was hungry. All right, Mary, what's the, uh, what's the title of your poem? Uh, she was only a pilot sweetheart, but she sure had a lot of control. <laughs> good, good, good. Proceed. <clears throat> <clears throat> Here we are at Mather Field, near the town of Sacramento, in the good old USA, where FDR is presidento. Well, we know where we are, anyway. <laughs> now, uh, get to going. <laughs> I met a boy here yesterday and got acquainted right away. You always do. He was so handsome and so cute in his new zoot suit with a parachute. Hmm. Some description. Uh, say, Jack. What? Did Longfellow work with a stooge? No. Then keep still. <laughs> Oh, pardon me. Uh, go ahead. He showed me his plane with motors twin and said to me, let's go for a spin. But we'd had no introduction, so I stayed right there for ground instruction. Good. How many more verses, Mary? Uh, one more, and it's all about bombardiers. Okay. I'd like to be a bombardier and drop a bomb on Hitler's ear. Well. And when he turned to see what got him, I'd drop another on his... <laughs> Well, for Mary, you did a fine job there. Now, Phil, I think the only thing that could follow Mary's poem would be a good hot band number. So go ahead. 
Hold it a minute. Come in. Yes? Mr. Benny, I'm from Postal Telegraph. Would you like to buy a war savings bond and send it to Fred Allen? Well, I'd like to buy a bond, but why should I send it to Allen? The shock, the shock would, would kill, kill him. him. I know. <laughs> you got an idea there. Come on out in the hall, bud. I'll write you a check. Play, Phil. give you anything but love, baby, from that new colored caravan in New York. And uh, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. Say, Phil, uh, come here a minute. I've got some very important news for you. What is it? Uh, you too, Dennis. Now pay attention. Okay, hold my yo-yo. <laughs> Put that down. Now, uh, fellas, now listen carefully. Incidentally, Mary and Don already know about this. But it so happens, fellas, that the end of this season will be our last year with Jell-O. What? You mean we're going to get fired? I knew it couldn't last. We've been getting away with murder. <laughs> now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here's what happened. Our sponsor, Mr. Mortimer, got in town from New York last Wednesday, called me up and said he wanted to see me about a very important matter. Were you worried, Mr. Benny? About losing my job? Of course not. <laughs> not much you weren't worried. Well, I wasn't. Then why were you in Rochester rehearsing Uncle Tom's Cabin all week? <laughs> That's only for the summer. Mervyn's going to direct it. Now, you're, we're going to play up and down the coast. Can I be a bloodhound, Mr. Benny? <laughs> yes, Dennis, I'll just take the crate off of you. <laughs> anyway, fellas, a sponsor called up, so I made a date to see him that afternoon. Mary, Don, and I got into Maxwell, and Rochester drove us over to Mr. Mortimer's office on Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> Rochester. Rochester, will you please watch what you're doing? What's the matter, boss? Take it easy. We're not supposed to drive over 40 miles an hour anymore. Anymore? <laughs> yes. The car couldn't hit 40 if it was dropped off the Empire State Building right in the country. Now, wait a minute. The speedometer says 62. That's nothing. It says 50 when we're out of gas. <laughs> What? Well, I'll kick it back to 15 if it'll make you feel better. Just take it easy. You know, I'm, I've, I've got a lot on my mind today. Oh, calm down, Jack. Just because our sponsor's in town and wants to see you doesn't mean you're going to get fired. Oh, yeah? Why, certainly, Jack. Mr. Mortimer probably just wants to speak to you. Yes, and I know what he'll say. Goodbye, Benny. Hello, Skelton. <laughs> We're, we're dead ducks, I tell you. Rochester, there'll be a rehearsal tonight. <laughs> now, remember, you're going to be Topsy. Why can't I be Uncle Tom? My Topsy is Toby. <laughs> no time for recasting. I tell you, if we don't... Rochester, watch what you're doing. You went right through a red light. Boss, if you want the wheel, here it is. <laughs> 
stick that back on there. <laughs> I'm, I'm nervous enough. Imagine, Mary, I've been with Jell-O eight years, and Mr. Mortimer wants to cast me aside like an old shoe. Old shoe is right. Look at that pair you've got on. Never mind. And sewing those patches on your coat. Who do you think you're fooling? Listen, Mary, a little sympathy won't hurt. You had to get all dressed up. Where do you think you're going, to a wedding? Don, tear your collar a little, will you? Right, right there on the side. Now, Jack, you're just imagining things. I'm sure you're not going to get fired. After all, you're a great comedian. I stink, and you know it. <laughs> the heck with that soft stuff. I'm serious, Jack. You're very important. Jell-O needs you. I'd feel a lot better if I was sliced bananas. <laughs> oh, well. I wouldn't mind if I'd have saved my money. I'd only put something aside for a rainy day. Oh, well, don't worry, Jack. I can always go back to the May Company. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. I filled out your application this morning. <laughs> oh, I... I don't know what's going to happen. I'd never leave you, boss. I'd work for you for nothing. That's mighty sweet of you, Rochester. I'm working for next to nothing now. <laughs> All right, just be thankful that you've got a job, which is probably more than I have. Well, say, Jack, that's the building across the street, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. Now, Mary, when we get in Mr. Mortimer's office, I wish you'd let me do the talking. You just sit in the corner and wipe your eyes once in a while, you know. I'll give you the cue. <laughs> Mr. Benny, Mr. Mortimer is expecting you. Yes! I mean, good morning, Miss Stewart. Don, you wait out here for us. Come on, let's go in, Mary. Good luck, Jack. Thanks. Well, hello, Jack. Mary, glad to see you. Hello, Mr. Mortimer. Hello. Hello. Hello, Mr. Mortimer. Excuse me, I caught a cold. <laughs> Down here in my chest. Just just killing me. Oh, that's too bad. Now, Jack, here's what I wanted to see you about. You don't... You don't have to beat around the bush, Mr. Mortimer. I'm not a child. I can take it, you know. Now, Jack... But you can't do this to me, Morse uh, Mr. Mortimer. <laughs> I've... I've given the best years of my life to this program, and you're... You're not going to shoo me aside like an old troll. <laughs> It's not fair. But, Jack, I can't understand what you're so upset about. I've got good news for you. Well, still, it is halfway out the window now. <laughs> Just getting a little breath of air, that's all. What's, uh, what's the good news, Mr. Mortimer? Here's the situation, Jack. You've been with Jell for eight years, and naturally, we're very pleased with what you've done. Uh-huh. So, next season, General Foods wants you to broadcast for another one of our products. You mean I'm not leaving your company? <laughs> you you mean we're going to be together next year? You mean he sold that patch on his sleeve for nothing? <laughs> Mary. <laughs> well, well, Mr. Mortimer, that that is good news. Eh, Mary? Shall I cry now? It's not necessary. Your cold is gone, too. <laughs> Mary, please. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Mr. Mortimer. To tell the truth, I, I kind of expected this. <laughs> and believe me, Mr. Mortimer, I'll work just as hard as ever. We know that, Jack. Now, please give me that revolver. You won't need it. <laughs> Here you are. Gee, I, I can't wait till I tell Don Wilson. Well, goodbye, Mr. Mortimer. Come on, Mary. Oh, Don! Don, I've got good news for you. Good news? Well, what is it, Jack? We're leaving Jell-O, Don. Next year, we're going to broadcast for another product. What? We're leaving Jell-O? That's right, Don. But they're going to keep selling it, you know. Don't worry. They're... But, Jack, do you mean to tell me that next season I can't talk about tempting and delicious Jell-O? Uh, 
America's favorite gelatin dessert? Well, I'm, uh... I'm afraid not, Don. You mean I, I won't be able to tell people to get out of their neighborhood grocer and get jello with a new locked in flavor? No, Don. I won't do it. I said it. I won't. No. But, Don, don't cry. Look, you can still tell people to do, to go down to their neighborhood grocer and buy this new product. Well,. As long as they're at their, they're at their grocers, can't they buy a little package of Jello too? <laughs> well, they'll always be able to get Jello. And here's something else, Don. Listen to this. Our new product will be economical too, and who knows? It may even be delicious with sliced bananas. Why, it'll be wonderful, Don. Wait till we get rolling. You'll love it. Now, come on. Here's a good idea, friends, for your next Jell-O dessert. It's peach and raspberry pie made with delicious raspberry Jell-O. Say, it's one of the most enticing treats you ever tasted. And nothing could be easier to make. Simply dissolve one package of Jell-O imitation raspberry flavor in one and a half cups of hot water. Chill until slightly thickened, then fold in one cup of heavy whipped cream and two cups of canned sliced peaches drained. Or if you wish, Use one box of quick-frozen sliced peaches, freshly thawed. Turn into a baked pie shell and chill until firm. The result will be one of the best desserts that ever graced a table. A wonderful combination of juicy sliced peaches and bright red raspberry jello. Get several packages of raspberry jello tomorrow. And when you do, be sure to ask for genuine jello because jello's locked-in flavor is extra rich. This is the last number of the 30-second program in the current Jell-O series. And next Sunday, we will broadcast from the Army Air Force Replacement Center near Santa Ana, California. And folks, it sure was great being here today at Mather Field. And I'd like to thank uh, Colonel Leland R. Hewitt and his staff for all their courtesies. And incidentally, I wish all of the young men listening in could see this marvelous air navigation training center. Believe me, boys, a navigator ain't no small potato. Good luck, fellas, and good night, folks. The Jell-O program is written by Bill Maher and Ed Beline and is broadcast each week by Shark Wave to our armed forces throughout the world. The presentation of this program from Mason Field has been for the entertainment of the personnel station here and does not necessarily constitute an endorsement of our product by the Army or its personnel. For a swell treat, there's nothing better than Jell-O puddings. Those rich, creamy puddings that are made by the makers of Jell-O. Try Jell-O chocolate pudding. It's smooth, mellow, gloriously good with a wonderful, rich chocolate flavor developed especially for Jell-O puddings by the famous Walter Baker chocolate people. Tomorrow, when you order Jell-O, ask for Jell-O puddings in all three flavors, chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. Jell-O puddings are just like grandma's, only more so. This program came to you from Mather Field. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles.
I'm a cowboy who never saw a cow, no crook to steer, cause I don't know how, and the show ain't fixing starting now. Yippee-yi-oh-yi-yi, yippee-yi-oh-ki-yi. That the cowboys know about the big corral where the doggies go, cause I learned them all on the radio. Yippee, I o kai. Yippee, I o kai. Yippee, I o kai. Yippee, I o kai. Well, thanks a million, friends, and welcome once again to Melody Ranch. I went to your wedding, although I was ready, the thought of losing you, the organ was playing, my poor heart kept saying, your dream, your dream. You came down the aisle wearing a smile, a vision of loveliness. I uttered a sigh, then whispered goodbye, goodbye. And I... to get milk out of a peanut. Milk out of a peanut? That's right. Wait a minute, let me get this straight. Milk out of a peanut, huh? Mm -hmm. Milk out of a peanut. You ready? Here it comes. Milk out of a peanut, huh? Yeah. You stuck? Yes. He must use a very low stool. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, dang dog, or to get rid of him. That's what we ought to do. Now, 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 Patrick, just take it easy. Simmer down here. Now, what's wrong with the dog? He argues too much. That's what's wrong with the dog. Oh. First he barks and wags his tail. Then he barks and wags his tail. So what? Getting so I don't know which end to believe. <laughs> this is getting more ridiculous by the moment. Well, in that case, may I, at this moment, inject a profound sober thought into the conversation? Inject what? I don't know. I just read it. I don't mind. <laughs> Well, I wish somebody would inject something here on yeah, here. Well, that was something about a sober. Oh, yeah. Well, this may come as a mild shock to you, uh-huh. but I am leaving. Oh. You're what? Yeah, you heard me. I'm taking a powder, you know what I mean? I'm hitting the road, blowing a joint, getting out of this place. I'm going back to Brooklyn where I belong. Back to where men are men and women are. Women are what? Oh, I ain't sure. <laughs> 
You see, I led a very sheltered life. <laughs> well, it sounds to me like that you haven't much use for the opposite sex, Winston. I don't blame him, Mr. Artery. I, I ain't got much, uh, much use for him either. And all because of one horrible, unforgettable experience I had once. I know that, 150 yeah. a week. Uh-huh. What was that? <laughs> well, way back in my gayer, carefree adolescent days, I used to go around with a mighty pretty young thing. Uh-huh. Her name was Lena Genster. Oh? But, uh, she was pretty, but it didn't work out. Oh? How come? Well, I had long buck teeth, and she had long buck teeth, so every time we kissed, it looked like two walruses fighting over the same fish. <laughs> Well, nevertheless, Patrick, old boy, I'll say one thing for you. For a man of your age, you certainly have lived, lived a full life. Yeah. It cost you a lot of money, but yeah. you've lived it. <laughs> say that again, Mr. Artery, and I've enjoyed every dollar, or every minute of it. <laughs> I only wish I could live to be a hundred years old. Oh? Oh, well, now, that's easy. All you gotta do is give up the late hours, rest in the afternoon, watch your diet, stop smoking, forget about women, and don't worry. Will that make me live to be a hundred? No, but it'll seem like it. Well, I'm Johnny tells me that you used to work as the strong man for the Barlow Brothers Circus. Yeah, what about it? Oh, just interested, that's all. Ever do any boxing? A little. Any around a place called Darwin? Darwin? Uh, no, never heard of it. That's funny. I, I better get back to Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah? 
Are you sure you never fought in a fight at Darwin Arena under the name of uh, Moose Mallory? Look, maybe you don't hear so good. The uh, name's Bill Collins. Okay, Bill. Forget it. Guess I'm mistaken. <laughs> wasn't mistaken, and I knew it. This guy who called himself Bill Collins was Moose Mallory, or else I was going blind, one of the two. But then I got to thinking, what of it? If a man wanted to change his name, that was his business. At any rate, it certainly wasn't any of mine. That is, it wasn't until one morning two days later. Hey, Gene. Yeah? Gene, Bill Collins is gone. He ain't slept in his bunk all night. What? Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I brought him a letter from town yesterday afternoon about 3 o'clock, and nobody ain't seen him since. Well, that's funny. Well, what's so funny about it? You didn't by any chance notice where the letter was from, did you, Johnny? Who, me? Yes, you. Get that hurt expression off your face. Where was the letter postmarked? Okay, since you put it that way... Uh... It was postmarked uh, Centerville. Oh. Uh-huh. Just happened to see it. Uh-huh. And the return address was uh, M. Hickson, 122 Maple Street. That's what I thought. What's what you thought? When a man has two names, Johnny, one of them is usually spelled trouble. I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Jane. Uh, Sheriff Dillon. Can you come in town to my office for a minute? Well, sure, Jim. I guess so. What's up? I'll tell you when you get here. Uh, make it as soon as you can, though. Right. Thanks. Who's that? Sheriff Dillon, Johnny. Wants me to come into town right away. What for? He didn't say. But from the sound of his voice, I don't think he just wants to chat. Oh, uh, Gene, uh, this is Pop Weaver, night watchman at the Central Utilities Company. Glad to know you, Mr. Weaver. Uh, shame here. All right, Pop. You tell Mr. Autry exactly, word for word, what you just told me. <clears throat> well, Mr. Autry, uh, last night, about uh, midnight, I guess it was, I was making my usual rounds over the utilities company. Anyways, just as I passed through the general manager's office, I heard this noise out in the hall. So I switched on my flashlight and opened the door. And when I did, there stood the biggest man I ever seen in my life. Go on. Well, that's all I remember. When I come to, he was gone. And so was the safe, with $15,000 in cash in it. Mm-hmm. Now, what I'm thinking is this, Gene. There's only one man around here strong enough to pull off a job like that by himself. Who? That giant you got working for you out at your place. You mean Bill Collins? Uh-huh. That's exactly who I mean. Where is he? Well, I wish I knew, Jim. He left yesterday afternoon and hasn't come back. Uh-huh. Well, that cinches it. I'm going to send out a statewide alarm on him right now. Wait a minute, Sheriff. Mm, what for? Oh, call it a hunch, more or less. Anything you want to. All I ask is that you delay sending out that bulletin for 48 hours. Gene, are you crazy? What do you think I'm running here, a kindergarten? This guy's as guilty as a cop. Oh, and furthermore, if you think for one minute that I'm going to let you run off and play cops and robbers, well, well... Well, what? Well, go ahead. Twelve hours later, after piecing together all the information I could get, either by phone, wire, or in person, there was just one other name that kept popping up in Moose Mallory's past. That name was Mike Hickson. It seems he was not only the unit manager with the Barlow Brothers Circus when Mallory did his weightlifting act, but he was also Mallory's manager when he fought in the Darwin Arena. The puzzle was all there except for one small piece. So I decided to forget it for a while and take a little walk. But deciding was as far as I got. When I turned around to get my hat, I saw him standing there in the doorway. And somehow, he looked bigger than ever. I'm back. So I see. 
How are you, Moose? I want to give myself up. Why didn't you go to the sheriff? Because I wanted to see you first. So? I wanted to thank you for being regular with me. I want you to know I'm... I'm sorry if I caused you any trouble. Oh, you didn't cause me any trouble? Just one thing, though, I want you to tell me. Why'd you do it? No reason. I just needed the money, that's all. I mean the real reason, Moose. Say, uh, who's Mike Hickson? Mike? I, I don't know what you're talking about. The, the whole thing was my idea. I don't know any Mike Hickson. Okay. Have it your way. Thanks. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, one last favor, if you don't mind. Yeah? Just forget that Moose Mallory business, will you? Just let me be booked as plain Bill Collins. Twenty minutes later, I took Moose down and delivered him over to the sheriff. Who, in turn, set his hearing before Judge Sparks at 10 o'clock the next morning. I still wasn't convinced, though, that Moose was solely responsible. Somewhere, Mike Hickson fit it into the picture. But for the life of me, I... And then, all of a sudden, I remembered a letter. A letter Johnny had told me that Moose received the day after the robbery. A few minutes later, I found it stuck between the mattress and the springs of his bunk. It read, Dear Moose, meet me in the Lucky Dollar Cafe at 8 o'clock on the night of the 16th. And don't try to back out on me like you did the last time. Remember, the police in Darwin are still interested in the murder of Billy Garcia. As always, Mike. Well, at last, the puzzle was complete. It was just 8 p.m. when I saddled up champ and started the long eight-mile ride to 122 Maple Street in Centerville. Yeah? What do you want? Are you Mike Hickson? What do I am? Get inside. Uh, hey, wait a minute. What's the big idea? You'll find out. Look, mister, get out before I call the cops. Uh, you know, that's very funny coming from a guy like you. What are you talking about? Moose Mallory. I didn't know. Uh-huh. Who's Moose Mallory? The same guy you've held under your thumb for seven years on a phony murder charge. Now start talking and start fast. Hey, let me go. Lay on my arm. You're breaking it. Yeah, I will. I will break it if you don't start talking, Well, uh, oh. Okay, I'll talk. That's, that's better. Moose was matched against a guy named Garcia in the Dow in the rain in 1940. Yeah, I know. Garcia died in the ring. Police said it was accidental, but, well, I convinced Moose he killed him. Go on. Moose was scared. He thought the law would get him for murder. So for seven years, Moose has done whatever you told him to do. Because you threatened to tell the police where he was if he didn't. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. All right. Get your clothes on, Hickson. You and I have got a date with justice. from the rolling plains of Texas to the snow-covered peaks of the Rockies. You'll find some of the most inspiring sights in the world, one of which I'd like to tell you about right now. Let me ride on a trail in the hills of all Coyote wail in the 
Mexico time with Fred Allen. Welcome to the Texaco Star Theater, ladies and gentlemen, and a special welcome to our armed forces all over the world who will hear this program by short wave. Tonight we present Fred Allen, Kenny Baker, Portland Hoffa, our special guest, Miss Marlena Dietrich, the winner of the Texaco College competition, Dr. Regan from Fordham University here in New York City, and Al Goodman's Orchestra. An hour of mirth and melody brought to you by the more than 45,000 Texaco dealers from coast to coast. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in this week's issue of Look Magazine, there's an article about this program. Here comes a man who's been thumbing the magazine all week. That's why he's got a dirty look. Oh. He's Fred Allen in person. Thank you. 
Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And, Jimmy, I'm glad that you mentioned that article in Look Magazine this week. Why, Fred? Well, the editors were planning to do a piece on uh, Mr. Benny's program, too, but after a quick conference, the idea was hastily abandoned, I understand. You mean that Look turned Jack down? Well, in a nice way, in a roundabout way. After listening to his program tonight, the Look people sent Mr. Benny a note and told him that if he wanted his turkey written up, he could try the Poultry Digest. They were... Handle it. Tell me, Fred, how was Jack's show tonight? Oh, it had feathers on it tonight. <laughs> you know, tonight, Mr. Benny broadcast from Mather Field. That's a, an air navigation center out in California. Mm. And after Benny got through with the air out there, I understand the Army pilots refused to go up in it for two days. <laughs> <laughs> but the... Bro- <laughs> the... Bro- <laughs> The program opened up with Benny telling about the first time that he flew. As a child in Waukegan, he was was out with a kite one day and wouldn't let go. A a wind, a a pontoon came up there in Waukegan, and uh, he wouldn't... (laughs) That's that's a a, a wet typhoon, a pontoon. (laughs) But this pontoon came up, and Benny wouldn't let go of the kite, and, of course, he was uh, carried away to St. Joe. It shows, you know, in order to go up in the air, you have to be lighter. So it shows that even as a little boy, uh, Mr. Benny was full of hot air, even in those. (laughs) And incidentally, that's how he got the name of Benny, I understand. He was flying over Philadelphia, and people thought it was Benjamin Franklin, you see. And they said, there goes Benny, and of course the name stuck to him with the kite and the key. But uh, after that, there were a couple of Mother's Day jokes. Phil Harris sent his mother a lock of his hair, and Benny sent his mother a lock of skin from his scalp. (laughs) And then a postal telegraph boy came in, and Benny sent me a war bond, so he said, by postal telegraph. He said it was a war bond, but it just came, Jimmy, and it's a war stamp, I see, when it gets here. (laughs) Benny didn't even have enough saliva to paste the stamp in a book. (laughs) So he sent the war stamp by a messenger boy who drools, in case I... (laughs) And then the finish of the program, the sponsor sent for Benny to tell him that he wouldn't be on the Jell-O program next year. He's going to advertise another product for General Foods. The sponsor, I understand, had a choice. Benny has been shaking more than the product lately. (laughs) And the... The sponsor either had to step up the jello or take Benny off the program. <laughs> so the sponsor took the easiest way out, Jimmy, and that's about all there was to it tonight. Well, you can't pick on Jack much longer. He's through in about three more yes, weeks. Yes, I know that. Benny has to go off the air, you know, the, at the first sign of summer. Oh, why, Fred? Well, in that California heat, his show would hatch, Jimmy. It's just a <laughs> of self-preservation. Well, so much... Now, please don't applaud too much now. You may tire later on when the, when the script gets thin, you see, and we'll need you and you'll be all tired out. We won't... Well, Jimmy, that's enough for the drivel. Let us turn to the latest news of the week. The March of Trivia presents its weekly lowlight from the world of news. New York City, New York. War ration book number one is issued as millions in New York City, Brooklyn, and Long Island rush to register for their sugar stamps. To check on the consumer reaction to sugar rationing, March of Trivia visits various schools about town to bring bring you the highlights at registration centers. At PS 99, a man was heard to say, The idea is to share sugar. We gotta make sure the Axis gets their lumps. Thank you. A little schoolgirl standing in line with her mother was heard reciting, Roses are red, chrysanthemums are round. Sugar's still sweet if it's only half a pound. At PS6, a truck driver says, One question on that sugar form is crazy. It says, give children's height. I got a baby six months old. How do I know how tall it is? Kid can't stand up. Well, what the... <laughs> What did you, uh, what did you fill in for the baby's height? I measured him in the crib. And? And I put down he's two feet six long-wise. That would help. <laughs> and now, a man who isn't any too well pleased about the whole sugar business, he's Heinz Haggerty. How has the sugar rationing affected you, Heinz? It's only changed me whole design for living, that's all. 
Well, how do you mean? Well, the first day I go out to get some sugar books. Yeah. I'm moseying down 46th Street. I see a big line. Yeah. I get in the line. I'm waiting there about two hours. Uh-huh. Finally, the line moves up. Yes. I get into a big room. A guy's sitting at a table. Mm-hmm. The guy says, sign here. And you sign? I sign, and the guy gives me a bus ticket. A bus ticket instead of a sugar ration book? Yeah, I says, what do I need with a bus ticket? I ain't going no place. And, uh, and he? He says, that's what you think, brother. You were in the wrong line? I was in a draft board. <laughs> well, tell me, did you find... Did you, did you finally get your sugar book? Who needs it? I'm leaving for Fort Dix in the morning. <laughs> Good luck and thank you, Mr. Hines Haggerty. And now a young lady who is helping housewives cope with sugar rationing. She's Miss Prudence Nickel. Uh, you are doing some sort of sugar work, Prudence? Yes. I am the originator of the Victory Honey Bun. <laughs> the, uh, the Victory Honey Bun? Yes. No sugar is used in a recipe. Oh, no sugar. Well, how do you make a Victory Honey Bun? First, an ordinary bun is placed on the table. Yes. A petunia is stuck in each end of the bun. Uh-huh. A sleeping bee is placed in the petunia nearest the hostess. I see. As the hostess is about to serve... Yes. She rattles the petunia. She rattles the petunia. The bee awakens and flies out. Yes. The bee sits on the bun for a fraction of a second and flies buzz, buzz to the opposite petunia. And the ordinary bun is no longer an ordinary bun. When the bee stands up, voila, a victory honey bun. Well, I, uh... <laughs> I must try one of your honey buns tomorrow. One thing is very important. The ingredients? No, the selection of the bees. Oh, I see. Before you let the bees sit on your honey bun... Yes? Be sure the bee is reliable. I see. <laughs> Thank you, Prudence Nickel. A man who doesn't seem upset about the sugar rationing is Johanna Duval. That's the small Y, isn't it? What is your business, Johanna? Well, uh, I'm with the circus. Oh, are you uh, one of the clowns, are you? No, no, I'm a kangaroo feeler. Uh... <laughs> what is a kangaroo feeler? Well, uh, with the circus, people are always buying popcorn and cracker jack. I know that. When they finish, they don't see no cans to throw the paper in. And? When they pass a kangaroo, they pull out the kangaroo's pouch and throw in their cracker jack boxes and all newspapers. They throw them in the kangaroo, yeah, do they? Yeah, yeah. And your job? Well, nights I go around with a flashlight. Uh-huh. I feel down in the kangaroo. Fine. If I feel anything, I put my head down the pouch and see what it is. And, uh, then, then you remove it? If I can lift it, I take it up. <laughs> if, you, if you can't lift it? I tip the kangaroo upside down, it falls out. Well, being a kangaroo feeler must be difficult work. I ain't so hard. After you get your hand in. Uh, <laughs> getting your hand in is the secret, huh? Yeah, sometimes a kangaroo is ticklish. It's a job. Well, I can imagine. <laughs> now, what about, what about the sugar rationing? Well, I... What sugar rationing? Well, haven't you seen the papers this week? No, I only read what I find in a kangaroo. <laughs> We're getting your news direct from the front, and thank you, Johanna Duval. Well, I guess that concludes... Hold your horses, Mounty Bank. Falstaff's here with jibe and plank. My dear... <laughs> My dear, you are a riot uh, of murk tonight, I must say that. My dear Mr. Openshaw, if you're here this evening with more poem... Have you heard, said the owl to the fowl, one more scowl and I'll pull your jowl till you howl, fowl? <laughs> No, I haven't heard that. Or, uh, get back in the hen house, Nelly. You belong with those other clucks. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I haven't heard that. When the sergeant peeked out of the patrol wagon, mother was carried away. Now, wait. <laughs> That is the last straw. Tonight we are talking about sugar. Precisely why I am here. I have written a poem. What is your rondelay called? The OPM had a word for it. Well, how, how does it go? 
Our language has a new word. You hear it every day. It's R-A-T-I-O-N. It's a word that's here to stay. I don't dislike this new word. I'd rather not denounce it. I'd prefer not to even use the word till I know how you pronounce it. I hear it on my radio. The announcer says it's ration. He even spells it out for me in true moronic fashion. I hear a college man expound. He insists the word is ration. The college man defines it, says it's simply conservation. Is it ration? Is it ration? I wish I knew, alas, because they're doing it to sugar, and they're doing it to gas. How it's pronounced don't matter. Call it ration, call it ration. By either name, I'm for it if this word will help our nation. Thank you, Paul Staff. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this, this is Mother's Day. It has long been Kenny Baker's custom to dedicate a song to mothers on this day. Now, Kenny observes his custom at this time, and the song he has chosen is For My Mother, Al Goodman Conductor. Brightness of the sun in your smile, mother dear. I feel the magic of God's hand in all you do for me. His masterpiece of mystery. I'm thankful for the tenderness and care I have known. I'm thankful, too, that God and you chose me for your own. Each night I say a prayer for you, I know he will hear me. by Kenny. And here's Jimmy Wallington to tell us about Fire Chief Gasoline. Oh, not tonight, Fred. Tonight I'm talking about Fire Chief Power. Yes, Power, ladies and gentlemen. Power well, that... Jimmy, put a little life in it, if you don't mind. What? I said when you say power, put some power in it. How Please. do you mean? Well, let me see the announcement there. I'll show you how there to read it, it. Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, now... <laughs> now, watch me, Jimmy. You may learn something, but I doubt it. Yes, Power, ladies and gentlemen, Texaco Fire Chief Power. That's what you buy when you stop at the Fire Chief Pump. Now, that's what I mean, Jimmy. Now, you try it. All right. Power. Power. Power! Well, <laughs> you're trying, Jimmy. That's all I can say for you. <laughs> but it's a little better, though. Let me hear you read the rest of it. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, you want power that goes into action when you step on the starter. Power that holds steady and sure as you get underway. Power that covers a lot of miles per gallon on the highway. Now that every mile counts, use a high-quality gasoline, such as Texaco Fire Chief or Sky Chief, the Texaco dealer's premium gasoline. That was Happy in Love, played to the hilt by Al Goodman and his rippling relatives. And now... And now... <laughs> Now we come to the highlight of the evening. It is with pleasure that we bring you... Mr. Allen! Portland! <laughs> well, what's, uh, what's cooking tonight, or hasn't your mother paid the gas bill? 
Mama wants to know if you'll sign this slip. Don't tell me your mother's now in the rackets number around here. <laughs> no, this is for carpooling. Carpooling? You mean where people take turns riding each other to work to save gas and tires? Yes. Mama's making up all kinds of par- uh, carpooling clubs. Carpooling? <laughs> well, make up your mind while your mother's making up her mind, too. I know the hyphen through you, didn't it, there? Uh-huh. We have actors here who can't read hyphens. It has to be up and down or they don't know what it means. <laughs> like that. But uh, your mother's making up all kinds of carpooling clubs. You say, how do you mean? Well, there's the Get Sick in Groups Club. Get Sick in Groups Club? What's that? If you're sick, you wait till four other people on your street get sick before you send for the doctor. You do? What does that do? Well, instead of making five trips to your neighborhood, the doctor only has to come once. It saves the doctor's tires. Well, that ought to help. That's... Oh, hello, Kenny. Hi, Effie. Oh, hello, Kenny. Hi, Forty. You're just in time, Kenny. Will you sign my slip for carpooling, Kenny? What's that? You share your car, Kenny. It cuts down your gas and oil bills and the wear and tear on your tires. Yes, Kenny. You ought to go in for carpooling. I don't know. That's pretty risky. Risky? How? Well, my uncle pooled with five other guys where he works. Yeah, huh? Each day, a different fella drove the whole gang to work. Yeah, I see. My uncle's day was Saturday. Your uncle's day was Saturday? Yeah. What happened? Friday night, the finance company grabbed my uncle's car. And? Saturday morning, the five guys showed up at my uncle's house to get driven to work. And when he told them his car was gone? They not only beat his brains out, <laughs> yeah. he had to carry the five guys to work piggyback. <laughs> well, you're... <laughs> There's no pool like an old pool. <laughs> your uncle... <laughs> your uncle... Your uncle's... Uh, in spite of all the piggybacking to and fro, your uncle still saved rubber, can he? The heck he did. He ruined his suspenders. <laughs> well, all right, kids. It's about time for our guest. And tonight, we have a scoop. One of Hollywood's greatest stars. Oh, shucks. Oh, what's wrong, Kenny? Every time we have a movie star, Cordy gets silly. I do not. What happened when we had Tyrone Power? Every time Mr. Allen said, Tyrone Power, you scream. Tyrone Power. <laughs> That's what I mean. Yes, I said... Sh- uh, it was uh, in E-flat the last time, though. She, <laughs> she went down the tone this time. But you don't, you don't have to worry tonight, Kenny. Our guest is a lady star, Miss Marlena Dietrich. Marlena Dietrich? <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth, Kenny. Now, go away, both of you. This is a moment I want to share with me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I present the distinguished screen favorite, the glamour girl of all la- glamour girls, Miss Marlena Dietrich. Good evening, Miss Dietrich. Good evening, Mr. Allen. Well, uh, Miss Dietrich, I... I don't know what to say. You're one of those strong, silent men, huh? No, but this is the first time I've, uh, I've ever seen you off the screen. It's, uh, it's quite a shock. Are you disappointed? No, I am agreeably surprised. You look just as lovely as you do in pictures. Thank you. So do you. Uh- <laughs> Oh, you, uh, you have seen me in pictures? Yes. On the screen, you don't look as tall, though. Well, I'm not, I'm not as tall, uh, 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 on the screen. Uh, uh, Marlena, I am a much bigger man in radio than I am in pictures, you see. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but in pictures, I shrink, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and I know what you mean. The tea shortage. <laughs> well, uh, Marlena... Marlena, let's get down to business here. Fine, I'm ready. Where are the troops? Troops? What troops? Your note asked me to come here tonight and give a show for the soldiers. Oh, yes. Well, I've heard that you've been touring the country for the Hollywood Victory Committee, giving shows at the various army camps and naval training stations. That's right. Where are the troops tonight? Well, I'll tell you, Marlena. I uh, registered in the draft two weeks ago. You mean you brought me here to do a show just for you? Well, I may have to go to some camp soon, and if you do a show for me here tonight, you can save yourself a trip later, you see? 
Fred, I've looked into the faces of thousands of soldier boys in the last few months. Yes? Yours is the first face I've seen with a 4F written all over it. <laughs> well, I wish you'd do your act for me. They tell me that whenever you appear, the boys tear down the auditorium. You know how soldiers are, Fred. They love good music. I know, I know. Every time I pass Carnegie Hall, the soldiers are breaking the doors down. <laughs> but Marlena, I certainly appreciate this visit, and in, re in return, there's something I would like to do for you. Really? Yes, I'd like to give you some fatherly advice about your movie career. But I'm very happy out in Hollywood, Fred. Oh, but how long can it last with those rough-and-tumble pictures you've been making? You're always getting beaten up. It seems that way, doesn't it? Why, the way that Jimmy Stewart slaps you around and Destry rides again, he ought to be ashamed of himself. Say, with Jimmy Stewart, it was a pleasure. <laughs> that uh, beating Broderick Crawford gave you in Seven Sinners? What could I do? He outweighed me. I gave away 30 pounds. 30 pounds you gave away in that pit. Well, in manpower, George Raft and Edward G. Robinson cuffed you around. It was two against one. They ganged up on me. Well, how long can you go on taking these beatings? You know what's going to happen in a few more years? Hmm? You'll be punchy. Hmm? <laughs> now, you don't want to spend your old age hanging around outside of the Brown Derby with cauliflower ears and Maxie Rosenblum, do you? <laughs> What can I do, Fred? In pictures, a dramatic actress has to play violent roles. Oh, give up pictures in Hollywood, Marlena. Come into radio. In radio, it's different? Oh, in radio, Marlena, there is no violence, no rough stuff. Have you ever worked on Eddie Cantor's program? <laughs> no, fate has been kind to me, Marlena. <laughs> But I was talking about radio drama. You know you can get beaten up and kicked around in radio and not even feel it. Sam does everything. Who is Sam? Well, Sam is the sound effects man. Now, I'll show you how it works. Sam, will you bring some of your sound effects over here, please? Now, uh, Sam's coming over, Marlena. Uh, he didn't make a sound for himself coming over. I'll do it for him. <laughs> now, uh, Marlena, what... What... <laughs> What are some of the things that have bruised you or banged you up in pictures? Well, in one picture, I was hit on the head by a gangster. I had a lump on my head for two months. You were hit on the head and got a lump. All right, now Sam is ready. We'll show you what happens when an actor gets hit on the head in radio. Sam, I'm going to get hit over the head. Now, I'll read the lines for you. See, Sam is ready here. He's got all his equipment here. I'll read the lines for you, Sam. No, Joe. Don't hit me with that blackjack, Joe. No. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> now, you see, Marlena, I'm getting my skull fractured, and Sam is beating a honeydew melon here. <laughs> which I am going to eat later on. It's a dead... <laughs> well, look, my hair isn't even much. The radio is wonderful, well, Fred. Well, I told you. Now, what else uh, has hurt you in pictures? Well, once I had to break down a door. I almost fractured my shoulder. All right, I'll show you how we break down a door in radio. Sam, I'm going to break down a door. I'll give you the lines again. You got the door ready? Open that door. You won't, eh? All right, I'll bust the door down. <laughs> <laughs> Marlena, that's radio. I have just broken down a door. And all Sam did is smash a peach basket. That's all. Now tell me, what other scenes have left their marks on you? Once I had to ride a runaway horse. I was black and blue for weeks. All right. Now I'll show you how a horse runs away with you in radio. Now, Sam, you see what Sam is holding here? You see what Sam's uh, prop? <laughs> what are those? They're Two this... rubber finger bowls? Uh, uh, beg your pardon? Two rubber finger bowls? No, this is a plumber's mashie that, uh... <laughs> These are plungers, Marlena. Those are the horse's hoofs in radio. Sam, I'm going to ride a horse. <laughs> now the horse is running away, Marlena. Try to stop it. Whoa, whoa, nice horsey, whoa. Oh, help me, Fred, it won't stop. Whoa, Sam. <laughs> All right, back up, Sam. <laughs> All 
That's radio, Marlena. A horse ran away with you, and look, your hair isn't even out of curl. And it doesn't hurt me to sit down, either. I know, I told you. Well, you've seen all the abuse you can avoid. Now, how about going into radio? But what could I do, Fred? Say, I found a script of one of those serial programs on the floor of the studio when I came in this morning. You, uh, you might have a go at that. What is the show like, Fred? It's called Brave Betty Birnbaum. <laughs> your, uh, your part starts on page 28. But the whole script is only 30 pages. Well, I know. The first 27 pages are a commercial. <laughs> you've, uh, you've heard those programs, two sobs and a commercial. Yeah. Well, let's run through this little scene at the end here. You play Betty Birnbaum, and I'll play the boy's part. I shall be Sean Shapiro. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm afraid I can't play this scene, Fred. You can't play the scene? Why not? Says he at the end of the scene, Betty kisses Sean. Yes, that's the finish of the episode. You kiss me. I'm sorry, Fred. Marlena, you don't want to kiss me? Oh, it isn't that, Fred. Well, you don't think that I brought this whole thing up just to get you to kiss me. Oh, Fred, I know your intentions are good. Well, I realize there's been a lot of loose talk going around since Benny kissed Ann Sheridan on his program last week. People are saying that no glamour girl would kiss me. Oh, why, that's ridiculous. You think a glamour girl would, Marlena? Why not? A girl in pictures kisses all sorts of people. <laughs> Part of her job. Part of her job. It's purely a professional gesture. And that's all, Fred. But Miss Sheridan was on Benny's program last week, and she kissed him. Now, how do you account for that? If the kiss was on the script, it was part of Anne's job. To Anne, it was another head. That's all. Just another head, huh? <laughs> well, tonight you are working on my program, Marlena. Yes, Fred. And uh, this uh, kiss here in the script is uh, just uh, another head to you? Just another head. Just another head. Marlena. Yes, Fred? Uh, will you? <laughs> Fred? Fred. Y- yes? This is radio, isn't it? Yes, Marlena. Sam? Sam, I'm about to kiss Mr. Allen Now, wait a minute What has Sam got to do with it? Never mind, let's play the scene All right Oh, Fred Kiss me, Marlena Now, Sam (laughs) There you are, Fred A fine thing. You kiss me and Sam gets wet knuckles. That's radio, Fred. See you later. I certainly shall. And thank you, Miss Marlena. Thank you very much, Miss Deacon. And now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a word from Jimmy Wallington. I'm not talking, Fred. Not talking, Jimmy? No, Fred. Tonight we're saying it with music. Ladies and gentlemen, here is a new song with an important message for every American motorist. It's called, Care for Your Car, For Your Country. Care for your car, for your country. It's your duty to beware of every squeak. Let your nearest filling station make frequent lubrication so your moving parts are always at a peak. Driving often for car-saving service, let them keep your valves and carburetor clean. They'll advise elimination of undue acceleration as the way to get more mileage from your gasoline. Though your tires are now on ration, if you use them in rotation and check on their inflation, they'll go twice as far. You have an asset for old Uncle Sammy. Make it last for the duration of the war. Almost every occupation needs this vital transportation. Keep it up to par. Care for your car, for your country.
After a brief pause for station identification, Red Allen returns to present Marlene Dietrich with the Texaco players and the most talented undergraduate of Fordham University. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. WABC, New York. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, the Texaco Star Theater brings you the most talented undergraduate of a leading institution of higher learning. Tonight, we salute Fordham University in New York City by presenting its most talented student. Chosen by a vote of the undergraduate body, the winner is here tonight as Fred Allen's guest and will receive a cash award of $200. Are you ready to introduce our guest, Red? Yes, Larry. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present Fordham University's most talented undergraduate, Donald Regan. Well, congratulations. uh, That's not a relative by any chance. (laughs) Congratulations, Donald, and welcome to our bespattered Texaco frat house. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Say, Donald sounds a little formal, Donald. I think I'll just freeze your name at Don for tonight, if you don't mind. You go to school here in New York. Is this your home? No, I live in Youngstown, Ohio. Youngstown? The Youngstown? That's the mayor. Very happy to have you in (laughs) Youngstown. (laughs) Youngstown... Youngstown is a great coal and iron center, isn't it? That's right. You know, when I was in Vaudeville, Don, I could always tell a city's industries. When I finished my act, all I had to do was look down on the stage and see what was lying there. (laughs) When I played the Hippodrome at Youngstown, the audience threw so much coal at me, before they let me back on the stage to take a bow, I had to join the United Mine Workers Union. (laughs) But uh, I came back with a with a lamp on my hat and took four bows, as I remember. <laughs> but <laughs> tell me, Don, what are you studying up there at Fordham? I'm majoring in Latin and Greek. In Latin and Greek? And what do you want to do when you leave college? Later on, I'd like to take up music seriously or practice law. You say later on? Yes. When I first came to Fordham, I joined the Coast Artillery Unit of the Reserve Officers Training Corps. Well, you're not majoring in that, are you? And not quite. When I graduate, I'll be a second lieutenant. Well, that's fine. Tell me, do you go in for any of these sports at school? I'm not much of an athlete, but I have played baseball and basketball a little. Well, Fordham has a great baseball team this year, hasn't it? Yes, we've won ten straight games so far. I know. I hear that Connie Mac has tried to talk Fordham into swapping its baseball team for his Philadelphia Athletics. <laughs> Connie, Connie Mac, they say, was even willing to throw in a catcher's mitt to clinch the deal. The last time I heard. Sounds like a good bet for Philadelphia. For Philadelphia, huh? Well, Fordham always seems to turn out good baseball players. Don, Frankie Frisch, the Pittsburgh manager, John Murphy, and Hank Borrowy of the Yankees, they're all Fordham men. Yes, and Babe Young of the Giants is also a Fordham graduate. Well, isn't John... That's the infield from the... Uh... <laughs> but, every... <laughs> but isn't John Kieran a Fordham boy? Boy, I say. <laughs> uh, formerly a boy, I mean. Yes, Mr. Kieran graduated in 1912. Well, you know, he was quite a baseball player years ago. Mr. Kieran might have uh, made the big leagues if he'd been a little taller. John was so short, when he came to bat, the pitcher had to kneel down to throw the ball to him. (laughs) Have you ever seen Mr. Kieran on information, please? No, I haven't. Well, he's so short, his little white head just comes up over the top of the table, Don. (laughs) Mr. Kieran went down to the Adler Shoe people to see if they'd make make him a pair of elevator pants... But um, it fell through for some reason. (laughs) But apart from sports, what uh, other uh, campus activities do you engage in? I sing with the glee club occasionally and also play the piano accompaniments. Fine. Last March, I helped direct the course in a Greek play we put on in school. What play was that, Don? Humanities by Aeschylus. I had to open my big mouth. (laughs) I'm all right with prepositions, but now I'm out of the field here. Well, tell me, did the students produce this Greek play, uh, Humanities by Aeschylus, themselves? <laughs> Not bad for the first time, I mean. <laughs> Mr. William F. Lynch directed it for us. It was really a tremendous hit. Well, I'm sorry I didn't see it, Don. Still, it probably would have been all Greek to me, even if I had seen it. Well, I guess that brings us to your piano solo, Don. Before I play, Mr. Allen, I'll have a surprise for you. You have really? What? Recently, we had a poll at Fordham, and the undergraduates voted you their favorite radio comedian. Well, that is quite an honor, Don. Now, if I'm polled, I will certainly select Fordham as my favorite university. Well, how about your solo? 
Can you wait another minute? Well, sure, Don. Why? I have several uh, gifts to present to you on behalf of the student body. Gifts again? I feel like an old Fagan, Don. <laughs> All you boys bringing me things every week here. But disregard my feelings. Go right ahead. Well, first, the boy sent Portland this bouquet of roses from Rose Hill. Well, thank you, Don. Will you take the roses? Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm always happy when Portland gets roses, Don. She gives me the thorns, you see. <laughs> and with the pin shortage, thorns come in mighty handy sometimes. All right, Don. Next, the stuffed ram's head. Say, that, that, uh, that looks better than I do, Tom. <laughs> what, is, what is this card here? The Ram send his regards? No, Mr. Allen, this certificate awards you your F and makes you an honorary member of the Fordham football team. Don, the way I feel right now, I'm apt to kick off before the football season gets here. <laughs> but I want, to th- <laughs> I want to thank the student body at Fordham University and you, Don, for your kindness tonight. And now, what about your piano solo? I'd like to play an excerpt from the Greek concerto in A minor. Well, that's fine. Ladies and gentlemen, Fordham University's most talented undergraduate, Donald Regan, plays for you an excerpt from the Greek concerto in A minor. All right, Don. Thank you, Donald Reagan. Your fellow students, the faculty, and the Fordham University 
alumni may well be proud of your appearance tonight. And all of us here in the Texaco Star Theater wish you every success for the future. Now, next week, ladies and gentlemen, we will present the most talented undergraduate of Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. After hearing the three finalists over station WLAC in Nashville, the student body voted, the ballots have just been tabulated, and the winner is Viston Taylor. Congratulations, Viston. We'll be looking for you next Sunday night. And while Viston recovers from the shock, Kenny Baker returns to sing, Somebody Else is Taking My Place. Somebody else is taking my place Somebody else now shares your embrace Why? To keep from crying You go around With a smile on your face Little you care For vows that you make Little you care How much I have paid My heart is aching My heart is breaking For somebody's taking my place Sweet was the start of the story Of love with an unhappy end We had a moment of glory And now you are even a friend For little you care For vows that you make Little you care How much I have paid My heart is aching, my heart is breaking, for somebody's taking my And here's Larry Elliott. Gosh, Larry, you came up so quietly I didn't even hear you. Yes, Fred, I'm walking on tiptoe these days to save my uh, rubber heels. Yes, I <laughs> I know a man who does that. He says that every step he takes with his heels off the ground is a step toward getting those other heels off the earth. Larry. Well, he's... <laughs> He's, uh, he's got something there, Fred, but if he really wants to save rubber, he should start with his tires. But you can't teach your car to go around on tiptoe, Larry. No, Fred, but you can teach yourself to drive slowly, stay under 40, tires last twice as long at 40 as at 60 miles an hour, and have your Texaco dealer check your tire pressure regularly. He'll watch for cuts, leaks, and breaks, too, so they can be fixed before the tire's ruined. And he'll plan how and when to cross-switch your tires for longer, more even service. Your Texaco dealer's regular attention will give you many more miles from your tires, just as his regular lubrication and maintenance will give you longer wear from your entire car. So drive into your Texaco dealer's tomorrow and ask for your free copy of his new booklet, Care for Your Car for Your Country. It contains 16 pages of facts on saving your tires, your car, and your money. It's yours for the asking at Texaco dealer's, and it will be a big help to you in caring for your car for your country. And now the Texaco Workshop player starring Marlena Dietrich. Miss Dietrich has just completed the 1942 version of Rex Beach's greatest story, The Spoilers, for Universal Pictures. And so tonight, for Universal, we audition a thundering epic of the frozen north. It is the dramatization of another poem found in the pocket of the man who drew the face on the barroom floor after he had toppled over dead. Now, this poem is called The Courtin of Nasty and Nell. Music, Professor. There's a story told up Yukon Way. It's been going the rounds a spell about the Yukon's greatest love affair, the courting of Nasty and Nell. 
The scene is a Yukon bar room. Well, 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 evening. Evening, Levant. Hi, boss. Got your pie any tuned and ready? Yep, boss. Man from the phone gang pulled up the wires for me. Good. You're a playing for Nutley Nell singing tonight, Levant, and I don't want nothing to go wrong. Expecting big business, boss? Today was payday in the mines. Every prospector in Yukon will be in tonight, tightening his hide with Chuck and Bills. How oh, you better start practicing. Okay, boss. I'll step over and see if my boss stocked up. Nasty and nail he was that we. That we ain't no way to be. Well, how are you coming, Pete? Still polishing? Yep, nasty. Look at this bar. She's as shiny as a seal's hip. Sure is. Yeah. That bar's shinier than the back of George Raff's head, Pete. Well, uh, things are short changed since Lutley Nell started singing here, nasty. Yeah, Nutley Nell. Yes, yeah, sir. You buying cuspidors and putting lavender sawdust on the floor? Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Changing the name of the saloon from the buzzard's nest to the golden wedgie? Well, Nutley... <laughs> Nutley Nell's won my heart, Pete. If a Nell will say the word, me and her will get hitched tonight. Uh, she'll never say the word while handsome Jaime... Why, you... Hey! That's the leg home neck, you choke. Handsome Jaime, don't <laughs> mention that varmint's name again. <laughs> now, don't forget... Oh, oh. There's only one galoo to marry a Nutley Nell... And that galoot's Nasty Allen. Quiet, Nasty. What's up, Pete? Nutley Nell's are coming down the stairs. Creepers. Nell's a pretty are coming down them stairs, Pete. She sure is. And Nell's a pretty are going up them stairs, too. She sure is. Hello, boys. Hello, Nell, my little fawn. Quit pawn me, Nasty. I ain't in no mood to wrestle. Mayor Nell, my little albatross. I ain't... I didn't know you at first, Mel. I thought you was Mel, Nell. Nell, I got something to say to you. Lay off that jive talk, big boy. You bore me. Marry me, Nell. I'll build a little shack. We'll be happy. I'll put up four walls. How can we live in just four walls? If and I can get the four walls up, the government will put on a ceiling, Nell. <laughs> Marry me, I'm the roughest, toughest hombre in the Yukon. Handsome Jaime's as tough as you are. And handsome Jaime is handsome. And handsome Jaime's a pauper. Neil, you've been brought up to luxury. Flannel underwear and soap. <laughs> what can handsome Jaime give you? Someday Jaime will own that good humor wagon. <laughs> I ain't, I ain't got no good humor wagon, Nell, but I got the biggest saloon here in the Yukon. I can give you anything Hyman can, Jaime can give you, except in Tutti Frutti. Now, look, Nasty. I'll make you a sporting proposition. Yep, Nell. I'm a gold digger. Up here in the Yukon, men are a dime a dozen. Them are the little ones, Nell. <laughs> you and Jaime both say you want me. To me, it's immaterial. Say on, Nell. I'll marry the one who has the most money. Nell, with the business I'm going to do here tonight, you're as good as mine. Get ready, Nasty. Here comes the Greyhound in from the mine. <laughs> That's the Greyhound, all right. Now, remember, boys, tonight i got to clean up. If I make enough money, I'm marrying Nutley Nell. Gangway, here they come. Open up, Pete. Yeah! 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 Well, welcome, welcome, boys. The golden wedgie is yours. The drinks is on you. Yeah! Yeah! Hold on, boys. Now, before you all get wall-eyed, how about a little song sung by the sweetheart of the Yukon, Nutley Nell? Come on, come on, Nell. Give the boys a ditty. Okay, Nasty. Go see what the boys in the back room will have And tell them I'm having the same Go see what the boys in the back room will have and give them the poison they name. And when I die, don't spend my money on flowers and my picture in a frame. Just see what the boys in the wagon will have and tell them I sigh and tell them I cry and tell them I died up the same. And when I die, don't pay the preacher for speaking of my glory and my fame. Just see what 
Put the boys in the back room, I'll laugh, and tell them I sigh, and tell them I cry, and tell them I died up the same. Honey, Nell, honey, that was as pretty as a she coyote a fan up a canyon. Thanks, Nasty. I'm sending for the jesters. We'll get hitched tonight. I told you my proposition, tall, dark, and pesty. Hi me again. Hi me again, eh? You or hi me. Either way, I'm a dead pigeon. The one with the most money wins my hand. Well, I'll win it, Nell. Don't shy away, gal. I've got to go up. Got to go up and get dressed for my can-can number. Well, I'll get round and see how the money's rolling in. I wonder how the roulette wheels are doing. Face your bet. How's Face the wheel going, Slim? Took in 2,000 worth of nuggets, Nasty. Good. All right, man, get your dust up. I'll, I'll take 64. Every number's covered except in 27. Here she spins. 27. Nobody wins. <laughs> Stop kind of sudden, didn't she? Boys, old Nasty can't afford to lose tonight. You boys understand, don't you? Oh, sure we do. Put down your gun, Nasty. Okay. I, I could have win tonight for Nutley Nell. Well, I'll uh, step over and see how the bars are doing. Hold on, hold on, man, one at a time. Well, how's the bar going, Pete? I ain't even got time to pour the stuff into the glasses, Nasty. No? I'm just spilling it on the bar and they're lapping it up. <laughs> How much you take in? Eh, close to 4,000, Nasty. Creepers, the dough sure rolling in, man, ain't it? Man, listen, man. What's the matter? What's the matter? I've got news, man. News? What's the news? What is it? Sugar's been discovered in Louisiana. <laughs> Wait. Where did everybody go? What happened, Pete? Why, the place is empty, Nasty. There's nothing foul afoot, Pete. Somebody's trying to stop me from getting the money to marry Nutley Nell. Now, who's behind this sabotage? Yonder's the cuss that started the rumor, Nasty. Look. Over by the door. Handsome Jaime. Yes, it's Handsome Jaime. How's business, nasty? Why, you lily-livered good humor scum. I ought to shake the maple walnut out of your wagon. <laughs> Thought you was a stealing nutly nail away from Handsome Jaime, eh? Nell, Nell. Yeah, nasty. Come here, Blossom. <laughs> Hello, Nell. Hello, good-looking. You're sure sharp tonight with that bear grease on your sideburns. Now watch that sweet-looking Jaime or I'll plug you. Oh, yeah? Careful, Nasty. He's got a yo-yo. <laughs> and it looks like it's loaded, too. I got my poke, Nell. Let you and me mosey. Now hold on, handsome Jaime. Nutley Nell's made you and me a proposition. Nell, you ain't... Yeah, Jaime. It's up to you and Nasty. The one with the most Morgenthau letters wins me for keeps. That's far and squaw. Money talks, handsome Jaime. How much of that treasury cabbage you got? I got 2,000. I got 4,000. I got 8,000. I got 10,000. I got 11. I got 12. I got 13. I got 13,000, too. Speak on, Jaime. Jaime, honey, you ain't run out of voice. No, no. I run out of money. Well, looks like a photo finish, Nell. We each got $13,000. There's only one thing to do, boys. Yes, yes Nell. Nell. Both of you put up your money. Yes, yes Nell. Nell. Cut the card. Yes, yes Nell. Nell. High man takes the money, and I take the high man. Suits me. Suits me, too. I've got the cards right here in my stocking. <laughs> Where's your money, boys? Here's my poke. Here's my poke, too. I'll whittle the cards. There we are. Pick your card, Nasty. Okay, I got mine. Handsome Jaime? I got mine. All right. Card, gentlemen. King of spades. Ace of spades. Jaime, baby. Come to mama. 13,000. And 13,000. You kiss me, Nutley Nell, you're mine. Oh, yeah. Take this, handsome Jaime. <laughs> well, you got me. Goodbye, Nell. You're a widow. You go. Oh. Nasty, you killed him in cold blood. Yeah, Nasty. Jaime didn't cheat. Why'd you bump him off? Well, I had to, folks. It was my duty as a law enforcing citizen. You call murder law enforcement? Here in the Yukon, Nell, we take the law in our own hands. Handsome Jaime broke the law. I brung him to justice. But what law did he break? It's them two bags on the table now. The thirteen thousand dollars in each bag. With both them bags, Jaime would have had twenty six thousand dollars. The law says this year, no man can take more than $25,000. <laughs> Mr. Nutley 
Nell. This is why I came in, Fred. Good night. Thank you. And now, Larry Elliott with a word on waste. It's sheer waste these war days to drive alone when others may be making the same trip. So here's an easy, neighborly way to cooperate with our government in conserving tires, cars, and gasoline. Arrange with your neighbors to pool your car, where several make the same trip each day to work or shops. Work out a schedule by which all can take turns riding in one car. Pooling your transportation is patriotic, neighborly, and thrifty, too. Thank you. Remember, if you have room to spare, it's your duty to share. Now, it's a little early there, but thank you, Larry, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us tonight. This is Fred Allen saying good night for the more than 45,000 Texaco dealers from coast to coast, reminding you that when you burn up the road, you burn up your tires. Stay under 40. Your tires will last almost twice as long. And remember to have them checked regularly by your Texaco dealer. Drive in at any time. Remember, you're welcome. Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> 10 p.m. B-U-L-O-V-A, Boulevard Watch Time. W-A-B-C, New York. 880 on your dial. Remember Pearl Harbor. Keep them rolling. The War Production Board, in cooperation with WOR Mutual, presents the 27th in this weekly series of programs of entertainment and information about America's united war effort. Your master of ceremonies is the crack American foreign correspondent, well known and loved not only in the United States, but also in England, where he returns next week. Ladies and gentlemen, Quentin Reynolds. Good evening. I am honored to participate in this program for this program is dedicated to a great people I was privileged to know and admire during the most critical period of their long history. This program is dedicated to the people of Great Britain, to the people who withstood the most savage terror a civilized world has ever known, and who withstood it alone. As their Prime Minister, Mr. Churchill, said this afternoon, for a whole year after the fall of France, they stood alone, keeping the flag of freedom flying and the hopes of the world alive. Neither faltering nor flagging, they stood alone. But tonight they are not alone. Our armed forces are fighting and killing the common enemy on battlefronts all over the world. The shattering effect of the, uh, their united force has already had its beginning upon the Japanese waters off Australia. And that is just the beginning. To those heroic allies of ours who have been holding the fort for so long, we pay tribute with this program in music and words of our common language. Here to take part in this tribute, are such talented exponents of the free spirit as Hollywood and Britain's brilliant actress, Anna Neagle. One of America's most popular singing stars, Kenny Baker. The versatile composer-conductor, Morton Gould and his orchestra. the armed forces of Great Britain are no longer alone, nor are the determined men and women who are night and day pouring sweat into planes, guns, and tanks any longer alone. Working with them, feverishly racing against time, 
are men and women in factories all over the United States. Hands across the sea, yes, hands covered with sweat, grease, and oil to smother the axis. Brains across the sea, too. Brains like those of the two expert leaders of war production for both countries. Our own chairman of the war production board, Donald M. Nelson, and the recently appointed Minister of Production for Great Britain, Captain Oliver Littleton, each of whom are re directly responsible to the heads of their respective governments. It was just three months ago that I saw Captain Littleton in Cairo. Only yesterday, I chatted with Don Nelson in Washington. Tonight, the medium of radio makes it possible for me to have the honor of introducing these two old friends to each other for the first time. From the night shift in America to the early morning shift in England, ladies and gentlemen, Captain Oliver Littleton, speaking from the British Broadcasting Corporation in London, and Mr. Donald M. Nelson from Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. I can't begin to tell you how grateful I am for this opportunity to meet and talk with Donald Nelson, of whom we in England have all heard so much. The privilege is mine, Captain Littleton. I am only sorry that you had to stay up for this meeting until 4.30 in the morning. Oh, I can assure you that I don't mind that at all. Time was when we in London were kept awake by the Nazi air raids. But I'm happy to say that it has been many months since that happened. I guess it's the Nazis who are staying up these nights, eh, quite, Captain? <laughs> quite right, Mr. Nelson. I guess it is. From the reports we've been getting over here, gentlemen, the boys of the RAF are certainly giving them a double dose of their own medicine. When I was in London during the Nazi bombings, every RAF pilot I talked to was just aching for the chance to get a crack at the Nazis in their own backyard. It's great to know that they are getting it. Yes, and that chance is being made possible only by the united effort of the English men and women in our factories who are working night and day to turn out the planes, guns and bombs to make such a continuous large-scale aerial offensive possible. Mr. Nelson, you I know realize what a magnificent job these workers are doing. Their sacrifices and efforts have made it possible for us to come near a state of almost complete all-out war production. But we are achieving it only through the sacrifices and energies of each and every one of our people. They've had to give up virtually every personal convenience. This has meant rationing, severe rationing, not only of luxuries, but of actual necessities even the food and clothing. Like Captain Littleton, I too have had personal experience with this rationing when I was in London, and I can say it was severe. But what impressed me everywhere was the determination with which the British people accepted these hardships. If it weren't for that, we would never have been able to get so near to total war on the home front. People did more than accept government regulations. They insisted upon them. This is true not only of the rationing of food and clothing, but even of complete control over where every man or woman is to work and at what. That sounds like complete conversion, not only of materials and factories, but of people as well. That's exactly what it is. Isn't that total conversion from civilian life to all-out war effort exactly what we in America are attempting to accomplish now, Mr. Nelson? Exactly. Of course, it will take us some time to catch up with British conversion. But I am happy to say that we are moving fast. Faster, I think, than we did, Mr. Nelson. I don't know about that, Captain Littleton. 
But as you know, we in America like to pride ourselves on our ability to move fast once we get started. Of course, to move that fast, we in the government had to be given authority to control many things which are normally left to free decision of the people. That's true in England too, Mr. Nelson. But no control can do its work properly unless it has public support and particularly the support of the workers and managers who have to deliver the goods. By getting together in a common zeal to solve production problems on the factory floor, they can do more to increase production than any government regulations. That's exactly what I believe, Captain Littleton. My department may be able to make plans, but it's the zeal of the men in our factories owners, managers, and workers alike, which turns out those plans into hard-hitting facts like ships and tanks, guns and airplanes. Sorry to interrupt, gentlemen, but our time is getting short, and there's one question I'd like to ask. Captain Littleton, can you tell us what help Britain most needs from America? Mr. Reynolds, the most urgent need of the day is... Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll answer that one, Mr. Reynolds. That is, if Captain Littleton will allow me. Go right ahead, Mr. Nelson. I don't think the question is properly put. It's a throwback to the days when we were peaceful suppliers of arms for others to use. Those days were destroyed by the bombs at Pearl Harbor. We are no longer merely a friendly source of what we think we can spare or can make without too much trouble. We are united with other nations in a common cause. With them we have pooled our resources, pooled our manpower, pooled our arms. Captain Littleton will agree, I know, that we both expect the same of each other that we pledge our sacred honor to contribute our utmost to victory. And Captain Littleton, you can be assured that we in America know the size of the task we have set ourselves to, and that we will not falter until it is done. And you, Mr. Nelson, can be equally assured that we in Britain will work with you, will withhold no shred of our efforts Shirk no hardships will not cease until in a common victory we regain the chance for men of goodwill to build a world of freedom. I believe, Captain Littleton and Mr. Nelson, that the spirit both you gentlemen have just expressed was summed up best by our president in these words. Every single man, woman, and child is a partner in the most tremendous undertaking of our American history. That is obviously true of your British history as well. Thank you, gentlemen, and good night. Now in salute to the British people, Martin Gould conducts the orchestra in a selection that symbolizes in music the cherished and long-standing traditions of the British Empire. Pomp and circumstance. <laughs>
From out of the most confused chaos of war, often come stories that renew our faith in mankind. One of the most poignant stories grew out of the heroic evacuation of the British Army in Dunkirk. with the ferry command of the Royal Air Force. Ladies and gentlemen, the Snow Goose. This is a story gathered in many fragments from many sources and many people. For the sea has claimed its own now, and the great white bird that saw it all from beginning to end has returned to the dark, frozen silences of the Northlands, whence it came. The first fragment came from men who had looked upon strange and violent scenes. They were soldiers on leave, gathered at the Crown and Arrow in East Chapel. Right, Eddie. A goose it was. A blue and white goose. Oh. A goose it was. Come flying out of the stink and smoke at Dunkirk. All white, with black on his wings. The minute I seize it, we're done for, I always. It's the angel of death coming for us. And we them Germans are giving it to us there on the beach. We're getting peppered with machine gun bullets when out comes that goose. Yeah, and a minute later around the bend comes that little silo with that good little chap in it. What little chap? Him. Him with the unspread. And the left hand like a blooming bird claw. Him what saved us. Took us off that boiling beach, he did. And all the time, that big white goose circling and circling like a blooming dive bomber. Never did find out what became of the little chap, though. He was a good man, he was. Aye. God. But this is a story of many fragments. From the villages of Chelmsbury in the Kentish Lowlands came another one. It was little more than a decade ago, the deserted lighthouse on the marsh, that a young man came. In the village, the natives looked suspiciously at Philip Rader with his dark, bearded visage, his misshapen body. Oh, hunchback he is. He is a queer one. It's in that lighthouse, just painting pictures. And that left end of his, like the claw of a bird, all withered and all. But Philip Reader returned their fear and suspicion with love and understanding. Yet he shunned people. He lived alone in his lighthouse, sailing the tidal creeks in his little boat, collecting wildfowl to add to those for whom he had built a high sanctuary near his studio. The tame birds in his sanctuary were assigned to the wild ones in the sky that here was safety and food for all of them. They came down from the north by hundreds and stayed with him until spring, when they flew away, only to return again in the autumn. And Philip Reda was happy that somewhere in their beings these creatures knew of his existence and trusted him. And in his solitary fashion, he was happy in his tower in the marshes. One day, as he painted in his studio, a timid knock came at the door. Philip put down his brush and palette and opened the door. A little girl stood poised in the doorway. Her eyes were violet beneath her fair, wind-tossed hair. She was a child, not yet in her teens, slender, timid as a bird, eerily beautiful as a marsh fairy, and afraid. But even greater than her desperate fear of this ugly, storied man was her pity for the creature she bore in her arms. This... this bird, sir? I found it. 
It hurted. Yes. Yes, I see. <laughs> well, come in, come in. He put the large white bird on the table and spread one of the immense black-tipped wings. Child, where did you find this bird? In the marsh, sir. A hunter shot at it. What is it? Why, it's a snow goose from Canada. How came it here? Can they heal it? Hmm? Oh, I yes, little girl, I think so. And you shall help me. They bandaged and splintered the wounded bird. And the little girl became fascinated and forgot her terror. See, she must have been caught up in a great storm and carried across the ocean from Canada. Only to be shot by some hunter as she settled to earth to rest on our marsh. Bitter reception for a visiting princess, eh? <laughs> well, we'll call her the Lost Princess. The Lost Princess? Yes. There, now. In a few days, she'll be much better. Here, see how she nibbles at this grain. <laughs> oh, yes. And how she opens her round yellow eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I must go home now. Wait. Uh, won't you tell me your name? Fritha. Fritha. Uh, and where do you live? With the fisher folk in Wickledrop. And now I go. You'll come back to see how the last princess is doing. Won't you? I. I'll come back. Goodbye. Like a startled waterfowl, she fled. But as the snow goose slowly mended, Fritha became a frequent visitor, and no longer did she fear the twisted, bearded man. One morning, answering the call of the breeding grounds, the great bird circled into the blue sky, and soon was lost to sight. With the bird's departure ended Fritha's visits to the marsh. And Philip Rayada learned again the meaning of great loneliness. That summer, out of his memory, he painted a picture of a slender, elfin child with her fair hair blowing in the wind and bearing in her arms a white bird that was wounded. The years passed. And every autumn, the snow goose returned, and with her came Fritha. Outside, the world boiled and seized, and legions armed themselves for the war that was to come. But the lighthouse was a world apart for Fritha and Philip. She sailed, cooked for him at times, even learned to mix his paints. One year, when the snow goose returned, and Fritha came back, it was with a shock Philip realized that Fritha was a child no longer. That autumn, the bombers roared over the channel, frightening all the birds. Even the snow goose took to the air. Once, twice, thrice, the snow goose circled the lighthouse, then dropped back to the earth and quietly began to feed. Philip? They ain't she going like the rest? No, Fritha. She's staying. She'll never go away again. This is her home now. Of her own free will. Suddenly, Fritha was frightened. She read the longing and the loneliness and the deep dwelling, unspoken things that lay behind his eyes as he looked at her. I... I must go now. I be glad the princess will stay. You'll not be so alone now. Goodbye. Swiftly she turned and fled down the sea wall. Fritha! May was at an end when she came back. 
It was evening, and Philip was on his little wharf, piling things into his boat, water, food, brandy, an extra sail. Philip! Philip, wait! Philip, where be you going? Oh, a hundred miles across the channel. Why? A British army is trapped here on the sands. And Dunkirk is in flames. We must take them off the beach to England. Must ye go? Our oh, Frither. They're like huddled birds. Like the hunted birds we used to bring to safety. Over them fly the steel hawks and falcons. And there's no shelter from the dead. They rain on our men. They need my help. It's something I can do. For one side, I can be like other men. Ritha stared at him, and for the first time she saw that she was no longer ugly or misshapen, but very beautiful. And her heart spoke for him. Then I'll come with thee. No. Your place would cause a soldier to be left behind. And another, and another. Now I go alone, Frida. Goodbye. Goodbye, Philip. God speed you. And as she watched the sail gliding down the estuary, a rush of wings uh, came uh, beating uh, out of the uh, darkness. Uh, uh, it was the snow goose finding the white sail in the gloom. And slowly circling over us until they were both lost to Flitter's view. Watch over him, lost princess. Watch over him. She turned and walked back to the empty lighthouse. And it was her turn now to know the meaning of loneliness. A story of many fragments from many lips. Another comes from an officer's club where a captain told of Dunkirk and his experiences there. A wild goose, did you say? No, but I saw a tame one. I was piloting a tug pulling a string of barges loaded with soldiers when we spotted this derelict small boat. There was a bird perched on a rail. We changed our course hard over and had a look. Face down on the bottom was a chap, badly machine gunned. Quite dead, yes. When I tried to reach over, that bird hissed at me and beat its wings at me. Then all at once, young Kettering gives a hail, and there to starboard is a big German mine. If it hadn't been for that goose, we'd have kept our course and hit it head on. We blew it up with a rifle shot. When we looked again, the derelict was gone, sunk. And there was that bird circling three times like a plane, saluting, and then off to the west. That's all. Odd, you know, that you should mention a goose. The goose came dropping out of the eastern sky. Oh, long before then, the knew that Philip would never return. It was when the bird returned that the overwhelming truth of her love broke forth from within her. Philip! Philip! I love you, Philip! Wild spirit called to wild spirit, and in the beating of the great white wings, she listened to Philip's voice. River, goodbye. Goodbye, my love. Goodbye. Goodbye. Philip! The snow goose dipped and swung once around the lighthouse, then climbed away into the heavens. And watching it go, Fritha saw no longer the snow goose, but the immaculate soul of Philip Reda taking his last farewell of her. And lifting her arms, she cried above the wind through her tears. God! Then 
her tears still, she went back into the lighthouse and found a picture he had painted of her with the white bird. Hugging it to her breast, she plodded homeward along the old sea wall. Each evening she came back to stand upon the wall, and nothing, no one came. Except one dawn, a German pilot let loose his bomb. That evening when Fritha came, the sea had claimed its own. The sea has claimed its own. And the great white bird that saw it all from beginning to end has returned to the frozen silences of the Northland whence it came. That, ladies and gentlemen, was one of the stories that was inspired by the magnificent spirit of the men of Dunkirk. The hopes of these men has been set to music in a popular ballad which the celebrated American singer Kenny Baker brings us now. The Mutual Broadcasting System. Starring Raymond Massey in A Tooth for Paul Revere. Stephen Vincent Benet for The Cavalcade of America. You may think this isn't a true story, but if you do, never mention it over Massachusetts way because the people around Concord and Lexington and Boston know that it did happen. There are monuments and placards to commemorate it. Monuments to the Minutemen who fired the shot heard round the world. The shot that told the nation that America had taken her stand for liberty. But, uh, confidentially, it all began with Lige Butterwick. 
Lige lived on a farm about eight miles out of Lexington, Massachusetts, and he was a peaceable man. But one morning in April, 1775, he woke up with a bad toothache. Ouch! Now, Lige, you just hold still and keep that bag of salt on your cheek. I got it real nice and hot again. Thanks, Hannah. Yeah, you certainly got it hot. Easy, Denny? I said, does it easy, Denny? Not one darn concerned ding busted mite. <gasps> Lige Butterwick. I'm sorry, Hannah. I'm not a profane man, mostly, but this tooth. <laughs> Hannah, take that cat right outside, Hannah. She's meowing and stamping around here like a herd of elephants. Will you take that cat outside? Oh. Now, Lodge, now, Lodge Butterwick, you listen to and it's getting so you're not fit company for a Christian woman. Guess you're right, Hannah. But when it jumps like well, that... Well, it isn't going to jump like that. I'm going to saddle up the horse and ride into Lexington and have it out this morning. And while you're away, perhaps I can get some work done without hearing your dirt and concerns every living moment. Aim to plow the south field today. Large Butterwick. Cross money to get your tooth pulled. Cheap at the price. Oh. Uh, all right, Hannah. A tooth's a tooth. Guess it better. Now you go right down to Barber Joe's, and when it's out, don't you stay too long with those Liberty Boys at the tavern. They're a wild lot. And if you have Morning, Lige. Morning, Eben. Going to Lexington? Might be. Law business? Mm -mm. Uh. Ah, looks kind of painful. Is. Well, Barbara Joe can fix it for you, I guess. Say, Lige. Huh? Decided yet about joining the Minutemen? Not yet. Like to have you, Lige. Appreciate it. Ain't decided yet. Way I figure it is, trouble's coming. We can't let other folks tramp on us. Way I figure it is, nobody's going to tramp on me, but I'm still making up my mind. Yeah. Well, man's got a right to do that. Morning, Eben. Got to be getting on to Barbara Joe's. Morning, Lige. Well, you're lucky to catch me, Lige. Got to go over to Parson Clark to shave an important customer. You sit right down in this chair. I'll be with you. Now, open wide. Ah. Ah. Well, certainly is a tooth. Concern it, I know it's a tooth. Thing is, can you pull her or can't you? That's all I want to know. Ah, I can pull her, Lige. Use block and tackle if I have to. <laughs> She's got long roots and strong roots. She's going to leave an awful gap. Now, what you really need, though, it's taken away my business. It's one of these here artificial teeth to go in that gap. Artificial teeth? Mm. That's flying in the face of nature. No, it ain't, Lodge. Artificial teeth is all a go these days. Do me good to see you with an artificial tooth. Well, I might do you good, but supposing I did want one. How in Tunket could I get one here in Lexington? Uh, you just leave that to me. You have to go to Boston for it, but I know just the man. Name's Revere. They say he's a boss workman. Just take a look at this here prospectus. Um, whereas many persons are so unfortunate as to lose their four teeth, that's you, Lige. Yeah? Yeah. To their great detriment, not only in looks, but in speaking. This is to inform all such that they may have them replaced by artificial ones. See? Yeah. Uh, I look as well as the natural teeth. And, and he's got his name here, Paul Revere Silversmith, near the head of Dr. Clark's Wharf, Boston, Mass. Silversmith? Never heard of him. What's a silversmith got to do with teeth? Oh, no, you don't know Paul Revere. He's a regular wizard, a regular wizard with his tools. Well, I don't hold with wizards. And I never heard of this Revere. But I guess I'll take your advice, Joe, and thank you. <laughs> You'll never regret it, Lige. Oh! Uh, uh. oh! I'm sorry, mister. I didn't mean to bump into you. That's all right, youngster. But next time you bump into a man with a toothache, just bump a little easier, will you? What's all the commotion about? Commotion, mister? I said commotion. This used to be a town attended to its own business. Now it's all stirred up. Why, why haven't you heard the great news, mister? It's a secret, of course, but... I... Come here, son. Excuse me, sir, but I've often told the boy not to talk to strangers. 
Hard to tell who's friend or enemy these days. I don't remember seeing you in Lexington before. Name's Lige Butterwick. Don't get into town very often. Butterwick, eh? Well, Mr. Butterwick, my advice to you is to go right back where you came from. We're choosy about strangers right now in Lexington. Now, mister, I am a peaceful man and I don't want any quarrels. But nobody's going to tell me what to do and where to go. If I didn't have a toothache and wasn't going to Boston to get Paul Revere to fix it... Oh, Revere! Please, Mr. Butterwick, speak just a little lower. If I'd known you were one of our men, I'd never have spoken as I did. But I've just come from Mr. Hancock and Mr. Adams. They're staying at Parson Clark's. And I didn't see you there. Guess I wasn't there to see. That's right. Don't give anything away. No, what in tanky? Just because a man wants to get his tooth pulled by a fellow named Revere. That, 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 that stupid expression of yours, Mr. Butterwick, must be worth a fortune to you as a secret agent. Huh? But I mustn't detain you any longer. I know you want to be off. I just tell Mr. Revere that we all want to see that tooth pulled. Every true son of liberty in Lexington. Well, that's real neighborly of you, but... And no more words. Hey, William, hold Mr. Butterwick's horse. Godspeed you, Butterwick. Thank you. Huh? Get up. Well, beats me. Wonder what it's all about. You are listening to A Tooth for Paul Revere, an original play by Stephen Vincent Benet, starring Raymond Massey on The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. And now as we return to our story, we find Lige Butterwick in Boston, stopping at a tavern for a bite and a sup before he goes on to see Paul Revere. Pint of ale, please, and some bread and cheese. Pint of ale, please. Heard you the first time. There. Thank you. Well, here's to Boston. Ah, been in Boston long, stranger? First time in four years. Looks kind of changed, if you ask me. Maybe you tell us just how Boston's changed, stranger. Well, that's hard for me to say, but of course there's all these soldiers in the streets. Then there's the ships in the harbor with their guns pointed right at the city. Never seen that before. What's it all about? Ship called Somerset. See her from the road. Guns pointed right at the city. Better change your conversation, stranger. That'll be a shilling. You got it? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> well, beautiful weather we're having. Bitter weather for Boston. Maybe for Boston, but out in the country, we'd call it good planting weather. Oh, yes, I... Yes, I was mistaken in you. It is good planting weather for some kinds of trees. And what kinds of trees were you thinking of, neighbor? <clears throat> Needn't poke me in the ribs like that, friend. I was thinking There's of... trees and trees, you know. Well, I know that. You needn't poke me neither. You in the blue coat. But as I was saying... The Liberty Tree. May it soon be watered with the blood of tyrants. The Royal Thank... Oak. And God oh, save King George, you want to hurt? Oh, no! 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 Well, there's half my Sunday coat gone galley west. And all over planting trees. Are all the folks in Boston crazy? Here, friend. Let me help you up. <clears throat> I'm glad to help any man against these Boston rebels. Well, I don't know about rebels, but I come here to get my tooth fixed. I wonder if you could help me. You see, I come to see a fellow named Paul Revere. Paul Revere? I'll be glad to tell you how to find him. You see those soldiers of the king over there? Yeah. Well, you go right over to one of them and say, Hey, lobsterback. Oh, why do I call them that? From their red coats. The minute the soldier hears it, he'll know just the sort of man you are. He'll see you get to Paul Revere or wherever else you ought to be. Lobsterback. Lobsterback. Yeah. Well, much obliged to you, friend. Out where I live, we don't know all these fancy Boston names for soldiers. You just try this one. Try it and see. Lobsterback. Lobsterback. Hey, uh, excuse me, Mr. Lobsterback. Sergeant. 
He called me a lobster back. Just as bold as brass. But, Mr. Lobsterback, I... Here, I'm an American citizen. You let go of my coat. Here, take your hands off. <laughs> this Clark's Wharf? What's the matter? Can't you read the sign? Why, uh, sure, sure. Number 27. Must be Paul Revere's. Afternoon, Mr. Revere. Nice shop you got here. But you look kind of young to oh, be... Oh, uh, Mr. Revere's over there, sir. Behind the uh, counter. Excuse me, but my business brooks no delay at. Oh! Uh, Mr. Revere. Yes, Mr. Beckham? Powder. 300 weight for the Sons of Liberty. I'll attend to it. Mr. Revere! Mr. Revere! Master Revere, where is he? I must see him at once. Can't you just hold your horses one minute, lady? I was here Stand before... Stand out of my way, my good man. Now, Master Revere, I am so disappointed in you. Oh, I'm sorry for that, madam. But why? That silver service you made me. I wanted the best. I certainly paid for the best. And what have you given me? My best work, madam. Was in my hands for six months. Six months, indeed. Why, it looks like something made for the lower classes. I wanted something I could show the governor. But this, this is as plain as dirt and as simple as a picket fence. Simple and plain? Well, you pay me high compliments, madam. Compliments? I'm sending it back tomorrow. Why, there isn't as much as a coat of arms on the cream jug. I told you I wanted a sugar bowl covered with silver grapes. The service goes back. I'll send to Italy instead. Send away, madam. We're making new things in this country. Silver is clean and plain as the New England hills. And we may make a new nation, too. But as for you, with your coats of arms and your grapes and your lower Wait, classes, I chase you... you out of my well, shop. I've never been so insulted in my life. Out Don't of my shop. Ah, that's a relief. All right, you can put up the shutters, Peter. We'll shut for the day. Yes, Mr. Revere. Peter, no word yet from Dr. Warren? Good for you, Mr. Revere. What's that? I said good for you. The way you stuck up to that lady about things and, and things. Well, thank you, my friend. And uh, who in the world are you? Well, that's kind of a long story, Mr. Revere. It, it is, Mr. Revere, ain't it? Mm-hmm. But closing or not, you'll have to listen to me. The barber told me so. Barber? Barber what Joe. Barber? barber Joe. Oh, uh, uh, uh. Your what? My tooth. Went into Lexington this morning with a spitting toothache. Lexington? And... Quick, man, you were there this morning? That's just what I'm telling you. When I went into Barber Joe's, I said to him, Joe, I said... Man, man, don't waste your words. There's a revolution boiling in this country. Were Hancock and Adams still a Parson Clark? Would you mind just saying those names again? Good heavens, is there a man in the American colonies who doesn't know Jan ha John Hancock and Sam Adams? Well, there seems to be me. But now, come to think of it, yeah, there was two strangers staying at the parsonage. Hancock and Adams still there. The British ready to march, they must be warned. Did you see many soldiers as you came to my shop, Mr. Butterwick? See them? They chased me into a tire barrel. And there was a whole parcel of them up by the common. Looked as if they meant business. They do mean business. Mr. Butterwick... You may not know it, but you have done the colonies an invaluable service. Hancock and Adams shall be warned. Well, that's very nice, Mr. Revere, but what about my tooth? Oh, well, you're a stubborn man, Mr. Butterwick. But all the better, I like stubborn men. We're going to need them in America. And as you've helped me, I'll do my best to help you. Now, I've made artificial teeth, but pulling them is hardly my trade. Still, just open wide for a moment. All right. Hmm. Mr. Butterwick, it seems to be a compound agglutinated infraction of an upper molar. Afraid I can't do very much about it tonight, but the... here's a little medicine that may make you more comfortable. Smells like sherry wine. It's got a queer, sleepy taste to it. Yeah, that's right. I put up my own prescriptions, too. Now I look for some liniment for you. Mr. Revere. Yes, I'll find it in a moment. Mm, taint that. It's, uh, it's a queer kind of shop you got here, Mr. Uh -huh. Revere. Uh -huh. A minute ago, I could have sworn I saw something move in that cupboard. Something with legs. And, say, what's in that little bottle there, Mr. Revere? What, that? Oh, that's just a little experiment of mine. I call it Essence of Boston. There's a good deal of east wind in it, though. Essence of Boston. 
Well, they did say you was a wizard, and I'll believe it. It's genuine magic, I suppose. Genuine magic, of course. And here's the box with the alignment. Much obliged. But what's this other little box, the silver one? Pick it up. Mighty pretty work. Yeah, it's my own design. See those stars around the edge? Thirteen of them. And the eagle? But what's in it? What's in it? What's all around us, Mr. Butterwick? Gunpowder and war. And the making of a new nation. But the time isn't quite ripe yet. Not quite ripe. You mean, uh, you mean this here revolution folks keep talking about? You got it shut up in this box? Why, I could let... Master, Master! A message from Dr. Warren. Oh, give it to me, boy. <clears throat> Peter, get my riding boots. Hurry. But and Mr. I want you Revere! To... I'm sorry, Mr. Butterworth, but I just received a very important message. Peter, my boots! Get my boots! May have to ride all night. But, Mr. Revere, what about my tooth? It hurts. Sadly? Mm-mm. Mr. Butterwick, it's often like that. Something hurts and you don't know why. And something stirs and you don't know why. There may be a tooth or a country. But when it hurts, you know. You're a farmer, Mr. Butterwick? Yes, sir. Farmed all my life. Aimed to be a peaceable man. Uh-huh. And there are so many of you. So many who wanted to be peaceable. And yet... It isn't till you waken that a country wakens. You understand me, Mr. Butterwick? Takes me a little time, but I'm starting to. Yeah, I'm starting to. All right, then you take this box, Mr. Butterwick. Here, hold it in your hand. Now, I'll have to leave you, but you can stay here till you feel that you have to go. Bring the box to me when you feel like it. I'm trusting it to you, to your sanity and common sense in the way you feel about your neighbors. My boots, Peter. My riding boots. <laughs> Uh, must go and sleep. But where am I? Seems like a dream. He told me I could stay here till I felt I had to go. And he put the box in my hand. But good glory, it's the box with the revolution inside it. Now, what am I going to do? Gunpowder and war and the making of a new nation. It's a mighty dreadful responsibility, Lige Butterwick. Of course, maybe he was fooling me. No, there's something inside it, all right. Ain't got a keyhole. But maybe if I put my ear to it and listen, there's musket fire or I'm a Dutchman. And that's people cheering. Hold your fire, men. Don't fire unless you're fired upon. But if they want a war... Let it begin here. Great glory almighty. It's true. But what can I do about it? Wish Mr. Revere was here. Because, oh, what can I do? Squarm! Squarm! The enemy are coming! Too long! So that's it. So that's why he called for his riding boots. But he's not me. He's another sort of man. Well, there's plenty of us around Lexington, and we got guns. But I never aim to fight and die. I just aim to farm. What, what was, it, was it that fellow Revere said? He said he couldn't do it all. Said wasn't till folks like me waked up that a country wakens. Yeah, that's what he said, and it means something. I'm a peaceable man, but to chase me into a tar barrel. Shouldn't do things like that to a man. Why, I... I'm not a Britisher, nor even a colonist. I'm a New Englander. And maybe there's something beyond that. Something that Hancock and Adams knows about. And if it has to come with a revolution, well, I guess it has to come. We got to start being American sometime in this country. To build a new country. And build it clean. And plain. Where's Paul Revere? I got to find Paul Revere. But you got to let me have a boat, lady. No, you don't get any boats for me. 
There was a crazy man along here an hour ago, and he wanted a boat across the river, and my husband was crazy enough to take him. And they tore up my best spare petticoat to muffle the off. Was his name Revere, Paul Revere? I don't care what his right name was. My best spare petticoat. <laughs> Keep your head down. Passing the British fleet. If I hadn't seen the color of your money, I'd turn back. I don't think I'd try that, friend. What's that light over there? Light in the Old North Church. I wonder why they got it lighted tonight. I don't like it. You keep quiet or we'll never get to shore. This chance... What you expect it to be? New Orleans? That's your horse that's hitched there? Sure, it's my horse. I'm taking it. Why, you... Say, what do you think you're doing? Take me. It's the American Revolution, and we're taking your horse. Come on, get out. Come on. Boy. Hey there. You in the window. Has Paul Revere been by here? What's that? Has a man been by here, a man on the horse named Paul Revere? Well, there was some crazy galoot come through here on a horse about an hour ago, yelling and waking folks up. But I'm so deep, I didn't hear a word he said. Oh, oh, did I say? Ever jumped horses? H- Hedges horse? Well, neither have I. But here goes. Oh, the right far. <laughs> Boy. Well, dawn's up anyhow. Tony, where are we? Hey, miss. Yes, sir? How far am I out of Lexington? Well, just about a mile by the side road. But don't you want to stop at the house? Your horse looks tired to death and... Oh, there's blood on your coat. Got no time to stop. Got the American Revolution with me. Mr. Revere! Mr. Revere! Good heavens, it's my friend with the toothache. What brings you here, Mr. Butterwick? Because it's the same errand you had. Did you get to Hancock and Adams? Yeah, they're warned. And you've done your country a great service, Mr. Butterwick. The British caught me near Concord and let me go again. But if it hadn't been for you, I'd never have gotten to Lexington on time. Well, you better take this horse of mine. He's blown, but there's work left in him. By the way, Mr. Revere, I got a little box of yours. You know what's in it? Yes, I know now. And I know what's over there in Lexington Green. There's soldiers over there, Mr. Revere. Regular soldiers. And there's neighbors of mine that I know. Do you see them standing up to those regulars, Mr. Revere? And do you hear what they're saying? Disperse, you rebels. Hold your fire, men. Yeah, I hear and I see. Then here goes with a little box. You know what you've done? You've let out the American Revolution. Well, I guess it was about time. And I guess I'll go along to the green. I can borrow a gun over there, and I guess I'll need it. But uh, your tooth, Mr. Butterwick, after oh, all... Oh, a tooth, a tooth, but a country's a country. And we're going to make this one right, and make it here and now. In a few moments, we will hear again from our star, Raymond Massey. In the meantime, a brief story of how DuPont photographic microfilm is safeguarding today's vitally important plans and records. Before a bombing plane can be built, draftsmen must make 60,000 mechanical drawings. 30 tons of blueprints must be made before the building of a battleship is completed. In the Library of Congress are copies of nearly 10 million books, In the public and private archives of the nation is stored the recorded knowledge on which the cultural and industrial life of the nation is based. If enemy bombs should destroy these priceless records, how would we duplicate them? A bombed building can be built up again, but ideas, designs, patents, formulae, masterpieces of architecture may be lost to us forever. Today, invaluable records of this sort are photographed on microfilm. An entire drawing, even a whole page of a newspaper, may be copied on a tiny piece of film no larger than a postage stamp. 
A plant manufacturing machine tools found itself with 400,000 charts that took up 1,500 square feet of floor space. Reduced to microfilm, the whole lot could be stored away in two drawers of a letter file. Telephone companies, water companies, gas and electric corporations today are microfilming their records. If a city is bombed, repair crews will know just where to go to repair breaks, even if original engineering plans and records are damaged or lost. Records which must be added to or changed are re-photographed periodically and kept up to date. Some utility companies are doing this every six months. The DuPont Company also has microfilmed under strictest surveillance all of its engineering drawings. Banks photograph checks for a permanent record that can be filed away without taking up room. Letters written by soldiers abroad are microfilmed so that a single airplane bound for home can carry the equivalent of tons of mail. The Army and Navy are making other uses of the film that can't be told until the war is over. Newspapers from 37 countries are now available through Harvard's microfilm service. The secret of microfilm is an ultra-fine grain emulsion with what photographers call high resolving power and inherent contrast. That is, it can record extremely fine detail, so fine that in reducing a drawing to the size of a pinhead, one nine-hundredth of the original area, and then enlarging it, all of the essential detail is preserved. Furthermore, this film has a tough surface that reduces the possibility of scratches and lengthens its life. Made by DuPont, it is called DuPont Safety Microcopy. Microcopy film is a DuPont contribution to better things for better living through chemistry. Ladies and gentlemen, here is our star, Raymond Massey. Thank you, Mr. Collier. I found it a great pleasure to play Lige Butterwick on the cavalcade tonight. I even like playing his toothache. For men like Lige are the salt of the earth, free men, slow to anger and strong of purpose. They made this country what it is, and men like them will keep it that way. I'd also like to thank the cavalcade players for their generous help. Thank you, Mr. Massey. And now news about next Monday's program. Our star will be Claudette Colbert. Our play, Remember the Day, a play full of tenderness and meaning about a school teacher who helped mold the life of a great American. It is adapted from 20th Century Fox's motion picture of the same name. Don't forget next Monday on the Cavalcade of America, the lovely star Claudette Colbert in Remember the Day. The orchestra and original score on tonight's program were under the direction of Don Vuri. DuPont is happy to announce that Raymond Massey is now to be seen in Cecil B. DeMille's production, Reap the Wild Wind. On the Cavalcade of America, your announcer is Clayton Collier, sending best wishes from DuPont. This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. speed of light, the cloud of dust, and the hearty high silver, the Lone Ranger.
With his faithful Indian companion, Tonto, the masked rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. The stories of his strength and courage, his daring and resourcefulness have come down to us through the generations. And nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of a great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Go on, Silver! A thing on the trail ahead! I'm Silver! General store in Hawksville was one of a row of false front single story buildings of sun bleached wood that lined the street for a distance of 200 yards. It was well after closing time, but Andy Conway's store was still lighted. Andy himself stood at the door bidding good night to a group of men who were leaving. Good night. Good night. I'll have everything ready in a few days, boys. Uh, we're with you, Andy, and we're satisfied that you got something. We'll see you through. Let us know if you need more cash. Thanks, yeah, yeah, boys. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a heap. You'll never regret this. All right. Good night. Oh, hold on a minute, Sheriff. I want to speak to you. All right, Andy. I'll just shut the door. Sheriff, I sure feel like a new man. It's a great thing to know that your friends and townsmen trust you. It sure is, Andy. Makes you feel that you do most anything sooner and betray that trust, don't it? That's just what it does. I know just how you feel. I felt the same way when the boys re-elected me to office after I'd finished my first term. <laughs> Shucks, you always had the men in Hawksville behind you. Well, what about you? Well, I never knew if it did or not. You've been here for as long as I can remember, Andy. And you sure have been generous with the way you gave out credit here in your store. Oh, that was nothing. Well, it meant food to lots of people when they would have starved otherwise. Oh, I only well, did... That's what it did, Andy. Now most of the men that just left your meeting are doggone glad they had the chance to back you. Well, they'll get every dime of their cash back, and with plenty more. Well, I hope so. The point is, though, if you hadn't been so free and easy with giving out supplies to folks that couldn't pay for it, you wouldn't have needed to ask for grub stakes now. <laughs> You'd have had as much as any man in Hawksville. You wouldn't have needed to give out shares in your gold mine. I'm glad to do it. Glad to do it, Sheriff. Well, that's your business. How much cash did you collect? Sheriff, you wouldn't believe it, but I've got over $1,200. And another 2000 promised. Hmm. As much as that? That's what I have. It'll be enough to start working on the gold mine and get what machinery we'll need and really go after that old pay dirt in the right way. Well, what'd you do with the map of the place? I left it right here, right on this table. Take another look at her and tell me if you think it's drawn clear enough to follow. Well, I've studied it, Andy. You won't have no trouble finding the location. I'll find the place, all right. I figure Martha can run the store while I go there with some men and kind of get things started. Why, sure she can. Andy, there's only one thing. What's that? Well, you said your brother found this place, this uh, gold location. He did. But you never saw it. No, but I'd take Sam's word for anything. He told me how good it was. And he was a man that knew what he was talking about. So I've heard. He guaranteed it was worth a plenty. Yeah, it was the last time I saw him. He's died since then. I know. I was afraid for some time that I'd never learn where the place was located. Then along came this map with a letter from the lawyer in the East who was closing out Sam's affairs. Map was about all Sam left. No cash at all. Well, Andy, I'm with you all the way. You know that. I know you are, Sheriff. Say, uh, that claim was never filed, was it? No. You know what I told the men at the meeting. It was never even staked out. Mm-hmm. Well, you better get there and tend to that as soon as you can. Oh, sure. I'll go there right away now that I've got the cash. Hey, wait. Eh? Huh? The sheriff had been facing the window that looked down the dusty main street. Suddenly, he motioned Andy into silence and moved closer to the window. His right hand moved toward his holster. Down the main street, coming straight toward them, raced a stranger on a white horse. A big man on a charging stallion. Dust swirled heavy behind the horse's pounding hoops. And the sheriff's eyes narrowed as the stranger pulled the horse to a halt, directly outside, and flung himself to the ground. Hey, someone's ridden up mighty sudden. Look at that white horse near the hitch rack. Yeah. The fellow's coming in the door. Sheriff, are you in there? Looking for me? Sheriff. Sure, I'm the sheriff. I... Hey, you're wearing a mask. Uh, never mind the mask. You know anything about the Carter gang? Carter? You don't mean Lefty Carter. Yes. He hasn't been in these parts for over a year. There's warrants for his arrest. What about him? Now you just... Put that gun away. 
I came to tell you that the Carter gang is heading this way and driving a big herd of cattle. Driving cattle? This way? Yes. Yeah, but Carter knows there's a reward in his neck in Hawksville. He wouldn't dare to come here. Well, he's coming and he's just outside of town. Hey, what's that noise? Who are you, stranger? What's the difference, Sheriff? If you want Carter, get your men together. Sheriff, go. Sheriff, look down the road. Look at the cattle coming. Hey, Sheriff! Sheriff, Penny! Get that door closed! There's a stampede heading right down the main street. Carter's not behind those longhorns. Andy, Andy, what's going on? Uh, there's a stampede. Get the door closed. Before you close the door, let me out. I'll get my horse away from there. Shut the door. Shut the door. Martha, get back. Andy, his wife, and the sheriff stood inside the closed shop watching the frantic mass of cattle storm through the streets of the town. They saw half a dozen hard-riding men firing pistols into the air as they urged the wild longhorns on their way. Finally, when the last of the cattle was gone... Now, what the Sam Hill do you make of that, Andy? Well, maybe those men were just driving the livestock through town. No such thing. That was a man-made stampede if ever I saw one. But why? Well, I don't know. I recognized a couple of gunmen who used to travel with Lefty Carter. I didn't see Lefty himself. Oh, me neither. Lefty Carter? That outlaw? Yeah. Who said he was around these parts? The mask man. I wish it had been daytime so as we could have got a better look at the cattle. I wonder whose brand they wore. I... Hey, Sheriff. Huh? Didn't I leave that map right here? Oh, yeah, right there on the table. Why? It's gone. What? Yes, it was here. I know it was, but it's gone now. Andy, what map? The map. You don't mean... It's not here. Not on the floor, either. Ah, oh, Sheriff, don't play a joke on me. Don't do it. Tell me if you hit the map. I'm not playing any jokes. I didn't see the map after you showed it to me there at the table. But it couldn't have got away by itself. That mask man. Oh, he couldn't have got it. He wasn't anywhere near the table. Remember? He stood right at the door when he talked to us. Andy, look. What's that? The two men whipped around with the tone of the woman's voice. A thin streak of sunlight from the window cut through the room, slicing down into a dark corner of floor. They saw it, too. The blade still quivering in the sunlight. The shining steel vibrating. It looked deadly, menacing. A mute messenger of peril. The point buried in the rough pine board. A message that said, danger. Great guns. A knife stuck right in the middle of the floor, holding down a message. Let me see that. I'll get it. It wasn't there when the stampede started. I know it. Yeah, here it is. Take a look. It wasn't there when I came through from my rooms in the back of the store. I would have seen it for sure if it had been. This is from Lefty Carter. Lefty Carter. No. No, not that killer. Andy, he says he's got the map. What? Lefty Carter? He'll let you know by and by how you can get it back. But if Lefty Carter has it, he can stake the claim. He can get the gold mine. Very funny, Ken. Let him show himself anywhere and he'll hang for what he's done in the past. What, he could get someone else to do? We're not after writing this note. Nope, that scheming foxy critter has got some other scheme in mind, Andy. He's got something big in the back of his head, and this is just the start of it. Lefty Carter, wanted by the law in several counties, joined his outlaw band not far from town. The cattle, which had been scattered after the stampede, was spread over a wide expanse of range. But the men who stampeded it were in a small hunter shack to meet their boss. It worked out just like I said it would, boys. That's right, Lefty. The stampede drew everyone to the doors and windows to see what was going on. And I didn't have no trouble at all slipping in the rear door of Conway store and getting that man. I told you'd be there, Lefty. It's a good thing for you. You was right, Butch. Yeah, I knew Andy Conway would have it out, showing it to the men at his meeting. As I say, it's a good thing you was right. I don't keep men with me long when they make a mistake. No, that's what I hear. Now, boys, I'll tell you how this little hunk of paper is going to be worth a lot to us. Uh, we can stake a claim. Shut up, Butch. We don't do nothing of the sort. What? 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 Not stake a claim? We don't take the gold mine? Now, look, listen to me. If we go there and stake the claim, then file our claim, what happens? All of us that the law wants land in jail and then hang. The law don't have anything against me. No, Butch. The law doesn't have anything again yet. Yet. Well, I could stick to claim in my name, and then we could split the profits from the mine. And... <laughs> Do you think I was born yesterday? You stake the claim. Why, you double-crossing sidewinder. Once you had it staked in your name, you'd see the rest of us jailing out of your way, and then you'd have it all. No, I wouldn't. Well, we're going to handle it different. I know what everyone thinks, Andy Conway. 
I know that most everyone in town that has some cash has bought a share of this gold claim. All right. What happens? Without this map, they all lose the cash they would make when the claim was developed. Now, do you think all those important men in town would sooner jail me and lose a valuable gold mine or dismiss the charges against me and get back the map that shows what the claim is at? Dismiss the charges against you? Oh, what about the rest of us? They've got to give me a full pardon for every man in my outfit if they want this map back. And pay plenty of cash besides. Because there's no copies of the maps. <laughs> no. You see, Butch made sure there was no copies. We got the only map there is. <laughs> sure a big help, Lefty. Me being able to move around town like a can without having folks know I'm working with you. Don't get big ideas, Butch. I can get someone to take your place in the gang any time I want. What's more, as soon as those pardons come through for all of us, we'll all be able to go and come as we please. Now we've got to get ready to shove on. Can't stay here till the sheriff gets a searching party after us. Yeah, where'll we hide out? I know a place. Come on, get ready. What's that? Trouble outside. What's the matter here? Look what we found. Redskin. Bring him inside. Take his guns and keep him covered. We got his guns. Where was he? Uh, me and Joe were on guard, like you said. We were waiting to give word in case a posse headed the way before he got done with the meeting. What's that got to do with the redskin? I thought I heard something like a horse's hoof at the rear of the shack. I knew our horses weren't there, so me and Joe went around and snuck up on both sides. This redskin was at the window hearing all that was said in here. So, that's it, huh? Well, me know what you plan. You do, huh? You plenty big fool. Law not give you pardon. Someday you hang. We'll see about that. Why was you hanging around? Me not talk. Hey, Lefty, I know who that redskin is. I've seen him before. Hey, who is he? His name's Tarno. Tarno? Yeah. He's a partner of the Lone Ranger. What? Lone Ranger. Where's he at? What's the Lone Ranger doing around here? Hey, we gotta fight the Lone Ranger. Yeah, we gotta fight the Lone Ranger. Shut up. Shut up, all of you. Shut You redskin. Is your name Tonto? Uh, that my name. Is it true that the Lone Ranger's near here? Lone Ranger put you crook in jail. Him get all of you. <laughs> well, boys, it looks like we've got Lady Luck smiling at us. We not only learned that the Lone Ranger's nearby and figuring on trying to catch us, but we get a hold of his partner. If this Lone Ranger wants the life of this redskin spared, he better keep a long ways from us and not interfere with my plans. And we let him know it. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger story. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments. After Andy Conway's map was stolen, the sheriff came into the store to confer with the unhappy fellow. Andy Conway had changed since his map had been stolen. Something seemed to have gone out of him. His hopes and his dreams were gone. But that map had meant gold. Gold and the security that it brings. And now those things were gone. Somehow Andy couldn't believe that things would ever be right again. He shook his head slowly at the sheriff. His voice was low and hopeless. Uh, it's no use, Sheriff. There's nothing we can do. Nothing at all. Uh, I've had men scouring the country for some trace of that game. No luck, eh? Well, we found where they went after they left here. You did? Yep. Went to a hunter's cabin. Old place outside of town. But they uh, left there. Uh, after that, the trail was lost and can't be found. Well, that licks us then. What about the cattle that was stampeded? Well, that was left by the crooks. It was scattered bad. 
Some of the men are trying to round it up now and take it back to where it come from. Uh, Sheriff, I had a note. You had a note? From Lefty? Oh, why didn't you say so? Here it is. But there's nothing we can do about it. Here, let me see it. What's it say? Well, I was told to let everyone that bought a share of the gold mine to see it. If Lefty and his gang are given free pardons of the charges against him, they'll give back the map. Otherwise, it'll burn it up. Free pardons? That's right. That's what he wants. Yeah, I see he does. Why, the ornery coyote sure wants plenty. Well, forget the note, Sheriff. Don't show it to none of the men. Well, it says here it's got to be shown. It's addressed to everyone that bought a share of the claim. You know what'll happen. They'll all start trying to get those men pardoned. They might even go to the governor to get pardons, so they wouldn't lose their interest in the claim. It's no use, Sheriff. We can't do that. How'd you get this note? Oh, well, fella brought it in to me. He said he met a man on the trail. That mask ran again. Now, see here, you. Sheriff, I want to speak to you and Andy. I'll do the talking. You were here yesterday. Hold on, Sheriff. I'm as anxious to find Lefty Carter and his gang as you are. He's captured my friend. Who? Tato, an Indian who was trying to learn something about the gang. Sheriff, we're going to find Carter's hideout. Oh, just like that, huh? Just easy like that, find the hideout. Well, I'll have you know, stranger, that you got some explaining to do. I don't see how you could have done it. But maybe you're the one that stole that map. Let me see that note. But I tore it to him, Sheriff. Might as well. Now, where'd you get it? A short, heavy set man brought it into me. Man who rode a bay horse? Yes. Do you know him? Yes, I saw his horse outside your place a little while ago. Oh. So you've been watching, eh? Yes. The man say where he got the note? Oh, he just said he was riding into town when he met a man on the trail that gave it to him. That's all he knows about it. What are you going to do? Well, I... I'm going to give your answer tonight. But there's nothing we can do. It says here that if you agree to the terms, it'll leave the light burning in the window of your store. And you'll be told how to send the pardons and get back the map. Yeah. If only we knew where that bunch of crooks are in hiding. Maybe we will. Huh? We will? How? Andy, you're going to do what I say. Well, now, you see here... Sheriff, you've nothing to lose but money. I... I have the life of my best friend at stake. I'm going to make the plans, and you're going to help carry them out. But I... I like the way you talk, mister. I'm with you. If you got any ideas, let's hear them. Dad ratted, I've spent a whole life hoping to someday strike it rich. If you can help get that map back... I'd like to get that lefty Carter, King. And I want Tonto back. Now, Andy, and you, Sheriff, listen... man started to speak. His voice was low, his words shortened to the point. And as they listened, old Andy Conway seemed to come to life again, and the sheriff moved closer. The masked man gave them confidence. The tone of his voice, the way his eyes bored into them from the slits in his blast mask, made them realize that this man could lead them from defeat to victory. The sheriff nodded his head. Andy clutched the masked man's arm eagerly, saying, yes, yes, go on, masked man. And when the masked man finished and moved out of the door and rode away, the sheriff and Andy watched him leave, then turned toward each other. Andy grinned, and a wide smile spread over the sheriff's face. The two men shook hands gleefully. That night, Butch watched and waited until he saw the light gleam from the window of the little store. He grinned in satisfaction and muttered to himself, <laughs> Good. Everything's as it should be. I thought it'd come out that way. Just a minute. Hey, I want to talk to you. Now, see here, let me go. Come on. Fast. That's right. I thought you'd be in with the gang. I don't know what you're talking about. We'll talk further when we get to the store. And in the sheriff will meet us there. You let go of You'll me. do nothing. I saw you when you came into town. I thought you were one of Lefty Carter's gang. You or no one else can prove that. It doesn't need proof. As the Lone Ranger moved toward the porch of the general store... His hand holding Butch's arm in an iron grip, getting closer and closer to the lighted window behind which waited old Andy Conway. Suddenly, Butch tore himself free. His hand whipped down with the speed of a snake. His hand closed around the butt of his six-gun. Started to yank it from the holster. But then his jaw dropped in amazement. His hand slowly opened, releasing the gun. For the masked man had beaten him to the draw. Faster than lightning, almost in the wink of an eye, a gun was in the Lone Ranger's right hand. The muzzle was a black hole centered right on Butch's staring eyes. The outlaw's shoulders sagged. He was completely licked. Silently, he let the masked man take his arm once more and lead him up on the porch. Go right in. Men are waiting for you. Here you got him, eh? Good work. Sheriff, you and I will talk to him. And he knows what he used to do. I'll go right away and tend to him. Good. Uh, now, what's this all about? Why am I here? The masked man will do the talking. Have you got nothing against me. I told you that the note I brought was handed to me by a gent I never saw before. Never mind all that. The sheriff isn't going to try to prove anything against you. What's more, I know the situation. I know about the map that was stolen. The Indian, too. And I can tell you one thing. 
If the gang that's got both is crossed up in any way, the map will burn and the red skin die. That's about the same as admitting that you're in with them. I can tell you more than that. Let's suppose that uh, Lefty's expecting a messenger to come back to him and the same don't show up. We know what would happen. Good. The messenger, and I ain't saying you're or him, will go back all right. There's only one thing. The terms of the agreement are too stiff. Oh, they are, huh? You see, the message said that the charges against all of Lefty's men would have to be dropped. That's more than can be done. We couldn't promise that. Now, ain't that too bad. What would Lefty say to a compromise? What's that? The charges against Lefty would be dropped. The rest of the gang got a short jail term. Yeah, suppose the men were charged with disturbing the peace instead of murder. How would that be? I wouldn't know. Well, I'll tell you. Now, let's not fool around with this. We know you're the messenger. We don't care. We want that map. And Toto. That's right. The map and the Indian to go free. You hurry back to the hideout, wherever it is, and see what Lefty says to the terms we spoke of. You'll follow me. We won't. How could we without your knowing it? Yeah, you couldn't. You critters have got the whip hand and you know it. <laughs> Glad you admit it. Uh, how long will it take you to get there and back? I don't know. We've got to work fast. You've got to be back here before daybreak, you know. Why have I? Well, the United States Marshals do here. If he's on hand, we won't be able to make any deal at all. Oh, I see. No matter how much we'd like to. Sure. Well? There's likelihood that the Marshal will be here any time now. Yeah, I know it. Now make tracks, will you? We know that Lefty's here going to make a deal. It would gain him nothing to have the Marshal put a stop to any deals we want to make. Now go as fast as I can. Good. But mind you... Yeah. It'll be known if I'm followed and everything is off. Now, look. You know the Lone Ranger here. You've got his partner. We know that. Now, I give you my word, you'll not be followed. We'll be right here when you get back. But hurry. I'm on my way. Andy, you found his horse all right? Sure. And you washed his hoofs? I sure did. I scrubbed them spick and span. Good. Now, Sheriff, watch the time till he gets back. One hour passed, and then another, while the Lone Ranger, Andy, and the Sheriff waited. Martha came in with food and hot coffee while those in the little store kept the vigil. At the end of another half hour, the sound of approaching hoofs could be heard faintly at first, and then louder. Then Butch reined up outside the door. The men rushed out to meet him. You bring that lantern, Andy. I've got it. Go in as fast as I could. So it seems. The horse is pretty winded. Well, I knew what it'd mean if a marshal got here, and so did Lefty. You spoke to him? Yep, I did. What's his answer? He'll make the deal. He says to put it in writing. We won't need the answer, Sheriff. Hey, what are you doing with that lantern? We were just looking at the hoofs of your horse, that's all. I saw them the last time you were here, but we had to make sure of one detail. Ah. The hoofs have red clay as high as the fetlocks. What about it? Mister, don't make no mistake. Don't make a mistake, because if you do, it'll cost the life of Tonto. And we'll lose that map as well. I don't think I've made a mistake. Sheriff, put that man under arrest. Hey, now look, All right, Butch, we're holding you. No, you can't. Throw him in jail. Then get your deputies ready for action. We're riding tonight to get Tonto on that map. The sheriff and Andy Conway put Butch in jail. Quickly, a posse was rounded up. Men grabbed their guns, stowed cartridges in their pockets, saddled their horses, and mounted. They met in front of the store. The Lone Ranger lifted his arm, waved forward. Silver reared, then leaped ahead. His hoops thundered along the moonlit ground, his white mane whipping like the northern lights. Behind him, through the dust, galloped the sheriff and old Andy and the posse, stretching their horses to full gallop to keep up with Silver. On they rode, the Lone Ranger holding Silver in check so the others would not be left behind. On and on into the night, on the trail of the outlaws. Meanwhile, Lefty and his gang felt quite secure in their hideout. They gloated over the success of their scheme and made jokes about Tonto tightly tied nearby. Boys! Boys, as I figure it out, Bush should be here in a few minutes with the agreement in riding. He better be here doggone soon. I'm getting tired of waiting for him. That redskin will sure have a rough time of it if Butch was to be captured. How about it, Tonto? No agreement ever come. No, it won't, huh? Lone Ranger never made deal with Crook. That's enough. You all Crook. And someday you all hang. Let me take a crack at him for talking like that. Ah, you fella, plenty big coward. Plenty brave when you got other men outnumbered. Hey, boys, I hear someone. That'll be Butch. Get the door open so we can see for sure. Good thing there's plenty of moon tonight. Hey, that's not Butch. Silver. It's a Lone Ranger. Get your hands up. That window, the sheriff. I got you covered out here. No guns, you crook. Old Silver's teddy boy. Take the gun, Sheriff. I'll hold it up on them. I'll show you. Hold oh, my hand. All right, boys, close in. We got the whole wolf. All right, cut uh, Are you all right? Uh, me plenty good. I'll cut those ropes in a jiffy. There you are. Uh, map over there. Me get it. Is the map all right? They didn't get the chance to burn it? Oh, uh, 
snap. All plenty good. They didn't get a chance to do anything. We got the drop on them from all sides. Butch squealed that dirty double cross. Oh, he didn't, Lefty. Butch was just as surprised as you were. You'd never have found this shack if he hadn't told you. Butch didn't need to squeal. The Lone Ranger saw the red clay on the hoofs of his horse. Red clay? That's right. He knew there was only one section where a horse could go through red clay as deep as the fetlocks. And when he found out how long it took for Butch to ride from town to your hideout and back to town, he knew about how far to come to find you. Well, I'll get square. Maybe you'll drill me, but before you do, I'll square things with the Lone Ranger. I'll get you. Uh, look out. Hey. Oh. Anyone else wants a gun shot out of his hand, just slap leather. Oh, my hand. My hand. Take over, boys. Get ropes on him before another one gets the full notion he can shoot faster than the Lone Ranger. Hey, hold on there. Stop that masked man so we can... So we appreciate what he's done. Now, wait a minute, mister. You've got a lot of rewards coming to you. Use the rewards to develop your gold mine. Wait, we got to thank you. just heard is a copyrighted feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated. Put them all together and they spell camel. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking camels than ever before. And draw up a chair for tonight's camel show starring Bud Abbott and Luke Costello. Will you listen to me? What are you writing on that pad? Hey, Abbott, what are you writing I'm, on that pad? I'm just making out a list of girls I'm going to kiss next week. Here's who I got picked out. Lizzie Schwartz, Maggie Mugglemeyer, Tessie Tinfoil, Lana Turner. Now, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Lana Turner wouldn't kiss you. Oh, no? Oh, no. Then I'll scratch her off my list. I love you. <laughs> you dummy, always thinking of girls. Girls, girls, girls. A great men don't waste their time on girls. Where do you suppose Benjamin Franklin would have been if he'd have thought of girls all of the time? In the front row at Earl Carroll's? No, no, no. <laughs> Costello, I've been telling you for the past three weeks. You've got to quit chasing girls and get yourself a job. Look at you. Look how sloppy you are. Look at your socks. I can't help my socks, have it. It's those new Hickok plastic garters. What's the matter with them? Your stock socks stay up, but your legs fall down. Yeah. Look, Costello, tell me if Luke Costello. Yeah, boy. Out of the way, Fatso. I'm looking for Luke Costello. Boy, he is Luke Costello. The famous Luke Costello. The one and only Luke yes, Costello. Yes. That's me. Gee, I listen to you on the radio every Thursday night. You break me up when you say, How do you do? Wait a minute! Wait a minute! 
That ain't me. That's the mad Russian. You're saying? I'm not. Who's going to take this telegram? I'll, I'll take, take it. it. It's collect. Fourteen dollars. He'll, He'll take, take it. it. <laughs> Don't give it to me. Here, boy. Hey, Costello. This telegram is from Joe DiMaggio. Listen to this. Dear Lou, as you know, I am recovering from a foot operation. I would appreciate you, appreciate you taking my place. Appreciate you taking my place on New York Yankees until I recover. Please report to the Yankee Stadium immediately. Signed, Joe DiMaggio. Have it. Hey, that's, that's the news. That's the news I've been waiting for. I'm going to be a big league ball player. Yes, DiMaggio probably heard about my playing with the Cucamonga Wildcats last year. You are ball play? I don't believe it, Costello. You know nothing about ball. Oh no, I eat baseball. I live baseball. All night when I'm asleep, I dream about baseball. Don't you ever dream about girls? What? And miss my turn up at bat? Oh. <laughs> Yes. And another thing, Abbott. What page are you on? Never mind what page you're on. <laughs> another thing, Abbott. Not only that, in Patterson, New Jersey, I worked out with a baseball team. I used to stay out till 4 o'clock in the morning. Why did you stay out till 4 o'clock in the morning? This was a girl's baseball team. <laughs> now, Stella, if you're going to play with the New York Yankees, if you really have to know something about big league baseball, Lou. I know all about baseball. All right. Suppose there's a left-handed pitcher pitching. What do you do? I put in a right-handed batter. Now, suppose there's a right-handed pitcher pitching. I put in a left-handed batter. But now I trick you. I take out the right-handed pitcher and put in a left-handed pitcher. Then I double-cross you. I take out my left-handed batter and put in a right-handed batter. Now, wait a minute. Where are you getting all those right-handed batters? The same place where you're getting all those left-handed pitchers. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Bud. Hello, <laughs> Lewis, honey. It's, uh, it's Marilyn Maxwell. Hello, Marilyn. I've got great news. I'm going to play ball with the New York Yankees. I'm taking you along as a pitcher. Oh, now, Costello, Marilyn Maxwell can't pitch. Oh, no? You should see all the guys she struck out that were trying to get the first base. Ah, no. <laughs> this kid has got some nice curves. Oh, I know. oh, Lewis, you're so sweet. But I do hope you be careful. You know, big league baseball is a very dangerous game. Oh, what's dangerous about baseball, Marilyn? Well, I read in the paper this morning that in the opening game in Boston... Five players died on base. <laughs> Marilyn, you don't seem to know much about baseball. Let me show you how to play indoor baseball. First, I put my left arm around your waist. Then I snuggle my head on your shoulder like this. Then I press my cheek against your cheek. Oh, wait a minute, Costello. That's not the way to play indoor baseball. How do you like that? Every season, new rules. <laughs> well, well, goodbye and good luck, Lewis. I just know you'll become famous for those New York Yankees. Marilyn's right, Thank Costello. You, this is Thank your you. chance to become famous. Now, you've got a good job as a baseball player. And you might find your proper niche in life. Yes, I might. I mean, after all, if I find my... What will I find? A niche, a niche. You'll find your niche. Abbott, when I find an itch, I scratch it. No. <laughs> what in the world are you talking about? An itch. I once had the seven-year itch. What happened? I scratched real fast and got rid of it in three and a half years. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about that kind of an itch. I mean, a niche in life. A niche in life is what everyone is looking for. Anyone who is successful has found a niche. Well, if that's the case, I know an Airedale that is doing very well. Uh, well listen, listen to me, Costello. When I say a niche, I don't mean a niche like you have when you have an itch. I mean a niche like you have when you have a notch. Oh, you don't mean an itch like a niche when you have a niche. You mean a niche like you have when you have a notch. Now you've got it. Now I've got it. I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Costello, why do you mash everything up like that? You're the most mixed-up man I ever saw. Well, maybe it's because I fell on my mother's mix master this morning. She had a set for mashed potatoes. Oh. <laughs> I'm all I know that. I'm an idiot. All I'm trying to tell you is that a niche is a notch. Catch? Notch. Notch. All right. Now you know that a niche is a notch. Uh, you know that both of them are the same. Yes. Now, I could have a notch and you could have a niche. Yes. Niche to me and notch to you. Yes. <laughs> I'm only trying to impress you the importance of being a big, big league ball player and having a good income. Did you ever draw a nice big fat salary? No, I never drew a fat salary, but I once sketched a skinny tomato. No, no, no. no. <laughs> so when I say draw, I don't mean draw like you draw when you draw. I mean draw like you draw when you draw a salary. Have it. Let me smell your breath. Mm-hmm. Just as I thought. You've drawn one too many already. Now, now, listen, you listen to me, please. When I say you draw a salary, I mean you draw money. Now he's got me drawing money. Wait till the FBI finds out about this. I'll probably draw 20 years in a clink. And they don't feed you any salary in there, either. Costello, when I say you draw money, I mean you draw like you draw money to spend it. Not, not like when you draw on an easel. That's what I always say. With money, it's easel come, easel go. Now, now, now. 
Everybody draws money. I draw money. I've been drawing money for years. My brother draws money. He's been drawing money for years. You draw and your brother draws? Certainly. Just as I thought. You and your brother are an old pair of drawers. <laughs> Experience is the best teacher. It happened shortly after the end of the war. Two cigarettes glow in the dusk on the veranda of a country house as a man and woman are chatting. The woman remarks... Robert, you've changed your cigarette brand. This is a camel. I can tell without even looking. Yes, I have changed my brand. You know how we smoked whatever cigarettes we could get during the war? Don't I? Yes, I must have tried all the brands during that shortage. That's when I found I liked camels best. And weren't you right? Yes, experience is the best teacher. During the wartime shortage, people smoked whatever cigarettes they could get. It was this experience that taught millions the differences in cigarette quality. As smokers tried cigarette after cigarette on their T-zones, that's tea for taste and tea for throat, it was Camel's rich, full flavor and cool mildness that stood out from all the others. The result? Today, more people smoke camels than ever before. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel. And while you light up a camel, here's Skinny Ennis with Linda. When I go to sleep, I never can sheep. I cuddle the charms about Linda. Lately it seems. All of my dreams I walk with my arms about Linda But what good does it do me For Linda doesn't know I exist Can't help feeling gloomy Think of all the loving I've missed We pass on the street My heart skips a beat I say to myself Hello Linda If only she'd smile I'd stop her a while, and then I would get to know Linda. But miracles still happen, and when my lucky star begins to shine, with one lucky break, I'll make Linda mine. On the street, my heart skips the beat. I say to myself, hello, Linda. If only she'd smile, I'd stop her a while. And then I would get to know Linda. But miracles still happen. And when my lucky star begins to shine, with one lucky break, I'll make Linda mine. A big uh, league ball player, you've got to get yourself in shape. Now, from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., you lift weights. From 9 to 10, deep knee bends. 10 to 11, skip rope. 11 to 12, run five miles. 12 to 1, I'll never make it. I lost. <laughs> you idiot, you'll never be a ball player. Staying up late and going to nightclubs, eating rich food, running around with beautiful girls. Do you know what can happen to you? Yes, I can become manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers. I... <laughs> Hello. I don't even know why DiMaggio picked you. You don't even know how to swing a bat. I know all about swinging bats. When I was a kid, my father used to hit me with a baseball bat. My brother used to hit me with a baseball bat. My Uncle Artie Stebbins used to hit me with a baseball bat. And my mother used to hit me with a tennis racket. With a tennis racket? Yes, she didn't like baseball. <laughs> well, oh, well, it's Gilly Ennis. Hey, Costello. I heard about you taking uh, Joe DiMaggio's place for the New York Yankees. That's right. You know, I used to pitch for the Hollywood Stars. And boy, I'll never forget my last game. There were five men on base. No, oh, no, wait, 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 wait. Five men on base. Now, that's impossible. Did you ever see the Hollywood stars play? I... 
Ennis, I've seen the Hollywood stars, and I don't remember you. Oh, I've changed a lot since then. I had the biggest buck teeth you ever saw. I was the only man on the team that could slide into second base and spike you from either end. <laughs> well, so long, Fatso. So long, Skinny. So long. Hey, you know that Skinny would make an ugly skeleton? All right. <laughs> Well, don't waste time with him. Now, you've got to get ready for the opening game. Yes, I think we're going to play the Cleveland Indians. Cleveland Indians, eh? Uh-huh. Feller pitching? Certainly there's a feller pitching. <laughs> Who do you think they'd use a girl? Oh, I, I know they don't use a girl. I said feller pitching. What feller? Feller with the Cleveland Indians. Look, Abbott, there's nine guys on the Cleveland team. Now, which feller are you talking about? <laughs> feller that pitches. There is only one feller with Cleveland. You mean nine Yankees are going to play against one fella? That's right. You mean there's no fellas in the outfield? No. And there's no fellas in the infield? No. Cleveland only has one fella. Well, this fella must be pretty good if, if they don't, he don't need any other players but himself. Look, all the players will be out there helping him. You just said there was only one fella on the team. That's right. Then where did all them other fellas come from? Oh, you idiot. When I say there's only one fella on the team, I mean there is only one fella that pitches. Well, Abbott, when the manager of the team wants this pitcher, what does he call him? Feller. You mean he just hollers, hey, Feller! And this guy knows that they mean him? That's right. <laughs> His name is Feller, Feller, Bob Feller. And when I say there is only one Feller on the team that pitches, that's it. And the Feller that pitches is Feller. There's only the other Fellers on the team, uh, but there's uh, only one Feller. Boy, are you mixed up. <laughs> oh, you mean the Feller that pitches... It's fella. And there's other fellas on the team, but they're not fellas? Now you grasp it. Yes, I grasp it, but it keeps slipping out of my hand. <laughs> Let's go into this sporting goods store and get your baseball equipment. I want you to look right for the opening game. Now, go ahead and ask that lady there where they keep the baseball uniforms. Uh, pardon me, miss. Well, if it isn't Mr. Albert. Hello. And Mr. Costello. Hello. You fought, little mon, you. <laughs> what are you doing in the sporting goods store, miss? Oh, I just soaked in to get a gift for my nephew. I'm buying him a boss ball. Ball. Boss ball? ball. <laughs> Abbott, you know what a boss ball is? That's what the poocher throws to the coocher. <laughs> and the booter tries to boot a home run. <laughs> my, uh, my nephew is just a loto chope, but his ambition is to be a Brooklyn doger caucher. Well, if he's only a little guy, why don't he join the deep troot chookers and be a short stoop? <laughs> be going. As we say in Chinese, it's a gooey hot dooey on Christmas to you. And a dish of gooey chop suey and a push for your too. Hey, look at that, fella. Take care of for now. This can... fellow said to bust a crab, what dive did you come out of? <laughs> well, my friend and I are here to get some baseball equipment. Uh, I'd like to see a baseball uniform that would fit Costello. So would I. <laughs> <laughs> Look, as Adam said to Eve, quit ribbing me. <laughs> However, I'll do the best I can. We'll start with the spiked shoes. What size do you wear? Eight. Oh, let me see. I've only got one pair left, and they're size five. Maybe you can squeeze into them, Costello. Go ahead and try. Okay. <laughs> what do you know? Open-toed baseball shoes. Uh, now for the uniform. My, you're certainly a pudgy little rascal, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Aren't you overweight? I'm about 120 pounds overweight, but I'm going back to my normal weight. Yes, that's normal. 60 pounds overweight. <laughs> Costello, you, you should really go on a diet. Yeah, of course you know what a diet is, don't you? Oh, sure. That's where you can eat all you want of everything you don't like. <laughs> Young man, if you really want to reduce, why don't you exercise with a couple of dumbbells? Okay, I'm ready whenever you and Abbott are. All right. <laughs> Cut that out. Okay. Well, we've got to get your baseball equipment. Mister, do you have any bats? Oh, certainly. Here's a fine bat. Autographed by Slaughter of the Cardinals. This bat was made for Slaughter. Ain't you got one that was made for baseball? <laughs> when he says slaughter, he means slaughter the baseball player. Slaughter the baseball player? With well, that bet you could slaughter anybody. <laughs> no, no, Costello, I'm talking about slaughter. 
Everybody knows Slaughter. He knows Slaughter. Well, maybe he knows Slaughter, but I don't know. You idiot. Everybody knows Slaughter, the baseball player. Slaughter is the man's last name. What's his first name? He knows. Now, there's a clever guy. He knows his first name. Oh, look. Forget about the bat. Look, mister, do you have a baseball cap that will fit Costello's head? What size pencil sharpener does he wear? Yeah. Oh, oh, a baseball cap. Oh, yes, here's a dandy. This is the kind fella wears. What fella? The fella with the Cleveland Indians. There's nine players with the Cleveland Indians. Which fella are you talking about? Oh, young man, when I say fella with the Cleveland Indians, I am only referring to one fella. The fellow that pitches with the Cleveland Indians. When you say the fellow with the Cleveland Indians, you're only referring to one fellow. The fellow that pitches for the Cleveland Indians. Yeah. As Orville said to Wilbur, you're right. <laughs> How do you like that? Not a doing our routines and sporting good story. <laughs> oh, forget about him, Custer. Hey, wait a minute. I've got an idea. Mrs. Wetwash's late husband used to be a big league ba- ball player. Now, uh, he was a home run king, in other words. Now, maybe she'll give you one of his bats for good luck. Let's uh, go over to her house and ask her. Oh, Okay. I'll, I'll go right over now, huh? You're right, Abbott. As John Adams said to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. How do you like that? I forgot what John Adams said to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Well, good morning, Mrs. Wetwash. Oh, hello, Mr. Abbott. Oh, my. You know you ought to muzzle that St. Bernard dog. <laughs> Oh, pardon me, it's Costello. <laughs> Tell me, <laughs> Mrs. Whitwash, I wish you hadn't said that. I was just telling Abbott, your face reminds me of a rose. Oh, really? An American beauty rose? No, a rhinoceros. <laughs> <laughs> Costello. Mrs. Wetwash, Costello's leaving for New York to join uh, Joe DiMaggio's play. Take Joe's place. Isn't that wonderful? He's going to play with the Yanks. Oh, I can't believe it. Yes? What do those big Yanks bomb with a little jerk like him? <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Wetwash... That was an insult. I'll have you know that beautiful women find me irresistible. <laughs> I don't find you irresistible. And I don't find you beautiful. <laughs> Quiet, Costello. Ask her for those baseball bats her husband left her. Okay. Mrs. Whitwash, I understand when your husband was alive, he had a lot of old bats. That's a lie. He never went out with anybody but me. <laughs> no, 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 no. Mrs. Costello means your husband's uh, baseball bats. You yes. see, he thought you might give him one of them. Yes, that's right, Mrs. Wetwash. You see, I need a good bat. Oh, you need a good bat. I'll be glad to help you out. Can I have the bat right now? Right now. Presents lovely Marilyn Maxwell for Metro Golden Mayor, producers of The Sea of Grass. For Camel fans everywhere in honor of New Orleans Jazz Week, Marilyn sings for the first time on the air the title song of the picture, New Orleans. Do you know what it means to miss New Orleans and miss it each night and day? I know I'm not wrong, the feeling's getting stronger. The longer I stay away It's the moss-covered vines The tall sugar pines Where mockingbirds used to sing And I'd like to see The lazy Mississippi A-hurrying in
Insight Survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Three leading independent research organizations asked this question of 113,597 doctors. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand name most was Camel. Now, you probably enjoy rich, full flavor and cool mildness in a cigarette just as much as doctors do. And that's why, if you're not a Camel smoker now, try a Camel on your T-zone. That's T for taste and T for throat. Your true proving ground for any cigarette. See if Camel's rich flavor of superbly blended choice tobaccos isn't extra delightful to your taste. See if Camel's cool mildness isn't in harmony with your throat. See if you, too, don't say Camel's suit my T-zone to a T. Well, Costello, I'm going to New York with you. You know, Bucky Harris, the Yanks manager, gave me a job as coach for as long as you're on the team. Look, Abbott, if you're a coach, you must know all the players. I certainly do. Well, you know, I, ne- I never met the guys, so you'll have to tell me their names, and then I'll know who's playing on the team. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you their names, but you know, strange it may seem, they give these ball players nowadays very peculiar names. You mean funny names? Strange names, pet names, like Dizzy Dean and... Brother Daffy. Daffy Dean. I'm their French cousin. French? Gouffet. Gouffet Dean. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, let's see, we have on the bags, we have who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find I out. I say, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. Are you the manager? Yes. You're going to be the coach, too? Yes. And you know the fellow's name? Oh, I should. Well, then who's on first? Yes. I mean, the fellow's name. Oh. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first base. Who? The guy playing first. Who is on first? I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. That's it. That's who? Yes. <laughs> you got a first baseman? Certainly. Who's playing first? That's right. When you pay off the first baseman every month, who gets the money? Every dollar of it. <laughs> All I'm trying to find out is the fellow's name on first base. Who? The guy that gets the That's money. That's it. Who gets the money on he first base? He does. Base? Every dollar. Sometimes his wife comes down and collects it. Who's what? Yes. <laughs> Look, all I want to know is when you sign up the first baseman, how does he sign his name to the Who? contract? The guy. Who? How does he sign his That's name? That's how he signs it. Who? Yes. All I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's name on first base. No, what is on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? One base at a time. Well, don't change the players. I'm not changing nobody. Take it easy, buddy. I'm only asking you who's the guy on first base. That's right. Okay. All right. <laughs> No, what is on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. Oh, he's on third. We're not talking about him. Now, <laughs> uh, how did I get on third base? Why, you mentioned his name. If I mentioned a third baseman's name, who did I say is playing third? No, who's playing first? What's on first? What's on second? I don't know. He's on third. There I go, back on third again. <laughs> Now, who's playing third base? Why do you insist on putting who on third base? What am I putting on third? Now, what is on second? You don't want who on second. Who is on first? I don't know. Third, third base! base. <laughs> Look, you got outfield? Sure. The left fielder's name. Why? I just thought I'd ask. Well, I just thought I'd tell you. Then tell me who's playing left field. Who is playing first? I'm not staying out of the infield! <laughs> Name in left field. Now, what is on second? I'm not asking you who's on who's second. Who's on first? I don't know. Third base. Is the left fielder's name? Why? Because. Oh, he's center field. Me, he's center field. Look, look, look. You got a pitcher on a team? Sure. The pitcher's name? Tomorrow. You don't want to tell me today? I'm telling you, then man. Go ahead. Tomorrow. What time? What time what? What time tomorrow? You're going to tell me who's pitching. Now, listen. Who is not pitching? I'll who break is... your arm, you say. Who's on second? <laughs> What's on second? I don't know. Today. How the catcher? The catcher's name. Today. Today. And Tamar's pitching. Now you've got it. All we got is a couple of days on the field. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a catcher, too. No, they don't. I get behind the plate, do some fancy catching. Tamar's pitching on my team, and the heavy hitter gets up. Yes. Now, the heavy hitter bunched the ball. When he bunched the ball, me being a good catcher, I want to throw the guy out of first base, so I pick up the ball and throw it to who? Now, that's the first thing you've said right. I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> It's a ball of ball of first base. Yes. Now, who's got it? Naturally. <laughs> Look, if I throw the ball of first base, somebody's got to get it. Now, who has it? Naturally. Who? Naturally. Naturally? Naturally. So I pick up the ball and I throw it to naturally. No, you don't. You throw the ball to who? Naturally. That's different. That's what I say. You're not saying that. I throw the ball to naturally. You throw it to who? Naturally. That's it. That's what I said. That's it. You ask me. I throw the ball to who? Naturally. Now you ask me. You throw the ball to who? Naturally. That's it. Same as you. Don't say to me Same as you. Okay, now get it over. I throw the ball to who? Whoever it is drops the ball and the guy runs a second. Yes. Who picks up the ball and throws it to what? What throws it to, I don't know. I don't know, throws it back to tomorrow. Triple play. Yes. Another guy gets up and it's a long fly ball to be caused. Why? 
I don't know. He's on third, and I don't give a darn. Well, what? I said, I don't give a darn. Oh, that's our shortstop. I mean, he's... Well, uh... <laughs> Just a moment for Camel Cigarettes. During the war, the makers of Camel Cigarettes sent a total of more than 150 million free camels to our fighting men overseas. Now free camels are sent to servicemen's hospitals instead. This week, the camels go to Veterans Hospital, Fort Lyon, Colorado, USAF Station Hospital, Davis Mountain Field, Tucson, Arizona, U.S. Naval Hospital, Quantico, Virginia, U.S. Marine Hospital, Baltimore, Maryland, and Veterans Hospital, Palo Alto, California. Camel broadcasts go out to the United States three times a week. Are rebroadcast to practically every area in the world where men are still stationed and to our good neighbors in Central and South America. And now back to Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Uh, what is that, Lou? You've got your hand there. Another telegram? Hey, Abbott, look. I just got a telegram from Joe DiMaggio. Well, go ahead and read it. Okay. Dear Lou, just heard your show. I think you have the makings of the world's greatest natural ball player. You have spiked teeth, a club head, and you've been off your base for years. Good night. <laughs> good night, folks. Good night, everybody. And a special good night to Joe DiMaggio. Get well quick, Joe. This is Abbott and Costello again next Thursday tonight when Costello is going to build himself a new prefabricated house. You can imagine the trouble he'll get into. I don't know whether it'll be a one-story house or a two-story house, but anyway, that's another story. Prince Albert Pipe Appeal. They're one and the same thing. Any tobacco burns, makes smoke, but where else can you find the tobacco that has the pipe appeal of Prince Albert? The coolness, mildness, the rich, full flavor. Prince Albert is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Grim cut to smoke slow and cool. So pack your pipe with mellow, rich PA. Enjoy Pipe Appeal with Prince Albert. And while we're speaking of enjoying yourself, be sure to tune in on Grand Ole Opry on NBC Saturday night. You all know and love the songs of America, but this week you have something extra special in store for you. Red Foley and his guests, Ernest Tubb and Roy Acuff. Grand Ole Opry, Saturday night on NBC. Be sure to tune in next week for another great Abbott and Costello show brought to you by Camel Cigarettes. And remember, experience is the best teacher. Try a camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking camels than ever before. C A M P L S. Abbott and Costello's famous baseball routine, Who's On First, is now available at Phonograph Records. This is Michael Roy in Hollywood wishing you all a pleasant good night. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Norma Shearer, Walter Pigeon, and Adolf Manjou in The Last of Mrs. Cheney. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to tell you that tonight's Lux Radio broadcast, as well as those in weeks to come, will be heard by American armed forces throughout the world by shortwave and other special facilities. I'm not a superstitious man, but I haven't been walking under any ladders lately either. In fact, I've got my fingers crossed right now because every time Norma Shearer has been scheduled to appear at this microphone for the last six years, something has happened to cancel the date. But all things come to him who waits, if he waits long enough. So this week... We borrowed Norma from the cast of the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture, Her Cardboard Lover, along with Walter Pidgeon from the same studios, Mrs. Miniver. And if nothing happens between now and curtain time, you will hear them starring with Adolf Manjou in The Last of Mrs. Cheney. Our play packed in the customers for a solid season on Broadway, and Hollywood, on two different occasions, found material for a hit in this brilliant comedy. Norma Shearer starred in one of the picture versions herself, Tonight is Mrs. Cheney. She has a part made to order for an actress of beauty, wit, and charm. And that, of course, is Norma Shearer. For this hour each week, we like to think that we're helping a whole nation forget the problems of the moment and relax in another world, the world of the theater, to laugh a little, to thrill to find drama, and tomorrow to return to the task at hand with new determination. 
That's the job of this Lux Radio Theater, which Lux Toilet Soap brings you each Monday night. We're all hurrying along these days because we all have something important to do. If Americans had less native stamina, we might see smiles disappearing, but not here. We thrive on hard work. The men are more cheerful, and the ladies, unless my eyes deceive me, look lovelier than ever. And, as most of you know, Lux Toilet Soap helps to put that smiling complexion on the situation. Here's the curtain going up now for Act One of The Last of Mrs. Cheney, starring Norma Shearer as Mrs. Cheney, Walter Pigeon as Lord Arthur Dilling, and Adolf Monjou as Charles. All is sure that John is sure. All is sure that John is sure. <laughs> A few short years ago, when the oceans of the world were calm and untroubled, a luxury liner left its berth in New York Harbor and turned its mighty prow to the open sea. As usual on the first day out, there was great speculation among the passengers about the identity of their shipmates. As usual, there was one person who stole the lion's share of the comment. She was young, lovely, beautiful, and so far as the rest of the ship was concerned, nameless. Did you ring for me, sir? Yes, come in, Stuart. I'd like some information about a passenger. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, what is the passenger's name, sir? That's what I want you to tell me. Uh, will you describe the passenger, sir? Well, now, let me see. She's rather beautiful, I'd say, and uh, she's sort of... Uh... No, you don't mean the lady with, uh, uh, with that... Uh, uh, well, that look, sir. And she has a way of... Uh, uh, well, it's That's rather... the woman? Who is she? Uh, her name is Cheney. Uh, Mrs. Faye Cheney. Mrs.? Uh, sorry, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, too. Uh, go on, Stuart. Well, what else do you wish to know, sir? Oh, uh, just break down, Stuart. Here. Will a pound note help you to remember? Oh, thank you, sir. She's American, a widow, traveling alone. Has seven or eight trunks, no pets. She has it to look sweet, comes from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and you're the fifth gentleman who's asked about her in the last two hours. You've quite a fund of information. And, uh, what do you know about me? You, sir, are Lord Arthur Dilling, first son of the Earl, traveling to England with a party of friends. Good. You were recently sued for breach of promise by a young lady you met on the Fifth Avenue bus. And uh, got... that's, um, enough. Uh, I don't want to know too much about myself. Good morning. Mrs. Cheney, I believe. Mrs. Faye Cheney? Yes. Why do you ask? Well, I just wanted to be sure. It seems to me... No, uh... we haven't. Uh, haven't what? We've never met. I've never seen you before in my life. And if you don't leave me alone, Lord Dilling, I'll have to call the steward. Mm, at least you know my name. May I call you Faye? Please don't. Oh. A uh, lovely morning, though, isn't it? I'm trying to enjoy it. Stuart? Uh, yes, madam. Will you please... Oh, uh... Stuart. Will you be good enough to get us a couple of deck chairs? Right away, sir. Fine. Do you behave like this with every woman you meet? Or do you only reserve it for those you try to pick up? I'm glad you asked me that question. You know, I was afraid you were going to snub me. I believe I have met you after all. You're that well-known type of man who thinks he can foist his company on any woman who happens to attract him. I'm sorry. I suppose I owe you an apology. You see, I merely did it to win a bet. Do you know Willie Winton? Oh, no, no, of course you don't. But Willie bet me 30 pounds you wouldn't dine at our table tonight. That, of course, is a lie. Of course. But will you? No, thanks. I've been warned about you, Lord Dilling. Have my friends been talking again? No, the newspapers. Oh. Oh, well, there you are, Arthur. Lovely morning. Oh, hello. I beg your pardon, but you know this young man? Uh, uh, why, yes, of course. Then will you be good enough to tell him to leave me alone? Oh, I say, Arthur, again. Again, old man. Oh. Sorry. Uh, may I see you to your stateroom, madam? Well, I'm not that crushed. But I would like a uh, walk around the deck. Oh, of course. Bye. I, uh... <clears throat> I do hope Arthur wasn't annoying you. Oh, but he was. Oh, I'm frightfully sorry. You see, he's a sort of vague relation of mine, and I feel rather responsible. Oh, I shouldn't. Uh, you mustn't judge all of us by Arthur. We're rather nice, really. I'm sure you are. Uh, perhaps you dine at our table tonight and discover us for yourself. Thank you. I, I'd be delighted, but won't your friend think it's rather sudden? Oh, no, no, no. I, I'll simply introduce you as Miss... Uh, Miss... Mrs. Cheney. Uh, Mrs. Cheney, whom I met in... Uh, Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota? Oh, precisely. Why not? I think you're very kind, Mr. Um... Francis Kelton. Oh, Lord Francis Kelton? Why, yes. Uh, how nice that you should know. Uh, 
Mrs. Cheney, my dear, whom I met in Minnesota. Uh, Mrs. Cheney, Lady Winton. How do you do? I hope I'm not intruding, Lady Winton. My dear Mrs. Cheney, you're a perfect godsend. Here am I, a lone woman with three dreadful men. Are you going to London, Mrs. Cheney? Yes, I am. Planning to stay long? Yes, I'm taking a house there. How nice. Hello, Kitty. Am I late for dinner again? Yes, Billy, you are. This is my husband, Mrs. Cheney, an old friend of Francis's. How do you do, Mrs. Cheney? This is a pleasant surprise. Thank Sit you. down, Willie. Where's Arthur? Hmm? Oh, uh, he's coming. Uh, here he is. Evening, Kitty. Sorry I'm late. Oh, good evening. Uh, Mrs. Cheney, uh, may I present Lord Arthur Dilling? How do you do? Oh, we've met. Don't you remember? I'm the fellow who lies. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, Willie. Uh, yes, old man? You owe me 30 pounds. <laughs> so I do. <laughs> Hey, Cheney, request the pleasure of your company at a charity concert to be held at her home on the afternoon of April the 6th at RSVP. Oh, Charles. Yes, my lord. How long is that going to go on out there? Any idea? Well, I believe it's the last selection, my lord. Good. Whiskey and soda, please. Yes, my lord. By the way, Charles. My lord. I can't help thinking I've seen you somewhere before. Indeed, sir. Where have we met? We have never met, my lord. Ah, uh, I assure you we have. I was educated, uh, I mean, I was at Oxford and... Uh, uh, I once passed through Oxford on a train, my lord. Your manner suggests to me you might have got out and stayed there for some years. Well, I had no idea Oxford had a school for butlers, my lord. Mrs. Cheney seems to have a high regard for you, Charles. Well, I've served the family a long time, my lord. And naturally, you know Mrs. Cheney's likes and dislikes, her whims. A good servant, my lord, always tries to sense the mood of his employer. Then, uh, what is her private opinion of all, uh, oh, uh, all this? This, my lord? Yes, London, all her new friends, uh, uh, myself, for instance. Well, I couldn't say, my lord. Mrs. Cheney would never think of discussing her private affairs with servants. Uh, I accept the rebuke. There was none meant, my lord. Nevertheless, Charles, I still think we've met before. Perhaps it only seems so, my lord. Ah, uh, perhaps. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Goodbye, Maria. Kelton, are you driving me? Oh, uh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, goodbye, Mrs. Cheney. It's been delightful. Lord Kelton, I ought to scold you. You really shouldn't have bid so much for that doll. Oh, it wasn't for the doll, exactly. <laughs> it was more for you, Mrs. Cheney. Oh, bidding for me? Oh, oh no, no, no. I mean, well, <laughs> I shouldn't <laughs> I know. Have been... <laughs> and thank you. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, my dear. Hey, will you dine with me Saturday? Oh, I'm so sorry. I promised a weekend to the Duchess of Ebley. The Duchess? Oh, you lucky beast. Well, do get her to show you the Ebley pearls, my dear. They're fantastic. The Ebley pearls? But don't ask her how she got them. That's rather fantastic, too. <laughs> Bye, dear. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh, George. Yes, madam? Will you clear away the garden furniture, please, and have William bring the car around? I'll be out for dinner. Yes, madam. Oh, where is Charles? I believe he's in the drawing room, madam. Shall I tell him? No, I'll find him. Charles, I'd like to see you a moment. Yes, madam. Hello. Join me in a whiskey and soda? Arthur, I thought you'd gone. Why? Well, all the others have. I'm waiting for my man with the car. Your man has been waiting for some time, my lord. Has he? Well, it's a lovely afternoon, Charles. Tell him to wait a little longer. Yes, my lord. Hello. Hello. I rang you up five times this week, and each time I was told you were out. What a shame. Were you out? No. Each time I was in. Ah, I thought so. Twice I answered it myself and told you I was out. Now, may I ask why? Certainly. I don't care to be alone with you, even on a telephone. Why not? It's my only way of paying tribute to your reputation. Oh, don't tell me it frightens you. <laughs> you have the great distinction, Arthur, dear, of being one of the few men in the world I'm not frightened of. And I feel I ought to be. Really? Why? Well, you're, you're not bad looking, exquisitely indifferent, even rude to people. A great sense of humor, brilliant and... What uh, else? That's the trouble. Nothing else. Uh, tell me. Did you learn the art of rebuking people so charmingly from your butler, or did he learn it from you? I wonder. I like that fellow. You mean my butler? Yes. I like his insolence. 
Was Charles rude to you? Oh, no, the reverse. I have often been told to go to Blaze's, but never so pleasantly as he told me a few minutes ago. <laughs> How stupid of Charles. He should know you'd already gone. Now, who told you that? Oh, some of the women who went part of the way with you. You appear to have rather a low opinion of me. Shall we say I haven't a very high one? Really? Have you of yourself? Mm, not at the moment. Then there's hope. I want you to like me. You've got to like me. Now, what can I do about it? Heat. For instance? Live up to the reputation you have for possessing a sense of humor. Go on. Stop living on the glory of your ancestors. Anything else? And tell me exactly why you remained here today after the others had gone. I wanted to be alone with you. Yes. And tell you you're the most attractive woman I ever knew. Oh, and then? If that went well, I proposed to suggest a little dinner at my flat. I see. And if that went well? Then I'd be experienced enough not to say another word till after the dessert. <laughs> <laughs> In the future, I shall never dream of asking you to dine with me without a couple of bishops. <laughs> but why, Arthur? You've depressed me. I don't feel half the fellow I thought I was, and, well, it's a bore. You're no end of a fellow if you only knew it. Nonetheless, I feel now that I have been talking to an entirely good woman. You are, aren't you? Why do you want to know? Because I should feel such a fool if you weren't. I am. But still willing to throw yourself at a man like Kelton? Throw myself? Well, that's what I'd call it. I wouldn't. And why shouldn't you? He's rich, he's solid, he's reliable, and, oh, something of a fool. Arthur, dear, ring the bell, will you? Certainly. What for? Charles knows where your hat is. Oh. Do you mind if I finish my drink? You don't drink with your meals, do you? Certainly. Why? Because you drink so much between them. May I offer you one? Thank you. You know I don't drink. A uh, cigarette, then. And you know I don't smoke. I suppose you'll despise me if I finish this? No. I should like you all the more if you didn't, that's all. Very well. For today, I'm a teetotaler. Goodbye, Faye. Angry, Arthur? Uh, no, uh, just defeated. New experience for you, isn't it? Uh, look. You didn't mean all those things you said to me just now, did you? I meant every one. I like you so much. You know, I've never kissed a woman's hand before. That's a new experience, too. What does it mean, Arthur? My complete and absolute respect. Goodbye. Your hat, my lord. Oh, thank you, Charles. Stand by the window, Charles. Let me know when he's gone. Yes, darling. Debussy, isn't it, darling? Yes. Very lovely. He's getting into his car now. Ask George and William to come in, Charles. They'll be here, darling. Don't worry. Come in, George. Oh, my blasted feet are murdering me. Sit down, George. You're jolly well right. I'll sit down. Oh, did you ring, madam? It's quite all right, William. Everyone's gone. Oh, this blasted collar's been choking me all day. Here, how much longer do we keep up this servant act, Charles? I'm clean wore out. You have to play that stuff, eh? Give us something lively, will you? What a pretty lot of pets you look like. Oh, thank you, darling. Well, I've got the invitation. Where? The Duchess of Ebley. I'm asked to stay as an honored guest. Good girl. Wonderful face. Yes, not too bad for the five and ten cent store girl from Minnesota. The Duchess pearls are worth at least 20,000 pounds. 20,000? This time next week, I'll be taking my ease on the deck of a boat pointed for Canada. <laughs> uh, England suits me. Follow the races and live like a lord. That's my motto. Twenty thousand quid cut four ways. When do you blow, Faye? Blow where? To the Duchess's. The invitation is for Friday weekend. But it doesn't mean I have to accept it. I haven't decided yet. What? I... Yeah, what do you mean, Faye? Yes, darling. What do you mean? I said I haven't decided, Charles. Look here, my girl. We pitched in every quid we got to rent this house, to buy you clothes, an ocean trip, while we even... Control yourself, William. Now, Faye, suppose you explain. You see, Charles, the idea of persuading perfectly charming people into inviting you into their house for the purpose of robbing them isn't pleasing me at all. You never talked like this before. I'd never met them before. If you're going to try any tricks, my girl, you won't find it very healthy. Quiet, please. I see her point of view. Oh, you do? I'll tell you what it is. She's got her eye on Kelton. The old cove's always hanging around. Oh. Well, suppose you fellows clear out. I'd like to have a quiet little chat with Faye alone. If it's a showdown, we'll be in on it. Leave her to Charles. He can handle her. Well, no half measures, mind. Yeah, tell her ladyship where she gets off. Well, Faye, if you want to chuck it, you can. Don't be absurd. I only wanted to make them mad. To see them exactly as they are. You know I'm going to see it through. You don't think I'd let you down, Charles? You've never let anyone down. That's the point. Very well, then. Faye? At times, you make me think. 
Without my influence, you never would have chosen this noble profession, and it's a precarious one, with the end usually at the beginning. Could it be I'm getting a conscience fade? What do you mean, Charles? What I say. You don't have to tell me you like these new friends of yours. I can see that for myself. <laughs> You're as bad as George. You think I'm chasing the elderly noble lord. I wasn't thinking of the elderly noble lord. I was thinking of a rather young one. You needn't. And you needn't worry about your pearls either. I'll get them for you, Charles. Friday weekend. In just a few moments, Mr. DeMille and our stars Norma Shearer, Walter Pigeon, and Adolf Marju will return in Act Two of The Last of Mrs. Cheney. You know, sometimes when the doorbell rings, it has a very exciting sound. And if you're a pretty young lady, you hurry to answer. Special delivery, miss. Thank you. Oh, it's from Bill. Dear Mary, I've got leave for the weekend, and I'm not taking any chances on finding you dated Saturday. How's for some dancing and stuff? Bill's got the right idea. He knows it's smart to date Mary up ahead of time. He knows girls with complexions that are fresh and smooth as a new-cut rose are pretty sure to be popular. Yes, there's something about soft, lovely skin that just seems to say romance. You want the kind of skin that wins, a smooth, romance complexion? So why not let Hollywood's famous beauty care, Lux Toilet Soap, help you have it? Screen stars depend on their daily active lather facials with this gentle soap. They say the lather's so rich and creamy it feels as though they were smoothing beauty in. Yet Lux Toilet Soap's active lather is thorough, too. It removes stale cosmetics, every trace of dust and dirt from the skin. Here's all you do to take a Lux Soap Beauty Facial. Pat the fine, rich lather lightly in. Rinse with warm water, then with cool. Then pat your face with a soft towel to dry. Now touch your skin. It feels exquisitely fresh. And it is. Just try this simple facial every day for 30 days. Discover for yourself what a wonderful beauty aid this Hollywood care can be. How soft and smooth Lux Toilet Soap helps you keep your skin. Get three cakes of this luxurious soap tomorrow. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of The Last of Mrs. Cheney, starring Norma Shearer as Mrs. Cheney, Walter Pigeon as Lothar Arthur Dilling, and Adolf Monju as Charles. <laughs> It's Sunday evening of the weekend party at the Duchess of Ebley's, and Faye has still not stolen the pearls. The party has now reached the parlor game stage, in which the guests squirm uncomfortably on the edge of their chairs, for the game is truth. Willie Winton has the floor, cross-examining his wife's cousin. But you must answer, John, and the truth, remember. Go on, John. Yes. Go on, oh, well, uh, go on. Uh, uh, what was the question, Willie? Well, I asked you where you got those onyx cufflinks you're wearing. Why, I, uh, I really don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one solution, of What's course. What's that, Maria? Why, your wife must have given them to him. Kitty, did you? Yes, Willie, for Christmas. I knew you wouldn't mind. Oh, no, of course not. Is the game over? Oh, no, Faye, we're just beginning. I believe it's our hostess' turn to make us all squirm now. Oh, do try and be bright, Elizabeth. Very well, my dears. I'll start with Willie. Willie, what is your private opinion of me as a hostess? Oh, I say. <laughs> <laughs> I consider the question answered. Kitty, dear. Yes? Kitty, how many cousins have you? Oh, heaps and heaps. I asked how many. I'm not good at figures. Quite a few, I imagine. Enough to keep Willie out of cuffling? Maria, I'm asking the question. Oh, of course, dear. Where's Kelton? Oh, there. Oh, I'm really not playing the game. I, I'm a sort of spectator, as it were. Kelton, answer me. Oh, well, all, all right. Kelton, are you really fool enough to think of marrying at your age? Why, well, say, look here. Yes or no? Well, now, that's really much too personal. The fourth Earl of Kelton is about to pay a forfeit. Well, I prefer to pay it rather than answer such a question in uh, a public. <laughs> <laughs> I shall think of something quite drastic. And now, Maria, I've always wanted to know your real age. What is it? Twenty-six, dear. What forfeit would you like me to pay? <laughs> <laughs> Go up to your mirror and sit in front of it for half an hour. Oh, yes. <laughs> and now, just one more. 
Arthur, dear. Ready, Aunt Elizabeth. Arthur, is it true as I've heard that you're in love, really in love? Hopelessly, desperately, and finally. With whom? Uh... Like Kelton, I refuse to make an answer which is already obvious to everybody. <laughs> I think you'd all better pay a forfeit. I suggest for a change we retire early and stop boring each other. <laughs> Good night, dear. Good night, Kitty. Well, it looks as if I get off scot free. Not quite, Fay. When Arthur proposes to you, will you accept him? <laughs> but he hasn't proposed, and I really haven't thought about it. Nonsense. You like him, don't you? Everybody does. Oh, Arthur has his good points, you know. He's charming. I can't stand sentiment, but I really like you. And it isn't every woman I'd urge to enter the family. That's the sweetest thing one woman could ever say to another. Thank you. I really should go in, Lord Kelton. You're all supposed to retire early, you know. Oh, do you, uh, do you find me dull? Oh, not at all, Lord Kelton. Oh, Francis, please. Francis. Uh, Faye, uh, I must speak to you. Yes? Uh, Faye, uh, I've got a townhouse in London, a country seat in Kent, a shooting box in Scotland, 50,000 acres. Uh, am, I, am I getting too intimate? Not too intimate. Well, uh, what I mean is, it, oh, it's awfully difficult for me to go on, you know. Maybe you'd better not try any more tonight. Well, I feel like a coward. You see, uh, the thing I'm trying to say to you should be so simple. <laughs> I've written it on paper a dozen times. Uh, Tore it up, naturally. Naturally. Mrs. Cheney, ma'am, is that you? Yes. You're wanted on the phone, ma'am. London is calling. London? Excuse me, ma'am. You can take it in your room if you wish. Thank you. Don't hurry. It's a fake. What? Your call from London. A fake. I wanted to talk to you. You mean no one wants me? No one. Except me, Faye. Oh. And I want you terribly. Really, Arthur? I'm in no mood No, no, no. Don't it. misunderstand me. I love you, Faye. Will you marry me? Please, Arthur. I'm, I'm going to my room. You didn't accept Kelton, did you? What makes you think he asked me? Did you refuse him? No. You will. Can't we discuss this some other time? I'm rather tired, Arthur. You're going to marry me, Faye. The Bishop of Broadminster is an old friend of mine, less than a couple of miles from here. I've already telephoned him to expect us the first thing in the morning. You're terribly sure of yourself. On the contrary, I'm frightened to death. I don't believe it. It's true. Feel my hand. Why, you're, you're trembling. You won't disappoint the Bishop, will you? You're very sweet. I love you, Faye. You do, don't you? When I'm not with you, I, I walk around in a, well around in a little private fog of my own. I cut my friends and greet my enemies. I hear music in the streets and see flowers growing in the gutter. I'm responsive to beggars and comb my hair continually. In fact, let's face it, I've got it worse than any of heaven's creatures ever had it before. Good night, Arthur. Good night, Faith. Don't bother to switch on the lights, darling. Oh, is that you? Surprise, dear. Are you mad coming here? How did you get in my room? I climbed the ivy. I'm very athletic. Charles, this isn't safe. Certainly not. That's why I'm enjoying it. Why didn't you wire me? I had nothing to say. She got the pearls here in the house? Yes. You're sure? Yes, I tell you. You know where they're located? They're in her room. A wall safe. What about the combination? Well, I'd hate to have to blow it. It's crude. You won't have to blow it. I know the combination. What have you been waiting for? Hey, what's the trouble? You're not going through, is that it? I'm a Welsher. An awful Welsher, Charles. Oh, child. no, you're not. You won't back out. Not now. It's too late. I won't do it. I won't. Now, one moment, Faye. A few days ago, I gave you your chance. The cage was wide open. I could have handled the others then. We can't fool them now. We're both in up to our necks, and it's too risky not to go through with it. Are the plans still the same? The same. I'd be waiting in the garden. At two o'clock, you're to get the pearls from the safe and bring them here. When you turn your light on and off twice... You drop the pearls beneath the window. Yes. At two o'clock. Two o'clock. Hello up there. I say, Faye. Who is it? Arthur. Come down into the garden. Oh, don't be a fool, Arthur. It's one o'clock. I know it. Would you like me to sing to you? Anything but that. 
You may not know it, but I have a rather pleasing baritone voice. I'm sure you have, but I'm, I'm just going to bed. Oh, how absurd. It's beautiful out here. Why don't you come on down? <laughs> Do you suggest I jump? No, uh, climb down the ivy. Apparently somebody tried to climb up. Look, it's uh, all torn away from the wall. Really? Who do you suppose it was? Kelton? Perhaps. You'd better leave before someone thinks it's you. Good night. I say, Faye, wait. Ah, there. What the... Oh, my... I'm sorry, my lord. Well, Charles. Yes, my lord. Good evening, Lord Dilling. Good evening. Aren't you a long way from home, Charles? Yes, my lord. What brings you to Ebley so late? Uh, the cablegram, my lord. For Mrs. Cheney. It arrived at 8 o'clock. There was a train at 9.15, and thinking it might be important, I took the liberty of... Uh... I see. Your devotion to duty and Mrs. Cheney is really quite touching. Oh, thank you, sir. Most butlers would have telephoned. Well, that occurred to me, my lord, uh, but it would have necessitated my opening the cablegram and reading it to Mrs. Cheney. Of course, that would be unthinkable. You delivered it in person? Mrs. Cheney had retired. I gave it to the housekeeper. Good night, my lord. Just a moment. We can put you up up here for the night. And you can catch a train in the morning. Well, you're very kind, sir, but, but there's a local leading at 155, and I have many things to attend to in the morning. Then at least we can do is have you driven to the station. Well, your lordship's thoughtfulness is most considerate, but I shall enjoy the exercise. It's six miles to the station, Charles. Is it really? Well, it, it seemed less when I walked here. Good night, my lord, and thank you. It's very funny, Charles, but every time I see you, I have a definite feeling we've met somewhere before. You even look more familiar with a hat on. Oh, I beg your pardon, my lord. How careless of me. I should have taken it off immediately. Good night, my lord. Good night. Right. Four left. Thirty-three right. Hello. Shall I turn on the light for you? That's better, isn't it? Go ahead. Don't let me disturb you. I won't need the light, thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, you already have the pearls, haven't you? May I see them? Thank you. Beautiful, aren't they? You're uh, surprised to see me? I persuaded the Duchess to change rooms with me for the night. Did you tell her why? No, she'll uh, probably ask me in the morning. Oh, what will you say? I'm not sure. I suppose Charles was going to pick the pearls up? That's it. And all this business, Kelton and me, all part of the game? Certainly. I see. The job in hand, then, was merely the pearls. Exactly. For Charles and you. For Charles and me. Ah. Cigarette? Thank you. Oh, I just remembered. I thought you didn't smoke. You also thought I was honest. Very true. By the way, what made you suspicious? I suddenly recognize your but. Yes, uh, what is Charles to you, by the way? My butler. I mean, in his spare time. A friend. How did you recognize him? I wasn't sure until I saw him with his hat on. Then I remembered three years ago I was in Biarritz when he was nearly caught. I gave him a sporting chance. Sent them running in the wrong direction. You see, I really saved him for you. You couldn't see your way to making a habit of it. Mm, I've always had a horror of doing the same thing twice. What terribly nice cigarettes. Oh, I'll send you some. That's sweet of you. I'll give you my address tomorrow when I know it. Are you thinking of changing your present one? I have an idea you'll make it difficult for me to keep it. You've really made such fools of all of us, it seems a pity not to allow you to complete it. It has been quite amusing. Splendid, and we'll keep it that way. Amusing. Suppose we sit down comfortably and discuss, uh, shall we say, my price. What are you doing? Locking the door. I see. So we revert to type. We do indeed. If I agree to stay here, you say nothing? Nothing. And if I don't? Oh, come. Now, why be squeamish? Let's play the little farce to the end. As crooks go... Do you know the difference between you and Charles? No. Well, Charles robs with a charm of manner, and you rob with violence. Very neat. If I refuse to stay here, what would you do? You can't refuse me. I wonder if it would interest you to know that as a woman who has done nearly everything there is to do in this world, this is one of the things that I have never done. Why do you smile? I thought we had done with posing. You don't believe me? What a fool you'd think me if I did. But it happens to be true. <laughs> I wonder how I can prove it to you. You couldn't. It's too difficult. I can quite understand you're not believing me. And I'm sorry, because you happen to be the one person in the world I would like to have believe me. But as you don't, I will do the next best thing. And what does that mean? That means if you don't believe that I have never done this before, you will at all events know that I am not going to do it now. Just as you like. Ring that night bell and when they come, tell the Duchess who I am. Or unlock that door and let me go. You're hardly in a position to dictate terms. 
That night bell is really an alarm, you know, a police alarm. You can't keep me here against my will. I intend to. Do you? Well, I prefer that they should know what is true about me. Then you should believe what isn't. Open that door or I'll ring the bell myself. Are you trying to persuade me that you'd really do it? Unless you open the door. Why the bluff, Faye, dear? It's meaningless. And how? You're much too sensible to take the risk of doing five years in Holloway. Five years in jail wouldn't be nearly as long as the next five hours with you. Get away from that bell. Get... Do you realize what you've done? Perfectly. They'll come rushing into this room, the whole crowd of them. I know it. Then why, why did you do it? To give you an opportunity to tell them the truth about you me. little fool. I say, what's wrong in there? Willie, what is it? You'd better let them in. What's the matter? Open the door, open the door. Well, Arthur? I say, Arthur! I'm coming just a moment. Arthur, is anything the matter? Well, look here, it's Mrs. Cheney. Hey, my dear, just what is all this? Lord Dilling has something to tell you. Well, Arthur, what is it? Perhaps you'd prefer that I tell them. Speak up, Arthur, what is all this about? Well, I uh, persuaded Mrs. Cheney to come into this room by false pretenses. In the presence of you all, I humbly tell Mrs. Cheney I've behaved like a cat. A cat? <laughs> You're the lowest thing I've ever known. I don't know what to say to you, Arthur. I suppose because she had sense enough to reject you, you decided she wasn't a lady. I believe that sums it up. Dylan, I for one will, and I hope every decent person in this world will cut you. Everybody should, except the insurance company. They should love him. What do you mean? Lord Dilling, will you give the Duchess her pearls, please? My pearls? What is the meaning of this? It means I came here to... Well... I like them as much as you do. What? Oh, but I see. You mean you, you, you were going to... Yes, I tried to steal them. Yes, but there must be some mistake. None. Well, I'm not feeling very well. I, I think I'll retire. I believe I will too. I give you my word, Your Grace, that I won't try to escape. I invited you into my home. I thought you were... Oh, it's hard to believe. I've never been wrong about a person before. Console yourself. You weren't so wrong. You thought I was a respectable woman with the soul of an adventuress, whereas I'm really an adventuress with the soul of a respectable woman. Wait, please. Just for the record, you didn't fool me for a moment. There's no such place as Minnesota, is there? No. I made it up. Good night. <laughs> Pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille presents Norma Shearer, Walter Pidgeon, and Adolph Marju in Act Three of The Last of Mrs. Cheney. And now, quiet, please. A conspiracy is going on in a little house on Vine Street. Hurry up, kids. Light the candles before she gets downstairs. She's coming. All together now. Happy, Happy birthday! birthday. Happy, Happy birthday! birthday. Happy, Happy birthday! Happy birthday. Happy Happy birthday. birthday. Love. Surprise! Surprise! And now, darling, here's to the most wonderful wife in the world and the prettiest. Well, there's a compliment to make any woman happy. A compliment deserved by all those busy wives and mothers who try always to look their best for those who love them, who try to keep the charm of fresh, youthful skin, the kind of skin that makes people say, no matter what a woman's age, lovely, isn't she? Now, here's what a famous screen star, Irene Dunn, says. There's always romance in soft, smooth skin. I never neglect my daily care with Lux Toilet Soap. Here in Hollywood, we've used this gentle soap for years. Yes, Lux Toilet Soap is as fine, as luxurious a soap as you can buy. When you unwrap a cake, notice how satin smooth it is to the touch. Then discover what wonderful rich lather it gives. Lather that's thorough, but very gentle, too. No wonder this exquisite white soap is the choice of nine out of ten famous screen stars, of lovely women everywhere. Use Lux Toilet Soap regularly. Let it help you win new loveliness. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. The curtain rises on the third act of The Last of Mrs. Cheney, starring Norma Shearer, Walter Pigeon, and Adolf Manjou. Now, 
The house has quieted down for a few hours of restless slumber. But Faye, alone in her room, walks the floor nervously. Suddenly, the door is opened, and Arthur slips in silently. Have you been set to guard me? If so, you can take up your position outside the door. We've got to act quickly. I have a car at the gate, and the back door is clear. Are you ready? For what? I intend to get you out of this. And what will the price be this time? Now, you're not going to be a fool again. Not in the least. Nor have I the remotest intention of running away. Least of all with you. There's someone at that window. Charles, I imagine. Come in, Charles. What's the matter? I've been waiting since I can't... Charles, we have company. Oh, good evening, my lord. Evening, Charles. It's no good, Charles. Lord Dilling knows. I've bungled the whole job. I see. I'm sorry. Well, it's all in the luck of the game. And his lordship? He caught me quite cleverly. They've put in a call for Scotland Yard. Inspector Witherspoon will be here in the morning. Hmm, Witherspoon. Know him, Charles? Slightly. Lord Dilling, um, I presume you've gathered my position in this matter. Quite. But I'm afraid I don't quite follow yours. All I want is for Mrs. Cheney to get out of here right away. Oh, very generous, if I may say so. But if you feel like that, why capture the lady? Charles, have you never heard of anglers who catch little fish and then fling them back again? Faye, dear, you're being unsociable. If his lordship wishes you to escape, then Charles, perhaps... you've got to get out of here as soon as you can. I intend to remain for reasons of my own. What reason? Well, that's my business. Then I'll remain too. Don't you understand? Where could I go? It would only be a question of hours or days at the most. I'm not going through life always hunted. Well, it's really not bad when you get used to it. <laughs> not for me, thank you. So be it then. We remain. <laughs> She deserves. Pass the toast, Willie. Is she still in her room? Ames reports she'll be down for breakfast at nine. The cheek of her. How many years will she get, Willa? Oh, I should think that'll depend on the age of the judge. Oh, good morning. Good morning, Kelton. Good, good morning. morning. Good morning. I heard what you said. Uh, you're not really going to arrest her, are you? Certainly we are. The inspector's on his way now. Have some breakfast? When I think of her, the most modest, the most simple. No, I can't believe it. Uh, where are the eggs? Hilton, are you persisting in your doddering fancy for this adventure? Well, I thought we could uh, send her away, uh, perhaps to America. You didn't really propose to her, did you? Of course he did. She's just the type that cautious rich men wait 50 years for. Oh, uh, look here. We've got to stop it. Quite right, Kelton. But I think you'd better tell why. Good morning, everybody. What do you mean, Arthur? Well, it seems Kelton has proposed to Mrs. Cheney. I knew it. Oh, but that's not all. He did it in writing. What? Sweet mess. He didn't. Oh, Kelton, you didn't. I, uh, yes, I did. Oh. The moving picture rights to it alone are worth 10,000 pounds. Uh, just coffee, please. Kelton, when did you write this letter? Uh, last night. Uh, we'd been walking in the garden and, well, uh, oh, dear, well, uh, later on I slipped it under her door. Oh, Kelton, you, you poor fool. Arthur. Did she show you the letter? Oh, yes. Much worse than being a thief. Well, I must defend her. She omitted the emotional passages. Arthur, go back there at once and get that letter. It's her own property. The fact that she has tried to appropriate ours does not permit us to retaliate. Don't be silly. The police know how to do these things. Right. In that case, the letter would be read in court. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. I'm afraid you have to buy the letter, Kelton. <laughs> Cost you plenty, too, old man. Oh, you think it's funny, do you? <laughs> well, you'll change your minds when you know what's in that letter... I kept a copy of it, my first draft, and every one of you is in it. Every one of us? What do you mean? I mean you're all in it. You mean you, you dared to mention our names in a letter that might become public? What have you said about us? In that letter, I wrote my private opinion of you all. It seemed to me the proper thing to do. The rattle of skeletons falling out of closets will be deafening. Yes. I conceived it to be a duty to my future wife to define the people she should or should not know as the case might be. Was I a not? Definitely. Am I? All of you. Including you, my dear aunt. For instance, it may not be true that Willie got kicked out of the Grenadier Guards. What? Uh, I won't hear a word of it. Sit down, Kitty. I think we'd all better know the worst. What have you said about my wife? Well, I said that it was evident to me that she prefers always to be with one of her many cousins rather than her husband. And though I could understand it, I could not condone it. That's all I said. That's all you said? That's all he said? Uh, pass the letter to Maria. Top paragraph on third page. Uh, interesting, Maria, and uh, probably very true, eh? Good 
Good heavens. Oh, no, no, no. Don't upset <laughs> yourself. Let myself. You beast. You can't. No, no, but I only oh, don't said... Don't repeat it. Oh, you, Gently, you. Maria, gently. It's not kind to me either. Auntie, dear, suppose you look it over. Right uh, there, I believe. The history of all your mistakes in a nutshell. Hmm. So, Kelton, you've raked that up, have you? Seen such fun at the time, but I must say it looks awful in black and white. Well, I, I, I tried to whitewash you quite a bit. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, if this letter is placed as evidence at the Old Bailey, Mrs. Cheney and Charles will be condemned as criminals, but the rest of us will envy them the comparative purity of their reputation. Oh, what are we going to do with this woman? Let us be accurate. What is this woman going to do with us? Well, my view is this. Uh, we should not for a moment let her think the letter is important. Uh, we should offer her her passage back to America, and in consideration of her returning the letter, uh, the matter is at an end. Otherwise, she goes to jail. I think it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Arthur, yeah. you handle this affair. That ass has made mess enough of things already. Good morning. Ah, Mrs. Cheney. <laughs> Good morning. Won't you take a chair? Thank you. And as Charles was born a gentleman, mayn't he sit too? Certainly. Charles. No, thanks. I prefer to stand. Very well. Uh, Mrs. Cheney, you have acknowledged frankly that in accepting the Duchess of Ebley's invitation to stay here, it was for the purpose of taking her pearl. Yes. We planned it for months. That is very frank. The penalty for such things is considerable. Very considerable. Yes. Charles and I think that with a charm of manner, we may get off for three years. Uh, Exactly. Now, we have no wish that this should happen to you. Lord Kelton feels very strongly that if you had once asked a woman to be your wife, it would be ungenerous to treat her so drastically. Thank you, Lord Kelton. Oh, uh, not at all. So, Lord Kelton has a proposition to make to you. Oh, yes? Uh, go on, Kelton. Uh, now, if you will accept your ticket and a small sum, uh, say a hundred pounds, in return for the letter I sent you, uh, we are prepared to consider the matter closed. Oh, is it my turn now? If you will be so kind, Mrs. Cheney. I am very sorry that I cannot accept Lord Kelton's kind offer. But Charles and I have decided we must go to jail. Is that right, Charles? Quite right. No, but I don't understand. Mrs. Cheney. What are you talking about? Look here, this is nonsense, Mrs. Cheney. <laughs> you never succeeded in getting the pearl. Precisely. We failed. And that is why we should go to jail. If we had got them, we should have succeeded. A crime for which no one ever goes to jail. You put it charmingly, Faye, dear. My dear young woman, you don't understand us. We don't want you to go to jail. Then equally, Duchess, you don't understand us. We do. But good heavens, woman, you can't be serious. Isn't it sad, Charles? They don't understand us. Tragic. It makes me blush for them. Charles and I, in our humble way, have tried to live up to the highest tradition of our profession. And that tradition is never to be found out. But if you are... I say, if you are, be prepared to pay the price. I beg your pardon, Your Grace. Yes? The police inspector is here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him to wait. Yes, madam. You see, Mrs. Cheney, we are terribly serious. It is your duty to be, your, my dear Duchess. You are very stupid not to accept a good offer instead of being taken away by that horrid policeman. Not at all. He may be charming. Are you ready, Charles? Almost eager. As I shall never see any of you again... I want you to know how much I've enjoyed knowing you all and how sorry I am to lose such nice friends. Goodbye, Lord Kelton. It was sweet of you to ask me to be your wife. Ready, Charles? Oh, uh, Mrs. Cheney, now, wait. Uh, yes? Uh, well, uh, we are... Uh, I think that Lord Kelton, with his customary munificence, desires to make you a further offer. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I am prepared to pay 500 pounds for the return of that letter. Which I call very generous. I prize the letter so much... But I don't think I would part with it for any money you could offer me. What about a thousand? But this is amazing. Oh, come, come, young woman. What is your usual charge for the return of letters? There never have been any letters. But if there had been, my charge would have depended entirely on the position and the manners of the people mentioned in them. And as I don't propose to sit here and be insulted, I will, with your permission, say goodbye. You are perfectly right, Faye, darling. And if I had known they were the type of people they are, I would never have allowed you to come and stop with them. Come along, dear. No, 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 please. Uh, I agree. Uh, Maria was very, very hasty, and I'm sorry. Now, please sit down. When she has apologized, I will. Maria, say at once that you are sorry. Oh, heaven, give me strength. I'm sorry. Granted. Sit down, Mrs. Cheney. Now, uh, where were we? Well, uh, we had reached the point where a thousand pounds was bid for the letter. 
Which was refused. Uh, uh, Mrs. Cheney, uh, what will you take for it? What do you think, Charles? Well, I offer 5,000. Uh, you be quiet. I'll be nothing of the sort. My money is as good as yours. Mrs. Cheney, will you please answer my question? If I sell the letter, I will do so not in the sense of blackmail, but more in the spirit of breach of promise for 10,000 pounds. Good heavens, Faye. It's giving it away. That's what it is. 10,000? No, no, I, I refuse. I'm so glad, because I'd so much rather keep the letter. Kelton, you have no alternative but to pay. And I have no sympathy for you. But Mrs. Cheney, surely the... 10,000 pounds, Lord Oh, Kelton. it's terrible, terrible. Oh, terrible be blowed. I'll give you 11 for it. No, 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 no. I, I'll pay. I, I, I'll write you out a check. Thank you, Lord Kelton. 10,000. What do you charge for a course of 12 lessons, Charles? Well, I never charge, my lady. I'm a man who just loves his work. Would you like me to write that check for you, Kelton? Oh, thank you. I, I'm quite capable. 10,000 pounds. Oh, here you are. And now, uh, the letter, please, Mrs. Cheney. Oh, yes, the letter. Here it is, Lord Kelton. I hope you will find all the pieces. What? She's torn it up. I don't understand. But, 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 Mrs. Cheney, do you mean to say that you uh, 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 destroyed the letter? Yes, I tore it up. Just like I'll tear your check, Lord Kelton. Hey, don't. Hey. Ten thousand pounds gone down the drain. And I've tried so hard to make her a crook. Mrs. Cheney, why did you tear that check? I don't know. Even a thief may have a sense of decency. You're a grand woman, Faye. A grand woman. Mrs. Cheney, uh, there is one question I would like to ask. Uh, why are you a thief? Well, I... I wanted to improve my social position. You see, I was a shop girl. In a ten-cent store? Where Charles found me. I wanted to share the beautiful things in life. And I am not a modern woman. Well, if one is not a modern woman and one has no money, there are only two ways of getting it. Marry it or steal it. I'm afraid I prefer stealing it. The best pupil I ever had. By God, I sympathize with her. Uh, Mrs. Cheney, do you know what I'll do? I'll set you up in a little mood dish shop, all your own, in uh, uh, appreciation. Sort of a memorial, eh, Kelton? Lord Kelton, you're very kind. It's divine of him. I'll be one of your customers. I, too. Well, I must go. Oh, Charles, if you ever need a pupil, you'll find me in the telephone book. Well, uh, I shall never want a pupil, my lady, but I'm glad to know I'll find you in the telephone book. Uh. If you'll uh, call me in town, Mrs. Cheney, we'll make all the necessary arrangements for your little business. Mrs. Cheney has changed her mind, Kelton. She doesn't need any bribe for doing something that came quite spontaneously. Lord Dilling is right, but thank you all the same. Oh, well, uh, just as you say, uh, but I should be very glad to help you in any way I can. Uh, oh, Charles, uh, I wonder if an introduction to the president of a bank would be of service. Well, um, uh, thank you, Lord Kelton. Oh, uh, uh, well, 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 we'll see you. Uh, goodbye. I'll goodbye. see you off, Kelton. Bye, all. We're Bye. coming, Bye. too. Bye. Goodbye, Mrs. Cheney. Goodbye. 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 Nice people, aren't they, Charles? Most of us are, Faye. What made you take up this job, Charles? With your brains, it seems a pity you haven't used them to better purposes. One of His Majesty's judges may use those exact words one of these days. I found out at an early age what most men find out in an old one. Life is very dull, my lord. I agree. So I decided to take it into my two hands. I began it as a blackmailer, but that was too easy. I went for higher and greater things. Oh, um, will you take this, uh, Lord Dilling? What is it? I hate parting with it, because being the first I ever took, I treasure it. This is your gold watch I stole from you on Derby Day five years ago. <laughs> my dear Charles, I've always wanted to meet the man who took it. And I hope you will do me a favor. Keep it. May I? I'd like you to. That is very nice of you. I will. So long, Dilling. So long, Charles. Goodbye, Faye. What do you mean, goodbye? What it means is, I have decided to take a little trip round the world. You're not going to leave me, do you understand? I am, and now. But I don't want you to. I must. Why? Whenever you come into a person's life, come into it instantaneously. When you go out of it, go out of it even quicker. Charles, I'm going to cry. Don't do that, my sweet. But I would be terribly sorry if you didn't want to. Are you going around the world for pleasure, Charles? Uh, mixed with business, my lord. Faye, I'm going to ask you a question. But you needn't answer it if you don't want to. I'll answer it with pleasure. If you hadn't come into my room last night, I would have taken the pearls. You mean that? Yes. 
But no one in the world could have been so glad to see you in that bedroom as I was last night. It's an extraordinary thing. But the most difficult question in the world to ask a woman is a nice one. What sort of a question were you going to ask me? You remember my mentioning a certain bishop who lives close by? Very distinctly, Arthur. While you were changing your clothes this morning, I jumped into the car and had a bite of breakfast with him. How surprised he must have been to see you at that hour. (laughs) Oh, he's a delightful old soul. So sympathetic. I told him of a little trouble I was in. He said, bring her here at 11 and I'll fix it up for you. What was he to fix? That I could have breakfast with you every morning. But I never eat any. I told him there was a possibility of that. Did you tell him anything else? Mm Mm-hmm. That I love you. Did you tell him... Anything about me? Everything. He said, get her. You'll never get another like her. He sounds like a darling. I'd like to meet him. He asks us to be punctual. So he thinks I'll come. He's more certain of it than I am. He says you love me. I wonder what makes him think that. Well, he has sort of an idea you'd never have rung that bell last night if you didn't. I'm sure I shall like him. Do you think he'll like me? He'll adore you. Do you? Terribly. What is more important? Do you? Much more terribly. I only wish I hadn't... You can't talk and kiss me at the same time. There. That will do it. What's that? That's the last of Mrs. Cheney. And this... What's that? The beginning of Lady Dilling. That's the last of Mrs. Cheney. But your applause for tonight's performance calls our stars back to the footlights. And here are Norma Shearer, Walter Pigeon, and Adolf Monjou. Thank you, Mr. Mill. It's a great pleasure to be here for the first time. You've really made me feel so much at home. Well, now that we've finally broken the ice, Norma, I, I hope you'll make it a habit. Well, uh, that's a very nice habit to get, Norma. <laughs> CB is an excellent host. <laughs> Although I came uh, very close to losing my welcome here once, all. <laughs> yeah, well, Walter can't forget that. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> well, I'd been talking to C.P. before rehearsal one day, and I thought he'd walked away. So I turned to somebody else and said, The old boy certainly looks great, doesn't he? But the old boy was standing right behind me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought it was a great compliment. I hadn't been called a boy in 40 years. <laughs> well, you see, that's one way to his heart, Norma. I'll bet I can think of another, Adolf. In two words, Lux Soap. You know, I'm rather a stranger in this theater, Mr. DeMille, but not to Lux Soap. I've used it for years, so I know what a fine complexion care it really is. For further comment on Lux Soap, I refer our audience to to a close-up of Norma Shearer on the screen or off. Um, What about next week, C.B.? Have you picked a play yet? Yes, Adam. A play with the true spirit of America in it. The RKO motion picture drama, A Man to Remember. And our stars will be Lionel Barrymore, Anita Louise, and Glenn Ford. A Man to Remember is the story of a country doctor, a story of heroism and courage to inspire the nation in these or any other times. So next Monday night is a night to remember. Lionel Barrymore, Anita Louise, and Glenn Ford in A Man to Remember. I know we'll all enjoy that, Mr. DeMille. Good night. Good night, night, C.B. Good night. Good night. Players like you make good plays better. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, some very pleasant news has come to us from the editors of Movie Radio Guide. For the seventh consecutive year, the Lux Radio Theater has been selected as radio's leading dramatic program by the readers of Movie Radio Guide in its annual Star of Stars poll. This is a high honor. We are grateful to all who participated and to you, our audience, who helped us win it. To those of our Canadian audience who are tonight gathered at the Canadian premiere of Reap the Wild Wind in Alberta, Canada, in Calgary, my sincere greetings, and I'm sorry I can't be there. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Lionel Barrymore, Anita Louise, and Glenn Ford 
in a man to remember. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Ed O'Fonsi is currently starring in the 20th Century Fox picture, Roxy Hart. Heard in tonight's play were Frederick Warlock as Lord Kelton, Keith Hitchcock as Willie, Winifred Harris as the Duchess, Jill Esmond as Kitty, Claire Videra as Maria, and John Abbott, Eric Snowden, Pax Walker, Charles Seal, and Anne James. Tune in next Monday night to hear Lionel Barrymore, Anita Louise, and Glenn Ford in A Man to Remember. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Roy. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome to the Victory Kitchen, the podcast all about American food rationing during World War II. I'm your host, Sarah Creviston Lee, author, historian, and vintage foodie. I'll be exploring the logistics of food rationing, featuring wartime cookbooks and recipes, and highlighting real home front experiences. We're going to be learning exactly what our grandmothers had to do to get their food to fight for victory. Hi, welcome back to another episode of The Victory Kitchen. Today is episode number five, and we're going to be talking all about meat rationing. Meat rationing is a multifaceted topic. We could talk about spam, we could talk about meatless aspects of wartime like Meatless Mondays, but I'm going to be saving those topics for their own episodes. Today, I'll just be focusing on where the meat went, what exactly was rationed, and how the government got Americans to eat quote-unquote variety meats. Later on, I'll be talking about our featured cookbook, 120 Wartime Meat Recipes. And then finally, we've got our featured home front story for today. Before we dive into today's episode, I just wanted to take a second to talk about current events. Um, how are things for you right now? Um, in my neck of the woods here in North Central Maryland, some stores have um, been having things back in stock. One large grocery store near me has removed milk from the limit of two. They even had ground beef and chicken back in stock along with oodles of eggs and butter. I've even glimpsed toilet paper a time or two. It might have been the time of day I went. Usually at the end of the day, there's none to be had. So anyway, um, I hope things are getting better. Right now, they, our governor has just placed a ban on people leaving their homes um, starting tonight at 8. So this is Monday, uh, March 30th. And, uh, and you can just leave for essential stuff like medical and food. So yeah, um, things are progressing. But I just wanted to give a huge shout out to all the employees of grocery stores and restaurants that keep going into work so that our communities can be fed during this crisis. All right, so diving into the stuff we have to talk about today. You know, several times in my wartime rationing journey, I've questioned myself. Like one time, I looked down at the beef liver frying in my cast iron pan, and it was stinking up my kitchen, and I thought, wow, what the heck am I doing? How did I get here? And then I remember my love for these ration recipes and how just sometimes you have to take a little risk to go somewhere great. I have had some pretty interesting adventures with um, wartime rationing and meat recipes. So um, this is, uh, I have mixed feelings about the topic. But uh, in the 1940s, Americans really loved their meat. So when meat rationing was instituted, it was... It was a hardship, I think, for a lot of Americans to have to switch their thinking, switch their cooking habits, and what was available. But first of all, we need to figure out where did all the meat go? Well, first of all, I came across in a newspaper article talking about how in July of 1943, the military requirements were 45% of the available butchered meat. And that's before it ever reached civilian markets. They also required the best cuts. So the military received all the best cuts of meat and 45% of 
what was available in the market. So that's that's a lot. And I think that right there, that gives a good idea of um, why meat, th- why there was a shortage of meat and why what was left was so expensive. Now, keep in mind this 45% that the military required, it was just a snapshot in time. This was just July 1943 and the military's needs then. These needs did fluctuate during the war. So that freed up a lot of meat for the civilians now and then. And depending also on how good the pork harvest was or the beef harvest was, that also affected how much meat was available in the marketplace after the military took their required meat needs. So the military used their meat to feed the troops, and that included the meat that went into K rations for soldiers out in the field. And then it also fed injured soldiers. Some of the meat also went to feed our allies. And then the rest was, you know, for civilians. I should also mention here for restaurants as well. March 29th, 1943 marked the beginning of meat rationing, along with fats, cheeses, and processed foods, canned foods. What's really interesting that I found in these newspaper articles is the week before rationing started, there was a run on stores and the meat was cleaned out. It's like butcher shops and there's just all the meat was gone because shoppers made a rush to buy as much meat as they could before rationing started. Um, this kind of sounds familiar, don't you think? <laughs> Um, anyway, so there's that. So there's that, that run on the grocery stores for meat. And so when rationing began March 29th, the same thing happened. So any meat that was in the stores again was cleaned out. So housewives were taking their entire points that was available to them for the first week or two and spending all their points on meat. This was a problem because their red points not only purchased meat, but it could also purchase cheeses and fats like butter or margarine or shortening. So by using all of their red points for the meat, then they were left with no points to buy the other things they might need like butter or cheese. There was such a concern about how much meat was being purchased that the there were health statements put out saying, you know, your refrigerator can't keep fresh meat fresh for that long. Like you you can't (laughs) store that much fresh meat. So be very careful about it going bad. And there there was just a lot of confusion, not just um, about you know how much meat they should be buying all at once or whatever. But there was also confusion about how the ration stamps worked. A simple way of explaining how the stamps worked is that there were stamps labeled A, B, C, D, and E, red stamps. That was the ration currency for the month of April, with a different letter becoming valid each week, but all stamps remaining valid until April 30th. But the confusion was so great about how this worked that people were coming into the butcher shop to get meat and they were tearing out too many A stamps. Some cases they were tearing out B and C stamps when only the A stamps were valid and the the butchers were taking them, also not understanding exactly how the system worked. And it was just a big mix up. So in the newspaper, they were saying, you know, if this is something that you did, you need to go back to your butcher and make it right. You need to get the correct stamps turned in and he'll give you the correct stamps back and just to sort out this huge mess. There was even this hilarious story of this woman came into the grocery store in the morning and she bought some cheese and some lard. They That particular store didn't have any meat. So she gave them the red stamps and then walked out. So they stopped her and said, excuse me, ma'am, you didn't pay for that. 
We also need to have money. And she got really mad. She said she didn't have to pay money for things when she gave stamps for them. And to prove it, she called in a cop to um, make them stop bothering her. <laughs> so, oh, just so much confusion. Um, but they, they eventually sorted it out. They got used to the system and grocers and butchers got used to the system. It just, it was a steep learning curve for a lot of people, which is to be expected, really. I mean, you know, it, it is a little bit complicated even now, like trying to explain it, trying to learn about it. It's, it's kind of, it can be headache inducing. (laughs) Another aspect that was confusing was that Before rationing started for the meats and everything else, there were estimates made of approximately how much meat, butter, lard, etc. that people would be allowed under the point rationing system. One article in the Atlanta Constitution dated March 30th, 1943, um, explained it really well. Um, They quote somebody saying, I thought we were supposed to get two pounds of meat per week per person. How can we get that and get any butter? And that was a typical question that people had. How much lard am I allowed each week? How much cheese? And this is confusing because like if we look at British rationing, they were given like a specific portion was guaranteed per person for a certain period of time of specific things. But it wasn't really the same way in American rationing. So the article goes on to explain quote, it should be explained that there are no set allotments per week for any of the newly rationed foods, but the purchase of such foods works very much in the same way as blue stamp rationing. You are allowed 16 points per week, and these points may be spent interchangeably for meat, butter, lard, cheese, canned fish, salad oil, etc. Close quote. So that makes it a little more sense when it's explained that way. They're just allowed 16 points red stamps and you can use those however you want. Just don't go spending them all in one place, I guess is one way to say it. And I found these articles all in the Atlanta Constitution, so a Georgia newspaper. There's There were just some really great articles in this particular newspaper. So, And I think this is a good example for what was probably happening all around the country was there was just that initial confusion, how things worked. Even though I think the newspapers did it a fairly good job of prepping people for how things were going to work. Even in magazines, like um, I I found a great article about meat rationing in Life magazine that explained about meats. So there was some preparation, but I think when any new system is introduced, there's just some confusion. Now we need to talk about what was rationed. I think this this gets confusing now. Like when we try to study it, when if you try to look online, it's very hard to pinpoint exactly what was rationed for Americans. According to this amazing article in the Birmingham News dated March 21st, 1943, it gives a rundown of all the things that will be rationed and things that will not be rationed. And I obtained special permission to post this picture on my blog of this full spread of this page in the newspaper because it contains the most fabulous pictures that I've ever seen in a newspaper and it has so much information about this rationing. When I found this, I thought, wow, I've hit the jackpot. I've got to share this with my listeners. So I really encourage you to go to my blog, victorykitchenpodcast.com after you listen to this and take a look because it's really something you shouldn't miss. All right, so according to this article, this is what was rationed. All fresh, frozen, smoked, or cured beef, veal, lamb, and pork. All meat or meat products in tin or glass containers. All dried meats. Quote-unquote variety meats, including tongues, brains, hearts, liver, sweetbreads, and kidneys. Bouillon cubes and beef extracts and similar concentrates. All dry, semi-dry, and fresh smoked and cooked sausage, including salami, pork sausage, baked loaves, wieners, scrapple, souse, I don't know if I'm saying that right, hopefully I am, um, head cheese, and others. And if you don't know what head cheese is, it's the little pieces of meat from uh, an animal's face uh, that's removed and congealed kind of with some gelatin, I think, in a loaf. 
All right, then suet, cod, and other fats, all fish, shellfish, and fish products in hermetically sealed containers. So all those meats and meat products were rationed. These are the things that were not rationed. Fresh, frozen, smoked, salt, and pickled fish. Fish in containers, not hermetically sealed. All poultry and game, whether frozen, fresh, or in tin or glasses. And then also I found another reference somewhere else that said mincemeat. So I think this is very important to point out. Chicken was not rationed for Americans. This is a huge confusion, I think, because in England, chicken was rationed and so were eggs. And there's a lot of information out there about that. And so when anyone searches like rationing, that usually comes up. So I just want to make it clear that for Americans, chicken was not rationed, neither was turkey or other game birds. Or fish for that matter, actually. Fish was rationed in England as well, but not in America. Another topic regarding meat rationing is about the farmers. The farmers, they sometimes sold directly from their farms, the meat that they butchered. So it wasn't always at a butcher shop that people would go to purchase their meat. But with the rationing um, of meat, things had to change for them. They were urged to economize their use of home-produced foods for their own consumption and to limit their store-bought foods strictly to those not produced at home. So a farmer whose wife makes her own butter, for instance, they're asked to not go to the store and purchase butter. And if they butcher hogs or some beef, they're asked to um, remove those stamps from their books equal in point value to any of the rationed foods, including meat produced at home. And then if a housewife buys her butter or meat from a nearby farmer, she must turn over the proper number of points, and then he must in turn surrender those points to the OPA. There was also made mention that farmers who were used to giving meat to family or friends or neighbors as gifts, that they had to stop that practice during the war. So no more country hams from grandpa's farm until after the war was over. I found this really interesting. I hadn't thought about that aspect, but gifting meat um, could be seen as unfair because of you have that resource and you know others are able to take advantage of that, but not everyone. So, um, so I found that very interesting, but farmers could still sell meat. They just had to make sure that proper ration points were exchanged for the weight and amount of meat that they were they were selling. Now, one aspect of meat rationing I had not taken into consideration was a government meat conspiracy. I know, that sounds really mysterious, doesn't it? Well, I guess if you think of it this way, how did they get Americans to incorporate organ meats into their menus? rather than their standard selections like steak, sausages, and bacon, or at least in addition to those, those things. I found this uh, online article in The Atlantic by Carrie Rahm, and they say that in 1940, at the behest of the Department of Defense, the National Research Council assembled a team of the country's leading social scientists to create the Committee on Food Habits. Its mission was twofold. First, they needed to launch an in-depth study of America's eating habits. Who in household decided what would be served? What made a meal a meal? What was the ideal balance of familiarity versus novelty? And second, once it understood the factors that influenced those answers, the committee needed to change them in ways that benefited the war effort. So the government needed to figure out a way to incorporate these meats that were usually considered in the general American consciousness to be waste meat, um, not useful to them, or they can they consider them like poor people food. So they needed to change that to make use of this resource that was high in nutrition and um, not as in demand and the military didn't need it. So it was a good asset. 
So in 1940, Margaret Mead, who was an anthropologist and a German-born psychologist by the name of Kurt Lewin, were tasked with studying Americans' eating habits. I found this paper written by Brian Wansink entitled Lost Food Acceptance Lessons from World War II. And he says that, quote, prior to 1942, the focus on changing eating habits had reflected a stimulus response model of propaganda and nutritional education. In contrast, Lewin and Mead believed we first needed to reduce consumption barriers before people could effectively be encouraged to change their eating habits. That is, before giving people nutritional or patriotic reasons why they should say yes to eating liver, it was important to first remove the reasons they would say no. Without removing barriers to consumption, promotional incentives would be wasted. Close quote. So Ms. Mead and Mr. Lewin studied Americans' eating habits. And while it was originally thought husbands controlled what food made it to the table due to their preferences... What they found in their studies was that it was the person doing the planning, shopping, and cooking, which usually meant the housewife, who determined what was put on the table to eat, despite the husband's preference. And this idea was confirmed after a national survey showed that husbands and children frequently ate what was prepared for them and only objected when the meals got too weird or different. So through this, they determined that their efforts to change eating habits should be aimed at the housewife, the one who selected, purchased, prepared, and served the food. Brian Wansink also said, quote, foods also become more of a social norm when they are aligned with the patriotic obligation to, quote, do one's part for the war effort. As such, they soon became foods that patriots ate, not necessarily foods that poor people ate. The war effort helped make organ meats more socially acceptable. Consuming organ meats was one way of showing support for the war effort on the home front. As a result, there was a suspension of grumbling, because to do so would be to minimize the greater sacrifices being made by others, close quote. So I find that really interesting, because, I mean, we all know about the patriotic aspect and the propaganda behind what foods to eat, because we see the posters. Uh, anytime you do an online search or go to museums, you see these amazing wartime propaganda posters about food. But what we maybe don't realize is the subconscious aspect, you know, where, where did they go from? I don't eat liver to, you know, liver is served once a week in our household. It didn't happen overnight and it didn't just magically happen or it just wasn't always there. It was something that had to be taught to the American people. And they did that during the war. So to help make that happen, they also had to provide housewives with ways in which to cook the organ meats that was familiar and appetizing. And they had to do it in incremental ways by encouraging housewives to just try organ meats for variety and to incorporate them into their meal planning now and then. Butchers and reporters for newspapers were encouraged to call organ meats quote unquote variety meats to help remove some of the stigma. It helped that variety meats were sold for less ration points than standard cuts of meat. And I've also found this term used extensively in my wartime cookbooks that I've collected. Most of the time, I think that is what they're referred to is variety meats. And if you think about it, the term variety meats just makes it sound like, wow, more variety. But when you say organ meats, there's an immediate like gut response. If you've never had them, or like I didn't grow up eating organ meat. So for me, it's like, oh, that sounds disgusting. Um, so there, you know, there is that difference in even just the term being used. So one example of this is in the January 1943 Life magazine that I talked about earlier that has a great article about meats. And in this particular case, variety meats. It says, Quote, for no good reason, most Americans wrinkle their noses at the idea of any of the functional organs of otherwise edible animals, yet tripe, kidneys, tongue, heart, liver, and the other variety meats shown on the following pages are not only rich in nutritive value, but when properly prepared are among the tastiest dishes known. Close quote. <laughs> so I have a copy of this magazine and... The pictures in there are fantastic. <laughs> there are many, many pictures of the different organ meats, and it shows 
the variety to which they can be applied to meals and dishes. And when I mentioned, when I posted about this on my Instagram account, I was really excited and happy that so many people are like, oh yeah, we eat that organ meat in my house, or oh yeah, tripe is great, this served this way. And um, even I have learned to uh, use chicken livers because of my ration cooking adventures. Um, and I think those are the ones that I would turn to the most if I had to because they're much milder than beef livers. They don't stink as much when you cook them. And you can incorporate them, like mix them in with other meats. Like I've mixed chicken livers in with uh, ground beef for meatloaf and served it to guests and they thought it was great. So I don't know if I remember telling them if I had put them in there or not. Yeah, so <laughs> anyway, but see, they didn't know. And it was great. I bet if any of my friends are listening to this right now, they're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm never eating at Sarah's house again. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a danger in the hobby, I guess, of ration cooking. So now we need to talk about, like after we've talked about all this meat stuff, we're going to talk about meat alternatives. And as tempting as it is to go into the meatless Mondays thing, that that really is... Like that can be a topic unto itself. So I am saving that for a different episode. So right now I'm just going to talk about meat alternatives. In the Health for Victory meal planning guide from April 1943, that is their featured article in here is about meat alternatives and delicious ways to use them in meals. And they have what they call first class proteins and second class proteins. So the, their first class proteins are fish, poultry, variety meats, there's that term again, milk and cheese, eggs. Their second class proteins include legumes, dried beans, peas, lentils, peanuts slash peanut butter, nuts, whole grains, the grain with nothing removed, which includes whole wheat, entire rye, old-fashioned cornmeal, natural brown rice, oatmeal, entire barley, gram flour, cracked wheat, buckwheat. And then in this really great magazine cookbook issue, they um, have hints on how to make a little meat go a long way. So in other words, how to stretch your meat ration. You can use your meat in a stew. You make a meatloaf mixed with cereal, bread, or cracker crumbs. I remember my mom doing this with oatmeal. She would add oatmeal to our meatloaf. So I thought that's how everybody made meatloaf, but apparently not. <laughs> um, meatballs served with veggies, meat patties combined with cereal, crumbs, or mashed potatoes. And I just tried this last night. I tried a ration recipe that was called potato burgers, and it was ground beef mixed with shredded potatoes and onions. And it was fantastic. It was so good. And it really stretched my meat that I had. They also suggest casserole dishes or meat pie, hearty soups with a meat stock base, stuffed with dressing such as stuffed beef, lamb, or veal hearts. So like stuffing a meat with stuffing. <laughs> um, in salads with potatoes, macaroni, or mixed vegetables. You could extend it with cereal. So you combine with cornmeal or oatmeal with hamburger, for example. Serve with baked beans, salt pork, frankfurter, sausage as an example. So less meat is needed to satisfy the appetite in that way. And then you could also make it into a hash combined with potatoes, onions, or other vegetables. Whew, there's lots of ways. And I'm sure as I've read off this list, you can think of so many dishes that you already make at home that practice these things that extend meat. I mean, there's so many ways to do it. And for those of you that are interested, I will post these um, images from this uh, Health for Victory Club meal planning guide that show these interesting dishes you can use to get your protein, even if you don't have beef. Yeah, check that out on my blog. And after the break, I will be sharing the featured cookbook for today, 120 Wartime Meat Recipes. I'll be right back. The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly, brought to you each Tuesday in America and by transcription and shortwave broadcast to our men in uniform overseas. Maker 
makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with songs by the King's Men and music by Billy Mills Orchestra. The show opens with a shine on your shoes. way to take care of the finish of your car, will you let me make a suggestion? There's a Johnson combination product called Carnu, spelled C-A-R-N-U, that both cleans and polishes in one application. If you'll try Carnu just once on your car, I know you'll be delighted with the results. Carnu saves time and work and money. It's a liquid polish. You rub it on, let it dry, and wipe it off. It gives your car back its original showroom shine, makes it sparkle with a minimum of work. Then, if you want to give added protection to the finish, save car washings, make cleaning still easier, you can add a coat of wax, either Johnson's Auto Wax or the regular household wax. Take better care of your car with Johnson's Car News. Sir, espionage has come to Wistful Vista. At least Fibber McGee thinks so. Every place he goes, there's a small, dark man with a semi-concealed camera taking pictures of this and that. And here at 79 Wistful Vista, discussing his suspicions, we find Fibber McGee and Molly. I'm telling you, Molly, the guy is a spy. Every place I go, there he is, snapping pictures. Click, click, click. All day long, with that little camera. Well, where, for instance? Outside the Elks Club, and down by the bridge, near the railroad station, the powerhouse, and every place. Well, I don't know, McGee. Somehow I can't think of the Elks Club as a military objective. <laughs> Though it might be classified as an ammunition dump. What you mean? <laughs> well, there's so much lead sitting around there. <laughs> But the bridge and the powerhouse and the railroad station, them are all military objections. For that matter, uh, wh <laughs> what were you doing around the railroad station and the powerhouse and the bridge? I was to all them places on business. What business? Well, I had to go to the station to mail an important letter. Wanted to get it off on the 142. Whom were you sending it to? The National College of Self-Improvement in harmonica playing. <laughs> You'll admit my harmonica plan could be improved. <laughs> I'll confess that without being tortured. <laughs> but uh, what were you doing at the car station? There was a bunch of linemen down there installing a new transformer. Yes? Yes. And I've always been fascinated the way them guys can climb up a telephone pole with them spurs of theirs. <laughs> One guy, a fellow named Joe, got a sliver in his leg and he Remind got... me to send flowers, dearie. <laughs> but uh, I still don't know what you were doing there. I was watching them, doggone it. The guy can't sit around the Elks playing rummy all day long, can he? And there was this guy with his little clamor. Click, click, click. All day long. <laughs> you know what first made me suspicious of him? What? Every time I'd look at him, he'd look away. Oh, my. Yeah. McGee, I love you, but don't get the idea that everybody who doesn't like to look at you for hours at a time is a foreign spy. <laughs> days, the whole country will wind up in a concentration camp. And just the same, there was something fishy about that guy. I think he's another Harry Matty. A what? A Harry Matty. You know, a, a spy. <laughs> Harry Matty was shot in the last war when they caught her trying to conceal... No, no. Huh? That was Matta Harry. <laughs> I can't be bothered with little details about... Come in. Oh, hi, La Trivia. Why, hello, Mr. Mayor. Good day, Mrs. McGee. Hello, McGee. Do I understand that you called my office this morning? I certainly did, Latrivia. They told me you were in a council meeting and couldn't be bothered. Couldn't be disturbed, I believe, she said. Well, what's the difference? You don't seem to realize, Latrivia, that we're working, that you're working for us. 
We pay you. You're just a public servant, and we're the public. When we want something, you ought to snap out of it. Huh? Don't talk like that to Mayor Latrivia. What'd you call him for, anyway? Yes, I'd like to know, too, McGee. Like most taxpayers, you seem to labor under the delusion that public officials should come running to wipe your little noses every time you sneeze. If Mrs. McGee will pardon my plain speaking. (laughs) (laughs) Mrs. McGee loves it. (laughs) Look, Latrivia, I wanted to report a suspicious-looking guy that's hanging around town. McGee, if we arrested every odd-looking man in this town, Wistful Vista would soon be known as the Deserted Village. It would be a ghost town. (laughs) Well, McGee thinks this man was a spy, Mr. Mayor. He is a spy. I'm convinced. He takes pictures, click, 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 all day long, of everything of importance in this town. He's been following me for two days now. He carries a camera under his coat. Does he look intelligent? No. He looks like he'd had nothing above his eyes but sinus trouble. <laughs> but that don't mean that... I'm inclined to take it lightly myself, Mr. Latrivia, but maybe it would be better to investigate. Very well, I'll have him picked up for questioning. Uh, do you wish to sign a complaint? Sure I do. Oh, well, then, if you were wrong, dearie, there'd be nothing against you but a charge of false arrest, malicious prosecution, and invasion of private rights. That's all. You might get out of it for as little as 100000 in damages. <clears throat> Why don't I keep my big mouth shut? <laughs> Forget picking him up, Latrivia. I'll get the goods on him myself. He thinks he's trailing me. Well, I'll trail him. Well, what fun. Can I play, too? And if we all join hands, we can keep better track of each other. Well, if that's all you wanted, McGee, I'd better be running along. Uh, wait a minute. Look out the window, McGee. Huh? Where? Under that big tree across the street. Is that the man? You mean the one looking this way with his hat pulled down over his eyes? That's him. That's the guy. What's he doing? It looks like he's focusing a camera on your front door, McGee. Uh-huh. If they come out good, I'll take a dozen. <laughs> This is no time for joking, Molly. Look, Latrivia, you walk down the street and we'll see if he follows you. Me? Scared? No. I'll keep my mouth closed so he won't plant a bomb under my bridges. Oh, (laughs) man. I'll call you from my office and see what happens. Uh, We'll be watching. Uh, Goodbye, Mr. Mayor. Goodbye, Mr. McGee. And, uh, Latrivia. Yes? If if anything happens to you, I... (laughs) Well, I'll always remember you as as the best mayor we ever had. A friend of the people. He wore no man's collar. Fearless and independent. A credit to his party. <laughs> the working man's Oh, pal. stop it, stop it, for heaven's sake. Something's going to happen to me. You watch. Keep an eye on him, McGee. Good luck. Gee, I hope nothing does happen. No! Oh, heavenly days, McGee. What do oh. you suppose? Oh, my gosh. I completely forgot. Forgot what? When I realized that guy was following me, I strung a rope across the porch step. <laughs> Still out there. 
He didn't follow the mayor at all. What did I tell you? It's me he's after. Well, I don't know why he should be interested in you. You don't have any military secrets. And even if you did, everybody knows you couldn't keep them. <laughs> Which may be why you haven't got any. Maybe them guys have discovered what I'm working on. Well, then they're smarter than I am. What are you working on? You won't tell? Certainly not. Okay. I'm working on an idea for the Signal Corps. I'm going to try and breed a triple cross bird. <laughs> I'm going to cross a homing pigeon with a woodpecker and then cross the result of that with a parrot. <laughs> with what object in mind? To get a bird that will fly to the right place knock on the door and speak the message. <laughs> That's marvelous. <laughs> Why don't you work an ostrich in there, too? Huh? Then if pursued by an enemy, he can stick his head in the sand and they can't hear what he says. <laughs> Say, maybe you got something. Oh, no. That ain't practical. <laughs> I thought... For... Uh-oh. wonder if that's him. No, no. He's still across the street. Come in. Well, I'll be a Horatio K. Boomer. Hello, Mr. Boomer. Good day, my dear. And a messy May morning to you, monkey face. <laughs> Just what is it that you, th you think you can do us for today, Boomer? Now, that's no way to talk to a guest <laughs> or anybody else, McGee. <laughs> Maybe Mr. Boomer has a very legitimate reason for this intrusion, or this visit. Certainly have, my Pippin, certainly have. <laughs> Salvaging metal for the government. Wanted to see if you had any gold or silver lying around that you can spare. Gold or silver? That's what I said, pistachio puss. <laughs> now let me see, we could start with this gold wristwatch of yours, needle nose, and maybe we... I go on my watch. You nimble-knuckled nephew of Nicodemus. We won't give you a thing, Mr. Boomer, unless you have some proper credentials. I'll say not. You're as crooked as a plate of spaghetti. I wouldn't trust you as far as I could nudge the Normandy. <laughs> Let's see your credentials. Why, certainly, certainly. Credentials, credentials have them right here someplace. <laughs> now, let me see. Uh, here's a fresh package of bubble gum. Take it, my boy. What does he want with bubble gum? Don't know, my dear, but I always carry it in case I meet some little blowhard. <laughs> <laughs> How would I put those credentials? Maybe you forgot to forge any. No, I spent all yesterday afternoon. I, I'm... Mm, no, what was I looking for? Oh, yes, credentials. Uh, here's a short length of lead pipe. Had to work on a little drip last night. <laughs> Stubborn fellow. Here's a package of new $10 bills. Say, what's Lincoln's picture doing on a $10 bill? Sure, it ought to be Alexander Hamilton. Isn't that amazing? And that stupid engraver of mine majored in American history at Leavenworth. <laughs> now, are those credentials? Credentials. Here's a small woman's handbag. <laughs> Given up trying to take them from large women. <laughs> Check for a short beer. Well, well, imagine that. No credentials. Uh, uh, took the words right out of my mouth. Oh, sorry, we couldn't do any business, my tiresome little twosome. Better luck next time. Good day, my dear, and cheap cheerio to you, chipmunk. Mr. Boomer's been all this time. When a guy like him ain't been seen any place for exactly 90 days, you can draw your own conclusions. <laughs> hey, look, that spy is still out there. I think I'll go out someplace and see if I get followed some more. Oh, no, 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 don't, McGee. Something might happen. Oh, I can take care of myself. I'll wear my badge. Which one? Junior G-Man or Chicken Inspector? <laughs> Those are just gag badges, Molly. I, I got a deputy sheriff's badge from Peoria. See? Oh. Yeah. You gonna make him follow you all the way to Peoria? <laughs> oh, no. Now, look. Here's what I'll do. I'll walk kind of casual down toward the airport, then out to the steelworks. Hello, oh. folks. Hey, what are you looking so serious about? Somebody's been following McGee around, Mr. Wilcox. Yeah, and he keeps taking pictures of me. Click, 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 all day long. <laughs> Every place I go. Oh, who is he? Well, we don't know. McGee thinks he's a foreign spy. Say, that's strange. 
I had an odd experience last Saturday night myself. Yeah? I followed a suspicious-looking man all over town. Heavenly days, I'm getting the creeps. Who was he, Mr. Wilcox? A spy? That's what I thought. He first attracted my attention when I saw him come out of a doorway, sort of hiding a bundle under his coat. Oh. He looked both ways up the street and then sneaked off down an alley. Oh. Excuse me, boys, while I run up and wash my hair, I might as well do it while it's standing on end. <laughs> Wait a minute. Maybe Harlow followed the same guy that's been after me. Oh, I don't think so, Fibber. No. You see, I followed this fellow to the far side of town. Yeah. Through alleys, up side streets, over fences, and through vacant lots. Well, he could hardly go through a lot that wasn't vacant. <laughs> oh, cut it out, Molly. I want to hear this. Go on, Frank. <laughs> Finally, finally he looked around cautiously yeah. and ducked into a garage. Oh. I crept up and peeked through the window. I'll bet he was a bootlegger with a boot for one of his tires, huh? No, sir. No, sir. He took a container of Johnson's car new from under his coat, oh. and in almost no time, he had a dull, dingy-looking jalopy looking like it just came off the sales room. Oh. <laughs> you know how car new cleans and polishes in one application gives a beautiful luster with a minimum of effort? Well, sir... Now, what... wait a minute, Wilcox. What the Sam Hill was he sneaking around town for? Why wasn't he proud to be seen with a container of car new like everybody else? That's what I... I asked him. He said he didn't want anybody to tell his mother because he was surprising her by polishing her car for Mother's Day. Uh. <laughs> McGee, stop gnawing your nails. Well, it was either that or say something the sponsor might regret. <laughs> Do you have to take advantage of situations like this, Wilcox? Can't you be honest and manly and come right out and sell, Carnew? Oh, the trouble with you, Fibber, is you haven't got any sense of dramatic values. What kind of a story would Robinson Crusoe have been if Victor Hugo hadn't built up the suspense? Well, let me know if your spy is carrying Carnew, too. <laughs> Hey, Molly. Yeah? Did Victor Hugo write Robinson Crusoe? Why, of course not. It was written in the first person, so Robinson Crusoe must have written it himself. <laughs> well, that's what I thought. Everybody knows Victor Hugo wrote Sherlock Holmes. No. No, no, dearie. That was Mark Twain. <laughs> What did I say, Victor Hugo? Yeah. <laughs> I meant Mark Twain. <laughs> well, anyway, hey, what's the matter? McGee, that man is still there and still watching this house. Oh, he is, is he? Give me my hat. I'm going out and find out. No, no, McGee, be careful now. Those men are ruthless and cruel, you know. Well, what do you think I am, a Casper milkshake? <laughs> I can handle them. First, I'll chop them across the throat with the edge of my hand like this. Oh, I'll... Say, if you were as dangerous to other people as you are to yourself, I wouldn't let you out of my sight. What are you going to do, McGee? I'm going to take a walk and see if that guy follows me some more. Where are you going? I don't know. Just around town a little. Well, for goodness sakes, be careful now. I don't... Say, what are we whispering for? I don't know what you're whispering for, but I hit myself on the neck so hard I can't talk. I'll be back in a little while. <laughs> The King's Men sing America's Calling. Son of America, you're America's calling to you. To you. Father of waters, let your sons and daughters echo the cry. Thank God for freedom. Raise island palisades, guard the home of the red, white, and blue. Plains of Idaho down to Mexico. Have you seen the fields of Iowa? Have you crossed the Great Divide? Have you seen all the glories of Washington? Have you seen the giant redwoods that are California's pride? Oh, say, have you seen your America from the hills? Oh, say, have you 
behind us, Molly? Yes, he just ducked into a doorway. I'm glad you decided to come with me after all. Two of us can watch him better than just one. Think he knows we're on to him? Yes, I think he began to suspect something when you stuck your tongue out at him the first time. <laughs> he even took a picture of that. Click, click, click. <laughs> I'm getting tired of being a photographer's model for a doggone foreign spy. Click, 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 all day long. Yeah. Getting on my nerves, too, McGee. I really think you ought to call the FBI. Okay, I'll duck into the cigar store down there and call. You wait outside and see what he does. I will not. I'll come in with you and watch him through the window. I'm not going to be kidnapped and taken to Germany on a submarine. <laughs> you know how I get seasick. <laughs> oh, they won't do anything. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Look who's coming down the street. Mrs. Uppington. I wonder what she's looking so important about. About three quarters of the time, if you'll ask me. <laughs> Should we tell her about that spy following us? I think we better. He might take her for overage battleship and scuttle her. <laughs> it's unthinkable that she'd be thinkable, though. And be so- oh, hello there, Abigail, darling. Oh, how do you do, Mr. McGee? And Mr. McGee. Hi, stranger. You know you're in danger? <laughs> I beg your pardon, Mr. McGee. In danger of what? Look, Abigail, you see that fellow over there? He's a spy. Good heavens, not really. Do you suppose he could have escaped from some Alfred Hitchcock picture? <laughs> Don't take this so lightly, Uppy. For all we know, he may be planning to blow this whole town up tomorrow night. Oh, but he can't do that. Huh? I have a bridge party planned for next Friday. Oh. <laughs> Even Boston couldn't put a war off for a tea party, Abigail. <laughs> this man is dangerous. You know, he's been following McGee all day long, taking pictures and sneaking around like a regular easel. You mean weasel, Molly. Yes, and easel is used for pictures. Well, that's what they're using him for. (laughs) Now, you be careful, Abigail. You know, he's seen you talking to us, so he may include you in his dirty work. Yeah. I think this whole thing is simply ridiculous. I have a good notion to walk over to him and demand an explanation. Hmm. You won't think that's such a good notion if he pulls a gun on you. That is absurd. It's against the law to discharge firearms within the city limits. Well, maybe so. But now we're telling you, Abigail, he's a dangerous character. Uh, Well, what should I do? Just walk on unconcerned, Uppy. I'm calling the FBI in a minute. Yeah, just take it easy, Abigail. We'll let you know what happened. Oh, well, thank you very much for warning me. Oh, I do hope this spy is caught. I should be so helpless in a concentration camp. (laughs) Why you particularly? Well, Miss McGee, you know how difficult it is for me to concentrate. Well, <laughs> Well, hey, here's the cigar store. I'm going in and phone. You won't be scared. Certainly not. Now go on in and phone. Okay, I'll be right out. Me and my shadow, daddy. Oh, hello there, Mrs. McGee. Ah, oh, hello, Mr. Wimple. <laughs> See, now, don't look now, but there's a foreign spy over there taking our picture. Oh, goodness. Doesn't he look repulsive? Yes. <laughs> McGee is inside the cigar store now, telephoning the FBI. It must be quite a wave of crime and espionage in town, Mrs. McGee. You know, I caught a burglar jimmying his way into our house when I came home last night. Oh, heavenly days, really. What'd you do? I opened the door for him on condition that he'd go in first. <laughs> and did he do it? Yes. <laughs> the poor fellow. <laughs> Sweetie Face thought it was me, and before you could say, where's the iodine, she was shaking salt all over him. Salt? 
What was that for? Oh, that's just a little joke of Sweetie Faces. She likes to tie people up in knots like a pretzel and then shake salt over them. Oh. <laughs> well, you're lucky you didn't go into the house first. Oh, I don't know, Mrs. McGee. Lately, Sweetie Face has been very nice about my coming in late. The minute I tippy-toe in the front door, she gives me my slippers and my pipe and the latest novel. Oh, she does? Yes, right in the face. <laughs> it's okay, Molly. They got an agent on his way over here right now. Oh, hi, Wimp. Hello, Mr. McGee. My, you seem excited. Well, I should think he would be. You better get going, Wimp. There's a federal dick on his way over here, and there's liable to be some gunplay. You better go, too, Molly. I will not. I'll just stand behind this wooden Indian here. I'm really not an Indian, Mrs. McGee. My father... No, no, no. no. She meant this cigar store Indian, Wimp. Oh. <laughs> well, then, if you don't need me, I'll, I'll be trotting along, folks. I promise to take Sweetie Face to the circus. Oh, really? Does Sweetie Face like circuses? Oh, this is strictly business, Mrs. McGee. One of the gorillas is getting vicious, and they ask Sweetie Face to come over and slap him around a little. <laughs> well, what did the FBI say when you call them up, dearie? Oh, they said they were getting a lot of phony tips these days, but they couldn't afford to ignore any of them, so they said they'd be right away. Hey! Heavenly days, look at them. They surrounded that man before he even saw them. Yeah, he's showing them some cards. Uh-oh, they're looking over here. Boy, I bet I get a medal from the government for this. <laughs> Catching a foreign spy is a... Gee, huh? look, they're laughing. What? Yeah. <coughs> Don't tell me he's got them fooled, too. Well, we'll soon know. Here comes an FBI man. Uh, you, Mr. McGee, did you call the FBI? You're darn right I did, bud. That guy there's been following me around all day, taking pictures. Click, click, click. Every place I went. And where was that? Oh, the Elks Club and the railroad station and the airport and the powerhouse. And, and that excavation down at 14th and Oak and the softball game on the corner lot at Maple Street. Yes, and he... every place. He's a spy. That's what he is. I beg your pardon, madam. We know that man quite well, and he is not a spy. Oh, no? Well, what is he? He's a photographer for a national magazine. Well, then why has he been following my husband around all day? Yeah. Well, he told me to tell you he was sorry if he'd caused you any annoyance, but he's working on an assignment. <laughs> a likely story. <laughs> what kind of an assignment could that be? Uh, he says they wanted him to get up a picture story on how a small-town busybody spends his time. <laughs> or rubber or metal today, ladies? Have you joined the Scrap Brigade? In this week's issue of Life magazine, there's an advertisement by the makers of Johnson's Wax with suggestions to patriotic housewives on how to salvage valuable scrap materials for war production. You can help your country while you're doing your own spring house cleaning. You'll find suggestions there also on how to make your house cleaning easier all year by the regular use of genuine Johnson's Wax, paste or liquid, for protecting your floors, furniture, and woodwork. Wax provides the easy, inexpensive way to take better care of your things. It gives wood, leather, painted surfaces a shield of protection against wear. And as an extra dividend, it gives that much-desired, rich, mellow beauty that you find only in wax-protected homes. There are 100 labor-saving uses for Johnson's Wax, paste or liquid, in your home. You can now buy Johnson's Wax also in cream form, especially formulated for the care of furniture and woodwork. Hey, Molly. Yes? You know what? No, what? I think that guy fooled them, government fellas. I still think he's a spy. Oh, you do? Yes. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going out for a walk and see if he follows me anymore. Oh, my. <laughs> yes. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you who arrived late may remain for the next show. This is where you came in. <laughs> Good night. Good night. <laughs> This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson Wax Finishes for Home and Industry, inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday night, and reminding you that the government is in urgent need of 55,000 young women to enter schools of nursing this year and prepare themselves for national defense. Ask your state nurses' association for further information. Good night. Good night.
This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Service men and women, come along now to Melody Roundup. That covered wagon is joggling up to a stop beside our old corral gate. And jumping out are some rangy looking characters complete with fiddle, guitar, and saddlebag chock full with western and hill country areas. Why, it's Ezra and the Beverly Hillbillies. And climbing down from the driver's seat wearing a great big sunbonnet and a bigger smile is Melody Roundup's guest forewoman, Her Rural Highness Mirandy. Well, howdy, friends. I declare I'm sure proud of being asked to take charge of things at the old corral. <laughs> we aim to please by answering as many of your requests as we can squeeze into the next 15 minutes. So if you're all ready, Esri... We're fine and dandy, Mirandy. <laughs> then let's kick them in the sides and rack on down. Well, we're going to have Ray Whitley take the lead in our lead-off lullaby, Long About Sundown. Long about sundown In the hush of evening Jogging along feeling blue Long about sundown My head starts reeling It's that old feeling To be with you Long about sundown In the fading twilight Soft breezes whisper your name Then I hear the Bob White's call And I miss you most of all Long about sundown My dear about sundown in the fading twilight soft breezes whisper your name then I hear the Bob White's call and I miss you most of all long about sundown to my ears, well, boys. Well, good, and that's what it's supposed to be, Mirandy. <laughs> and now that I'm running things around this ranch, that's what we're going to have nothing else but. Too much loafing going on here. How about you getting on limber, Desri? Well, okay. Lem, if you give me a pitch, I'd like to answer a lot of letters by wing-dinging right into walking the floor over you. Well, good. Go ahead, Lem. Give him the pitch. Oh, <laughs> dang, John and Mirandy. I was just fixing to do a little rest. Oh, I never. What makes you so lazy and tired, Lemuel Giles? Well, I ain't tired. I'm just resting so I don't get tired. <laughs> <laughs> well, before the boys and gals get tired listening to you, I'd better sing you to sleep. Good idea, is it? You left me and you went away You said that you'd be back in just today You've broken your promise and you left me here alone I don't know why you did, dear, but I do know that you're gone and I'm walking the floor over you I can't sleep a wink, that is true I'm hoping and I'm praying As my heart breaks right in two Walking the floor over you Now darling, you know I love you well Tongue can tell 
I thought that you wanted me And you always would be mine But you went and left me here With troubles on my mind I'm walking the floor over you I can't sleep a wink, that is true I'm hoping and I'm praying As my heart breaks right in two Walking the floor over you There he goes in that keyboard too Now someday you may be lonesome too Walking the floor is good for you Just keep right on walking and it won't hurt you to cry Remember that I love you And I will the day I die And I'm walking the floor over you I can't sleep a wink, that is true I'm hoping and I'm praying As my heart breaks right in two I'm walking the floor over you That was just so pretty it rang the goosebumps out on me. <laughs> In fact, you woke me up. <laughs> well, noise, I bring my friend Miss Louise along today, and you know it ain't fair to sugar for that gal to sing as sweet as she does. Mm, she's That's right, Louise Massey. So <laughs> and yes. she's going to serenade the corporal at APO 201 named Paul Eugene Gooch. And also five fine fellas at 350. Staff Sergeant Jimmy Lucas, Master Sergeant Bill Ruby, Tech Sergeant Johnny Hunter, T5 Dick Maddox, and Private, well, heaven bless him, Doc Party. Well, gee, Miss Louise, I thought you were singing this one for little old me. Will you hash your mouth, Edry? Go <laughs> ahead, Miss Louise. <laughs> Don't worry, darling, while I'm far away Don't worry, darling, I'm doing okay That lucky star high in heaven above Is watching over the boy that I love Don't worry, darling, though parting is long We will replace every sigh with a song When it is over, we'll never say goodbye Don't worry, darling, don't cry Gee, I won't, Miss Louise. Well, I will if you don't hash up, Ezra, and get on to carving our hearts on the old oak tree. <laughs> you mean it? I'll go on and say When we carve 
of the hearts on the old oak tree. Many years ago, the words I love you still are plain to see, cause they're just below. The old oak remains staunch and true, dear, through the years like your love so divine. Since we carved our hearts on the old oak tree, your heart's been a part of mine. I'm drifting back to bygone days, dear. One scene I treasure most of all. A spot where we wouldn't meet always, dear. Perhaps, my darling, you recall For Hank Edwards at 600 and a hut full of friends at 958. And now i got to make you a little speech. <coughs> Boys and gals. Uh, <coughs> don't like to seem bulldogish, Mirandy, but I thought you said we'd have nothing but music on this roundup. Well, the air some is allowed that my speech making is kind of like music. <laughs> and there was an old lady that kissed a cow once. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not that old. <laughs> Besides, this year's speech-making has to do with music-making. Now, if any of you boys and gals want some special tune wrangled your way, you just let me know the name of it, and I'll tan Ezra's hide if he don't twang it for you. It'll be a pleasure, Mirandy. <laughs> oh, you can't sweet-talk me, young man. As I was saying, just let me hear from you. Address, Melody Roundup, Armed Forces Radio, Los Los Angeles, USA. Right now, it's time to get going back to Texas for some Lone Star Cow Punchers at 149. Give me back my saddle. Give me back my gut, give me back that good old bronco mine. Give me back my campfire when the day is done. Let me hear that lonesome coyote whine. Going back to my good old Texas home, 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 down by the sleepy Rio Grande, where the lonesome turned of this breathing, and the moon is shining on the sand. Going back where the long haul get a roam, roam, roam Where your best friend is your bronco and your gun And I know I'll never more be leaving Next to home my rambling days are done Land a Goshen, look at that sun crack on the floor Time to scatter ready. Well, I reckon we'll have to chuck the rest of these musical tumbleweeds back in the wagon till next melody roundup I've sure been proud to visit with you, and I hope you'll ask us round again. <laughs> Till then, this is Mirandy saying good luck. And, Esri, don't you want to say something on behalf of the Beverly Hillbillies? So long, gang. Spoke real nice, Esri. God love you all, and fare you well. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.
California, we present Jean Herschel in a new Dr. Christian drama called Dr. Doctor, Come Quick. Brought to you by the Cheesebro Manufacturing Company, owners of the trademark Vaseline, and producers of Vaseline Petroleum Jelly for first aid, Vaseline Hair Tonic for the care of the hair and scalp, and many other Vaseline specialties. Would you like to see the New York World's Fair or the San Francisco Exposition this summer without its costing you a penny? Well, here's a contest in which 100 first prize winners get free trips to the World's Fair, plus $150 apiece in cash. Or $250 in cash instead of the trip. Just two simple rules. First, write a letter which starts this way. I want to see the New York World's Fair because... And state your reasons in 50 words or less. Or if San Francisco appeals to you more, then write your letter accordingly. Second, enclose with your letter a carton, wrapper, or a facsimile of the label from any item which carries the trademark Vaseline, such as Vaseline jelly, Vaseline hair tonic or from any Colgate Palmolive toiletry. Then mail your entry to Vaseline Products, 17 State Street, New York City, before midnight, May 15th, when the contest closes. Write this address down. Vaseline Products, 17 State Street, New York City. Convenient entry blanks with all the rules are available at your favorite drugstore or by mail. But your answer on plain paper is perfectly acceptable. One hundred first prizes, five thousand second prizes. Think of winning a thrilling trip to the World's Fair you want most to see with all expenses paid. Write your first entry letter tonight. And now, before we get absorbed in our Dr. Christian drama, I want to ask you to wait at the end of the program for an important announcement from Mr. Gene Herschel. The curtain is rising now on tonight's play. The scene is the plaza in front of the new hospital where every man, woman, and child in River's End has gathered to listen to the dedication ceremonies. On an improvised platform between the tall white columns of the entrance sit village officials, members of the hospital board. Mr. Joseph Perino, who gave us the hospital, Judy Price, and Dr. Paul Christian, whose lifelong dream for our town is fulfilled here this day. Mayor Hewitt is standing up now. He's stepping forward now and taking his place in the center of the speaker's stand, and the applause is dying down as he begins to speak. Friends of River's End, you all know what brings us together today. We're assembled here in the plaza in front of our new hospital building to do honor to the most modest and the most useful and the most popular human being in River's End today, Dr. Paul Christian. Now... One of the things that endears Dr. Christian to all of us is that he goes about his ministrations in our community in such a matter-of-fact way. He's at everybody's beck and call, and yet he expects no praise, no thanks, and frequently he doesn't get paid for the thing he does for us in the line of his duty. So let's not embarrass him by fulsome eulogies and flowery speeches on this occasion, rather that we may have a fuller appreciation of him. Let us review together just one day in the life of our country doctor with full permission of all concerned. I'm thinking now of a day not so many Aprils ago, when the sun shone warmly, the robins chirped gaily, the river flowed happily along between newly green banks, and Dr. Christian awoke with the feeling that God was indeed in his high heaven, and River's End surely the most peaceful spot on earth. And then the telephone rang, shrill, menacing, urgent. That you, Dr. Christian? Doctor, doctor, come quick. Janet has shot herself. Oh, Dr. Christian, thank God you've come. Where is she, Mrs. Harper? Where's Janet? Oh, Dr. Christian, I thought you'd never get here. She's in there. What's happened, Mrs. Harper? What did she do? She shot herself. Right here on her side with Tommy's old rifle. Oh, Dr. Christian, don't let her die. Don't let my baby die. Hush, I need you to help me. You have to be quiet. Pull yourself together now and come in with me. Oh. Well, Janet, I hear you've had an accident. Oh, Dr. Christian, my side. It hurts. Well, that's too bad. Oh. Turn over here a little and let me have a look at it. Maybe I can make it feel better. Oh. 
Mrs. Harker, will you lift Jen this way? So, till we get a dress off. Oh, it's there. It's right there. It's the left side. Oh, Dr. Christian, say it isn't near her heart. <laughs> Sorry, Janet. It'll be a one a minute. Mm-hmm. So. Dr. Christian, what... Now, Mrs. Harper, if you'll just hold my case open. Right here, so that I can get at the dressings. Oh, hand me that bottle, please. Oh, don't touch these bandages. They're sterile. This is only antiseptic, Janet. There. Now, if you'll hold this in the place for me, Mrs. Harper. Just a little longer, Janet. There. It's over. Now you can relax. But, but the bullet. You didn't take out any bullet. The bullet never went in, Mrs. Harper. It's just a flesh wound. Nasty, but not serious. She'll have to keep quiet for a few days until it heals. Not serious? Oh, you mean she isn't... Well, then it's all right. She won't die. No, Janet won't oh, die, thank Mrs. Harper. Oh, thank God. Oh, Janet, how could you? How could you do such a thing? I did it because you said it was all my fault. Because you stood up for Mrs. Watkins and... And you said that she was right to correct me in front of the whole algebra class. I'd want to go on when everybody's down on them. When even your own mother... I <laughs> wasn't. I wasn't down on you, dear. I always said... You said, said if I was talking to boys in class and not paying attention, I I deserved to ever make fun of me and say, and say nasty things about my having my mind on something besides my work. Is that what this is all about? Oh, I wish the bullet had gone in. Nobody understands me. I might as well be Janet, dead. Janet, how can you talk that way? <laughs> Mrs. Harper, will you go out to the other room now, please, and let me see Janet alone? Oh, Dr. Christian, isn't everything all right? Everything is all right, except that I want to, to have a little talk. I'll call you if you need to, oh, Mrs. Harper. Janet, I, I want to fix it. Janet will do for the moment. Won't you please go out and... Uh, Make us some strong tea, Mrs. Harper. I think we'll all need it. Why, why, yes, if you if you really want it. Right away, please. Well, I... Janet, darling, I... Right away. Well, Janet. Yes, Dr. Christian. Was it really because your teacher reprimanded you? Yes, and, and because Mother said she was right. And because of that, you wanted to end your own life? Why, I, I... You deliberately planned to finish everything? I didn't want to stay in a world where everyone was so hateful. Oh, you don't want to be dead any more than I do, Janet. You just wanted to make a gesture. The strongest, most dramatic gesture you could think of. So that everybody would realize how badly you felt and how much they had hurt you. Wasn't that it, Janet? No. You never even stopped to think of the effect such a thing would have on other people, did you? How much suffering this would cause your mother? Don't! I... I guess I was just sort of crazy over being called down that way in front of everybody. And, and when Mom didn't understand, I... Well, I felt I had to do something terrible. And, and I saw Tommy's gun standing there in the corner. And so I grabbed it and, and pulled the trigger. Janet, uh, do you want to promise me such a thing will never happen again? Why? Why? You couldn't be <laughs> such a little fool as to ever think of repeating this, could you? Could you? No, I guess I couldn't. Is that a promise? Yes. Yes, Dr. Christian, that's a promise. Good. All right. Guess I better answer the phone. The next time people don't understand, Janet, you come and talk to me about it. Hello? Hello? Yes, Judy? Hmm? Mrs. Cochran? What did she say? What... Well, I'll go as soon as I can. You think it's urgent? You're not serious. Oh, but I don't understand. Yes, 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 Janet, it's all right. Well, if you think it's so important, I'll go right over to the Cockins from here. You didn't suspect anything until you found your husband's note, Mrs. Cochran? Suspect? Oh, yes, I suppose I did. I I suppose down deep a woman always knows when her husband is being unfaithful to her. But I, I wouldn't admit it, even, even to myself. John Summers has been his secretary for three years, and I've never... Oh, oh I've always been so contemptuous of jealous wives. I, I know. She is pretty... 
But she was always so quiet and modest and... Well, I never interfered in Dave's business affairs. I... And you don't know where he's gone, what his plans are. No. All I know is that he's gone away and taken Joan Summers with him. Oh, Dr. Christian, you must be crazy. I, I can't believe that he really loves her. But if he does, why didn't he tell me? Why, why didn't he do this with some, some dignity, not just run off that way? Well, men do curious things when they are in an emotional muddle, Mrs. Cochran. And the more intelligent they are, the sillier they seem to become. Yes. Oh, I, I don't know what to do. Mrs. Cochran, has Dave been himself lately? Has he seemed well and normal? Oh, no, no. He, he's acted terribly worried. He said things were bad at the bank, but I guess that was only an excuse. It was really this. If I could only see him, only talk to him. Oh, yes, maybe he could listen to you. Dr. Christian, this will ruin him. He's had such a brilliant career. The youngest bank president in the state. Why did he do it? If he'd only come to me honestly, we could have worked it out some way. I, I can't understand how he, how he could do such a terrible thing. I there, there. Don't only cry, Mrs. Cochran. Oh. <laughs> Shall I answer that for you? You probably don't feel like talking just now. Oh, would you? Of course. Thank you. Hello? Yes? Yes, Judy. What? Spike Morse? A mad dog? Or who says it's mad? Well, did they catch the dog? He did bite him several times. Now have them watch the dog carefully. You'll have to keep it under observation. Keep Spike there in the office. I'll come right over. Yes, yes, right away. Goodbye. I'm sorry I have to run away, but the stray dog just bit Spike Morse. Judy's little nephew. Oh. And they think the animal is mad. I've got to cauterize the wounds at once. Oh, a mad dog. Oh, how terrible. Now, don't bother about me, Dr. Christian. Go to Spike right away. Hurry, you've got to save that boy. Thank you, Judy. Well, he's coming out from under the anesthetic. Is he in pain? No, the worst of it is over. But cauterizing those wounds was absolutely necessary, and I couldn't see doing it without an anesthetic. Is it all done? Yes, all done, Spike. It hurts. It'll feel better pretty soon. I'm dizzy. I know, but that'll pass too. What made the dog bite you, Spike? Did you tease him? Yes, I guess I did. I didn't mean to make him cough, but all of a sudden he... He began to snarl and run around in circles, and then he barked. And... But what were you doing to him? Oh, we were just taking his bone away and throwing it and making him run for it. Taking his bone away? Well, don't you know you should never interfere with a dog when he's eating? But he was just chewing a bone. I don't think I like dogs anymore. Dr. Christian, this dog wasn't... Wasn't mad, was he? Now, Spike, that... Wouldn't you have been mad at anyone who took your dinner away like that? But I mean, really. Dr. Christian, I'm scared. Spike, listen. Maybe this is a lesson to teach you never to tease a dog when he's eating. You know, probably you're going to have just a row of little scars on your leg to remind you. I'm, I'm never going to touch another dog. Oh, now, that would be foolish. Spike, do you know how many different kinds of dogs there are? Turn away. I want to show you something. Still feel sort of dizzy. Well, I'm going to give it this to take home. You can look at it when you feel better and learn everything there is to know about dogs. What is it? It's a book. It tells you all about dogs and how to take care of them. What you should and should not do to them. And how to teach them some good tricks. Dang. Gee, it's got well pictures. You can take those things away now, Judy. All right, Dr. Christian. I'll get it in here, Doctor. Dr. Christian's office. Hello? It's Judy Price. Yes. Well, he's busy with a patient now, Mrs. Summers. I... Yes? Of course you can trust me. What? Oh, but the blue flyer doesn't stop until it gets to Chicago. 11.15, I think. He'd never catch up with it. Oh, but it's impossible. You... Well... Well, I'll ask him. 
Oh, don't cry so, Mrs. Summers. We, we'll try to do something. You wait just a minute. Dr. Christian, will you come in here for just a moment, please? It's important. What is it, Judy? Close the door, please. Mrs. Summers, Joan's mother on the phone. Poor soul, she's in hysterics. Dr. Christian, she says Joan and David Cochran are on the blue flyer. They took it at Center City. Well, then no one can stop the murder. But she thinks they can. She says Mayor Hewitt got suspicious and they've sent for the bank examiner. They think there may be a shortage at the bank. Oh, why, that can't be. Why, David Cochran is no crook. The man's going crazy. Can't you see if someone doesn't make him come back, if, if he has taken the money? It's why, incredible. Dr. Christian, Mrs. Summers wants someone to go to Chicago, catch them there before the police are notified and bring them back here. Then maybe the mess can be straightened out. Oh, but how can they? A cross cut over the mountains. Oh, it'll be terrible driving, I know, but it might be done. It's impossible. Why, after dark... There's only it... one person who could do it. You could drive that road blindfold. And think what it means if you bring him back. Oh, Dr. Christian, you've got to try. For the sake of River's End, you've got to try. Chicago that I'm worried about. Traffic and all. Don't think. Just drive. Can he say what uh, made him suspect the shortage? No, he said he didn't want to talk to anyone about it just yet. He said he'd call you in the morning. Well, it's bound to get out. As far as we know, though, only Mrs. Cochran and Joan's mother know. Well, let's hope they don't talk. Well, that's to their advantage not to. And women can keep secrets, Dr. Christian. Look how sporting Mrs. Cochran's been, keeping it to herself all this time that Dave was... Judy, I still can't believe Dave Cochran is a crook. But has it occurred to you that he might be faking this elopement to cover up the theft? Oh, no. Oh, and that pretty little Joan Summers, I can't imagine her being mixed up in this either. She's so prissy. Sweet 25 and never been kissed, Jerry calls it. Ah, those are the worst kind sometimes. What else did Mrs. Summer have to say about the bank trouble? Oh, she was so emotional, I gave up trying to find out. Did nothing all day but talk to weeping women on the telephone. Sort of got me down toward the last. <laughs> Poor Judy. <laughs> oh, I'm all right. They're the ones to be sorry for. Anyway, there was nothing about it in the last news broadcast. No. I'll turn in again at 10.30. It's the gossip that I'm most afraid of. The word of mouth news that spreads through town. Yes. Start to run in the bank. Ooh, that would be bad, wouldn't it? Yes. You can wreck a bank. Wreck a town, too. Isn't it the way everything everyone does in a small place like River's End is tied up with the welfare of the whole town? You can't just figure that what you do concerns you. You're delaced. Oh, small town's almost like a family. It has the same problems and lots of the same blessings. Well, you're certainly the head of the River's End family. Honestly, when I think of the things you've done... Well, I think what I'm going to do this time, Judy, because the head of the family is in a bad spot. Why? What do you mean, Dr. Christian? Well, you figure it out. I've got one chance in a million of getting to the station ahead of the blue flyer. But even if I do, how can I stop those people? Judy, what on earth am I going to say? an outrage, Dr. Christian, an outrage. How dare you interfere with my affairs in this fashion? I'm sorry, Dave. Uh, well, Porter, will you please get into my car? It's here just outside the entrance. You deprived my secretary's in it waiting for us. But why should I? I don't understand you, Dr. Christian. Well, well, if I must speak plainly. You and Miss Summers left Rovers End together after you had written a note to your wife, explaining that you were uh, eloping. You didn't expect Mrs. Cochran to find a note until tomorrow, but the... She came back from her mother's ahead of time, and she read it. She would have tried to persuade you to come back anyhow and work this out in some sort of an intelligent way, but when we discovered about the shortage at the bank... The what? The shortage at the bank. We decided to... I don't know what you're talking about. What shortage? My car is right here. Uh, but I... We... Get in. But I tell you... Judy, you stay in the front seat, where you can listen to the radio. All right. We'll have another newspaper bulletin before long. 
Miss Somers, you and Mr. Cochran get into the back seat. I'll do no such thing. I... I think you will, Mr. Cochran. And uh, how do you expect to make me? If you don't, I'll be forced to call the police. The police? What for? You wouldn't like that, Dave Cochran. Neither would I. But you're by your own statement leaving your home and your wife. And there's a large sum of money missing from the bank of which you're president. You won't return with me. There's nothing I can do but call the police. But I don't know anything about the money. We just wanted to get away. It's our own affair, Dr. Christian. If we want to do it this way, I don't see why. Do you really think you can find happiness this way, Joan? A fugitive, an outcast, cut off from your mother and your friends? I, I love Dave, Dr. Christian. And so you let him ruin himself, lose his position, and his friends, and his place in the world... Just for you. It's too late to talk about it now, Dr. Christian. We've got to go. Come, Joan. Hey, Cochran. I've got to take you home back with me if I have to get a police escort to do it. The bank examiner is going over your accounts. The examiner? But the accounts are all right. A shortage has been discovered. Don't you realize this means ruin? I... I don't know what to do. Do? What can you do but go back? Prove your innocence, if you are innocent. Your life's been shot with success, Dave. You don't realize what it would mean to face dishonor and distrust and the scorn of everyone who knows you. Oh. You might as well think about this, too. Don't listen to him, Joan. It isn't true. But it is true. I've let you wreck your life. Oh, we've got to go back. It's too late now. We can't go back. Dr. Christian, Dr. Christian. Yes. Got another news broadcast. Turn it up. But what is on this side? They may have some news from the bank. The announcement of the confession of Elmer Clark, cashier of the bank, to having embezzled more than fifty thousand dollars from the Rivers End Bank during the past three years. The president of the bank, David Cochran, is in Chicago on a business trip, and efforts to reach him have thus far failed. Dave, did you hear that? Elmer Clark. I can't believe it. Now, Doctor Christian, I've got to go back right away. Oh, oh no, no, I can't do that. Yes, you can, Dave. You must. But. But what about us? Oh, we don't matter. We must have been crazy to think we did. That we could do a thing like this. Oh, but, Joan, we can't go back. You... Everybody will know. Nobody will know. Lillian... She wants you to come back. Come back and settle this thing openly and honestly. Will you do it that way? Yes. We'll do it that way. Won't we, Dave? If that's what you want, that's what we'll do, Joan. We'll drive back together. I'll make all the explanations. When you were on a business trip and met in Chicago, and you decided to drive back with us. <sighs> What's the matter, Dr. Christian? Oh, I just realized I'm a little tired. I think I'll let Dave drive. And I'll relax in the back seat of the car, try to snatch some sleep. I've got a date to take little Johnny Hill's tonsils out at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. So in recognition of all our beloved Dr. Paul Christian has done for the folks of River's End, and as the crowning achievement of a life of service, we dedicate this beautiful modern hospital building to a good man and his good works. Hersholt, star of these Dr. Christian programs, has an announcement of special interest to make to you tonight. So don't turn your dials. He'll be out here in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about our products. Marceline jelly is the handiest thing in the house for chopped hands, minor burns, cuts, and scrapes. Why? Because it does three important things for injured or irritated skin. One, it forms a protective film against outside infection when the skin is broken. Two, it promotes quick healing. And three, it softens and lubricates the skin by supplementing the natural oils. And here's a tip for men and women who are troubled with dry scalp and loose dandruff. Try Vaseline hair tonic. This different hair tonic contains no harsh ingredients which tend to dry the scalp. Instead, Vaseline hair tonic actually supplements the natural scalp oils. Massage your scalp thoroughly with Vaseline hair tonic before your next 
every day to keep your hair handsome and healthy. When you buy Vaseline hair tonic or Vaseline jelly or any other product bearing the trademark Vaseline, save the carton and close it with your letter of 50 words or less telling why you want to see the World's Fair. It may start you on your way to a free trip to New York or to San Francisco. Remember to mail your entry before May 15th when the contest closes to Vaseline Products, 17 State Street, New York City. The artists you heard in tonight's Dr. Christian drama were talented Rosemary DeCamp in the role of Judy Price, Gloria Holden in the role of Lillian Cochran, Gerald Moore as Mayor Hewitt, Myra Marsh as Mrs. Harker, Betty Jean Haney as Janet Harker, Eric Burtis as Spike Morse, Frank Martin as David Cochran, Dorothy Lovett as Joan Summers, David Kerman as the radio announcer, and Jean Hersholt, our star, in the role of Dr. Christian. Thank you. I'm going to accept your applause tonight for Dr. Christian. And then I'm going to step out of character to say a few words to you as plain Jean Hersholt. Because I have some real news for all of you who have come to love the wise and kindly country doctor whom we try to portray for you each Tuesday night. My news is both good and bad. The bad part is that this is the last Dr. Christian program for this season. The good part is that next fall you are going to meet Dr. Christian again. Not only on the radio, but on the silver screen as well. Some of you have written to me asking to see Dr. Christian in the movies. Well, you're going to see him and Rivers End and various of the other folks who make our town an interesting place in which to live. I want to thank you all for your interest and in support the place in which to live. I want to thank you all for your interest and support which makes it possible for the makers of Vaseline products to bring you these programs. I want to invite you all also to write to me and tell me which of the stories you heard this year you like best. Your letters will help us to bring to you the kind of radio and screen entertainment you want. So please don't be shy. Sit down and write me this week. I'll guarantee you that I'll read every one of your letters myself if it takes all summer. And I'll enjoy doing it too. You can address me in care of this station. Now I have just one more word I'd like to say. And this is something very, very personal. And yet I think that I want you all to share it with me. Exactly 25 years ago today, Mrs. Herschel and I were married here in California, and so this is our silver anniversary. And may I just take a moment to say, Thank you with all my heart to that wonderful girl who has given me those 25 years of her life. Wonderfully happy years of companionship and understanding. And to our radio friends, wherever you are, won't you in your homes join with my wife and me and ours with a toast to happiness and peace for everyone. Thank you, and good night. On behalf of the makers of Vaseline Corporation, we say goodbye to our radio friends for the season. We'll be back with you next fall. We don't know the exact date yet, but we'll be glad to advise you if you're right. And you're going to see Gene Herschel as Dr. Christian in the movies, as well as hear him on the radio. To help us bring you the kind of radio and screen entertainment you want, Gene Herschel invites you to write to him and tell him which of this year's stories you have liked best. Address your letters to Gene Herschel in care of this station. Until next fall, then, the makers of Vaseline Jelly, Vaseline Hair Tonic, and other Vaseline specialties say, we'll be seeing you. Arthur Gilmore speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
fiery horse with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high old silver, the Lone Ranger. <laughs> faithful Indian companion, Tonto, the masked rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. The stories of his strength and courage, his daring and resourcefulness have come down to us through the generations, and nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse, Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. A thing on the trail ahead. Two men sprawled beneath the hot sun on the broken rock-strewn ground of the open plain. One of these was dead, the other more nearly dead than alive. He could hear the clatter of approaching horses, but he was too weak to lift his gun to fire another shot at those whom he believed to be returning killers. A dying driver of a stagecoach saw the man who wore the mask. He was sure that there would be a sudden shot that would end for all time the racking pain of many wounds. Hold there! Hold silver! Hold! Oh, no fella, hold! One fellow's still alive. Take a look at the other, Toto. I'll see what I can do for this man. Ah, uh, take a look. Steady, boy. Stay there, silver, big fella. Go on. Shoot me again. Get it. Get it done with. I'm not going to shoot you. I'm here to help you. T- too late. Here, let me help you. Take a drink of water. Help, Pete. On the fellow dead. He is, Toto. Uh. I'm going fast. Who are you? I'm a friend. I uh, I want to know who shot you. I, I don't. I don't know. I saw the tracks of the stagecoach nearby. Are you the driver? Me. Me. Guard. Other. Pete. Pete's the driver. Yeah, try to swallow some more water. Uh, Hello. Can you do anything for the wound? Oh, can't I see. Do much, eh? Well, now take it easy. Thought I was going to put a bandage on your wound. Dirty killers. For the stage. Where's the stage? They drove it away. It's, it's gone. I'm tired. It's getting dark. Hmm. Huh. six heading this way. Him less better. All right, Tonto. Now tell me, have you any idea who did this? What? I said, have you? Tonto. Couldn't tell a thing about this. Toto, whoever killed these men are the most... You look yonder. What's that? Riders come this way. I have six riders. I see them. Get ready, Toto. We may have to fight them right here. Maybe the outlaw's coming back. Um, you ready? Hold on. That's the sheriff. You know him? Yes. That's Curly Bedford, the sheriff from Ransville. Uh, him know you? I know, Toto. Oh, not bad. Not plenty bad. Maybe him yeah, think you... I see what you mean. Well, you're right. You think we did this. You ready for a fast break, Tonto? We may have to get away from here in a hurry. Um, you ready? Stand right here! Don't try to mount! Oh, no. Steady, oh, steady. Get your hands up! Yeah, Face them up! We got the drop on you. 
Brad, you and Sam take a look at those two and see if they're done for. Hey, you didn't take the trouble to examine them, Sheriff Bedford. They're both dead. Oh, they are, huh? Well, I reckon you ought to know. Take the guns, Red, and take the mask off the tall one. Just a minute. Now, say, how'd you know my name? I've seen you before, Sheriff Bedford. I've been in Ranceville several times. Yeah? Well, where's the stage? I don't know. The rest of your gang made up with it, huh? Well, we'll find a way to loosen up your tongue when we get you to town. Red, I told you to take their guns. I, uh, I wouldn't try it, Red. Hey, look here. We can start shooting if you want us to. Tonto and I had nothing to do with these murders. We came here when we saw vultures circling. Hey, I don't believe a word you're talking about. We found one of these men still living. We found that there was nothing that could be done to help him. I tried to learn from him who shot the guard and driver and robbed the stage. But he couldn't tell me. Hey, you're only wasting your time, mister. We're taking you into Ransville. You can go peaceful or go horizontal, whichever you want. You'll uh, let us mount our horses, won't you? Sure, mount up. But let Red take your guns first. Why doesn't he come and take them, then? Dread it. I don't like the way he stands there, Curly. He looks like a man who could drop them hands and jerk his guns in the flash of an eye. Oh, take his guns. How about it? Will you let me? Come in close and try and see what happens. You see, Curly, Dad Reddit, he'll grab me and use me for a shield as sure as I'm alive. Not up, Tonto. Uh-huh. How about it, Curly? Going to shoot me because your deputy won't do what he's told? Steady, fella. <laughs> Steady, boy. Oh, I'll there. take on my own self. Come on, man. That's what I hope. Hey, let me go. Get going, Tonto. Get him on You men fire and you'll hit your sharp. Let go or you'll hang. Put me down, I tell you. Throw him, Silver. Sheriff down. Let him go, do you hear? You'll pay for this. You'll pay, I tell you. Listen to me, Sheriff. Listen. Oh, you wait. You tell me. You'll be letting the real killers get away scot-free. I'd kill those men. You think I'd stay there and wait for you to capture me? Hoping you'd be sensible, but you're not. I'll get square for this. I'm going to let you down now. Oh, there, Wolf Silver, Wolf Fella. Oh, you wait. I'll get you again if I have to scour this county with 200 deputies. You can walk back to your men and your horse. When I find the murderers of the stage guard and driver, I'll turn them over to you. Come on, Silver. <laughs> Meanwhile, far off in another direction, six horses, cruelly driven, pulled a bouncing stage across rocky ground where there were no tracks left. Half a dozen men on horses rode alongside the stage. Two men sat upon the seat. All right, Dirk, right up here. This place is as good as any. Hey, up, boy! Oh, 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 you got away with this cargo in neat order, huh, Yeah, we sure have did, Blackie. As far as I know, both the guard and driver was left there. Mighty close to it. <laughs> Don't matter anyhow. They didn't get a look at our faces. Yeah, I'd hate to ride on that thing all the time. Yeah, me too. <sighs> Give me a good horse and saddle instead of one of them things. Now, come on, you boys. Get the mailbags off the stage. Hurry it up and don't stand around waiting for instructions. You know what you're to do. Yeah, it was a sight easier to take the whole stage than to unload it and tote the mailbags on our horses. Even if it was tough riding for a time. Yeah, unhitch the stage horses, Dick. Mm, right. I'll give you a hand when the boys are unloading the mail. We'll set fire to the stage and let her burn. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's too bad we can't use these horses. They're good ones. Yeah, only they ain't saddlebred. We'd have no use with stage pulling horses. Yeah, I reckon we'll just have to leave them go. How about those mail sacks? They're most all off the stage now. Now, cut them open, then. I want to go through the mail. Blackie hurriedly went through the mail, selecting certain letters that looked as though they might hold money. When the last of the sacks was unloaded, his men helped him. Meanwhile, Dirk finished unhitching the horses. Get going. You two get, get along there. Yeah, that takes care of them. How about the mail, Blackie? Well, we'll make enough out of this to make the hold up worthwhile. <laughs> Good. I figured maybe Big Dan will be stringing this along. You know it's better than to try and do that. How many stages have we got to dispose of? He didn't say. He just said that he'd tell us when we'd waylaid enough of them. Oh, doggone. Look at the cash holding money in this letter. Hey, it must be close to $500 here. Good. Put it with the rest. And when we're all done, we'll pack up and set fire the rest of the mail when we burn the stagecoach. Well, uh, Blanky, uh, maybe we could uh, go to Big Daniel and tell him that there wasn't any cash on the stage. Then we could tell him he'd have to pay us if he wants us to keep on with his robbing and wailing. You don't tell Big Daniel things that ain't true, Dirk. Mm -hmm. Big Daniel never got as far as he has by being took in by men like us. He's a doggone smart schemer. 
And if he hadn't wanted to be a lawyer and a banker, well, he could have made a fortune any one of a dozen other ways. Oh, all right. I only suggested it, that's all. Uh, Blackie. Yeah? Just why does Big Daniel want us to do this? I didn't ask him. I don't see what he gets out of it. I don't either. But you can bet your boots he'll get his or he wouldn't have had us do this. <laughs> Blackie, I bet Jim Mosey will be hit hard when he finds that his stage is gone, eh? <laughs> they won't never find the stage. I can tell you that right now, Gail. But, Pa, why are you so sure of that? Well, it's just a feeling I've got, that's all. I reckon we're licked, honey. Licked and done for. Pa, how can you say such things? You, Jim Mosley. Why, they used to call you Fighting Jim Mosley. <laughs> Fighting Jim. And now, just because you've lost a stage and cargo, you're ready to call quit. Gail, I never did tell you all that was going on. Now, Pa, I know that the guard and driver were friends of yours, and you feel mighty bad about having them killed, but, well, they wouldn't have wanted to die any other way. You know that. Old Slim always said he hoped he'd die in harness with his boots on. Gail, you talk up like a brave girl, honey. But when you're fighting the things we're up against, courage don't play no part in winning out. Why? Have you seen that slicker from the east that's been around town since morning? Yes. I I saw him when I passed the hotel. He's the one. The one? What one? The one we've got to lick. We can't do it because... Well, I, I don't know the rules of the game he's playing. I, I don't understand, Pa. But look, Gail. There he is now. He's coming in here. May I come in? You are in... Close the door. I suppose you want to look at the stage line's office and see if it's the way you'd like to have it when you take it over. When I take it over? Well, you haven't got it yet. So if you don't have any business here, go on back to the hotel. Now, that's no way to speak. Oh, no way to speak, eh? You're the owner of the stage line? That's me. Jim Mosley. I've heard a lot about you, Mosley. They used to call you Fighting Jim, didn't they? Is that all you come here to say? Now, you shush up and let me speak. We don't know who you are, stranger, so maybe you've got the advantage. I'll tell you who he is. He's Mr. Tupping. He wants my stage line. Oh. He's tried all manner of tricks to get it. He started out by making offers through Big Dan over at the bank. You never told me, Pa. I won't sell this line. I built this stage line up from nothing. I built it when the stages ran at a loss. I fought Redskins all along the trail from here to St. Joe. I know you did, Jim. Yeah. And when you found I wouldn't sell out, you told Big Daniel to get tough. Make threats against me. But I'm not but I'm the one. glad you're here. By Juniper, I am glad you come here. At last we can have the showdown. I hope it come. You want a showdown? The same old fighting Jim I've always heard about. Well, you've taught me a new way to fight. When you couldn't scare or bluff me into selling out, I suppose you handled things your own self instead of letting Big Daniel handle them for you. You hired killers. You sent them out to wreck the stage. Well, that didn't make me sell so you stole another and shot my friends. Ah, oh, you can't accuse a man like that. Well, I am accusing him. I'm calling you. I heard you. You figured that if you wrecked enough of my stages, I'd go broke and have to sell out. You turned to robbery and murder to get what you wanted. Well, two can play at that game, Tupping. All I wanted was to know the rules. Ah, oh, in the name of goodness, stop. That's gunpowder talk. That's what it's meant to be. But you, you can't want say... the stage line, eh? You'll kill two good men to get it. Well, then try and kill the third man. You got a gun under that coat of yours. I can see the butt end sticking out. Pa, stop. One minute, Mosley. One minute, nothing. You made the rules of the game, Tuppen. And the rules say that murder is all a part of it. Well, let's have the showdown here and now. Reach for that shooting iron. It's you or me. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger story. Before the next exciting scenes... Please permit us to pause for just a few moments. Now to continue our story. The owner of the stage line, who had suffered loss of stages and death of his friends was livid faced with fury as he shouted at the man dressed in the clothes of an Easterner. You hurt me, Mr. Tubbing. Reach for that gun. It's either that or I'll have to shoot you like I would a polecat in my cellar. And I'd just as soon do it. No, you won't, Jim. It'd hang you. <laughs> hang me? What's the difference? Hang me or shoot me? I don't care which it is. I've lived. 
I've lived to see my stage line amount to something. Hi, you've got to stop and listen. You stand back, girl. But if you don't, I then... can see the stage line taken from me, or I can drill you and know that it'll be rid you of your prey to get it. And if they do hang me, Gail will be able to carry on where I left off. What if I uh, don't draw, Jim? And I'll shoot you anyway. I'm drawn right now. Just the way you did when you fought with General Custer? I'm shooting anyhow. I'm drawn right now. Uh, what? The way you did when you helped the Texas Rangers? Oh, hold on, hold on, uh... How'd you know about those times? Remember that time that you warned the Texas Rangers about an ambush? You told them about 50 men who were up ahead of them? Yeah, I remember that. And then fought side by side with six Rangers and cleaned out the gang? Your wife stood right near you then, Jim. Just as your daughter standing there now. Only she wasn't telling you not to shoot. She was yelling, fight, Jim, fight, Jim. And loading your guns for you as fast as you could empty them. Uh, yeah, I, I remember... You couldn't shoot a man that wouldn't draw his gun to defend himself, Jim. Not you. I, say, who the Sam... Who are you? Ain't your name Tupping? Jim, I'm not from the East. But Big Dan, the lawyer, banker. I want to have a talk with Big Dan. I want to know more about this Easterner named uh, Tupping. You're not Mr. Tupping? I'm from Texas. Oh, Pa, you hear that? He's not from the East. He's from Texas. I was with your old friends just after they'd been shot. I was with one of them when he died. He was? The sheriff wanted to arrest me for the murder. That's why I came here in disguise. Oh. And Jim, Otto found your stagecoach or what was left of it. They burned it. They... They did, eh? I suspected I'd never see it again. You helped the Texas Rangers once, Jim. Now perhaps a man that taught a lot of those Texas Rangers can help you. Let's sit down and have some facts. Big Dan had studied law and owned the bank in Rainsville. A combination made it possible for him to do just about as he pleased and get away with it. So clever was Big Dan in his handling of affairs that no one suspected him of underhanded dealings. In fact, he enjoyed the goodwill of almost everyone. He was sitting in his office when Fighting Jim Mosley walked in. Well, Jim, come and sit. Close the door. Well, thanks, Dan. Have a cigar? No, no thanks. I can't get the knack of burning tobacco instead of chewing it. I came here to have a talk about my stage line. Oh, yes, I heard about your hard luck. Sure is too bad, Jim. I was mighty sorry when the sheriff told me he'd found your garden driver dead. He got it, all right. The sheriff says he had the critter that did it, but he made his escape. Mm -hmm, that's what I heard. There was an Indian with him, too. Daniel, do you think there'd be any chance that this man you spoke of would have hired men to wreck the stage? Who? The man you told me about, Mr. Tupping. One you said had been trying to buy me out. Oh, Tupping. Well, Jim, it's hard to say. Tupping wants your stage land mighty bad. So you said. And you know how it is. He's got lots of cash. When men like that want something, he usually get it. You think he'd go that far? Yeah. I mean, murder? It couldn't be proved, Jim. No, I know from my experience as a lawyer that we can never prove anything against him. Even if he did hire men to make trouble. I savvy. I'm sorry, Jim. Mighty sorry. Well, I suppose the thing to do is to take the advice of a man like you. You're a businessman. You're a lawyer. Yeah. Well, what did you suggest? Well, Jim, as a friend of yours and as a businessman, I suggest you take a fair deal and sell out. Mm. What's a fair deal? Well, you know what Mr. Tubbing offered. That wasn't a fair price. Why, the horses alone are worth more than he was willing to pay me. You had some losses since his offer, you know. Maybe you'll have to pay a little less now. Less? Why, you... I know how you feel. You feel that the business you build up is worth something. But that's just your point of view. It is worth something. It's worth a heap more than Tupping offers. Well, of course, if you want me to write him again, I'll do hey, it. But, I uh... thought that strange around the hotel was Mr. Tupping. No, I don't know who he is. A salesman of some sort of rigging. Mm. Well, look, look here, Dan. You tell Tupping if he wants to make a deal... He's got to come here. Come here? But he's way in the east. I still say he's got to come here if he wants to make a deal. I won't do business with a man I can't see face to face. Jim, business methods have changed since you were a young man. Now well, I, I ain't changed, and I'm the man that's doing business. You write and tell him I'll sell out, but I've got to see him. He can come here if he wants to take over my stage line. All right, if that's the final word. It is. <laughs> Each evening, the stranger, dressed as an Easterner, left town and after darkness had fallen, went to a small camp near the town of Rainsville. There he met Tonto and the great horse, Silver. It won't be long, Silver, and we'll be riding again. Uh, uh, rest makes Silver want to get way, huh? Uh, Things are shaping up, Tonto. 
Right, and Jim is willing to help us. Um, and good. The information we had when we started for Ranceville is right. We'll have a trap for the biggest crook in the West. But maybe trap not work. Him plenty slick. If we don't catch him with this trap, Kimosabi, we'll have to find some other way. You're watching things in town? Uh, me watch plenty close. Good. We may have to wait some time. But Tano, I don't think we will. The crook is too anxious to get control of the stage line. Several days went by. And then as Gail Mosley was passing the bank, Big Dan came to the door and called. Oh, Gail! Gail Mosley! Yes, sir? Step over here, won't you? I've got word for your father. Oh, have you? Yes, uh, Mr. Tupping has written to me. Oh. He's ready to come out here and talk about buying the stage line for your father. Oh, now, don't look so, Miss Gale. After all, there'll be cash enough to make you and your father rich, compared to what most folks are. Eh? But Pa didn't want to sell at any price. I understand, but sentiment must have no part in business. No, I... I suppose not. You tell your father to step around when he can, and I'll advise him. I'll tell him. I'm glad you came right away, Jim. Now I can sit in when you confer with Tubby. Reckon you can, Dan. Unless you'd sooner have someone else. Of course, being your banker as well as your lawyer, I can be in a better position than anyone oh, else. Oh, it don't matter. I reckon all I'll need will be a witness when I sell out the line. You can sign as a witness, same as anyone else. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll try and talk Tubby into paying a little more. Just for the goodwill of the business, you see. All right. Then that's settled, eh? Yep. You'll be with me when he comes here. Good enough. When's he coming? Hey, now, let me see. I'll have to check back on his letter here. Could I have that uh, letter? It's addressed to me. Yeah. He says he'll be here on the 10th of the current month. He's coming on your own stage line. Good. I'll arrange to meet him. 10th of the month, he say. Right. I'll be waiting. On the morning of the 10th, Jim Mosley went to the office of the sheriff. You said that you'd help out if there was a chance of getting the critters that killed the guard and driver. So I will, Jim. No matter what you have to do? No matter what. All right, then, that's settled. I'll call in my friend. Hey, mister, come on in here. Sheriff's ready. Good. Hello, Sheriff. Oh, you're still around, eh? Mister, I've been wondering just what you're here in town for. You'll find out, Sheriff, before the day is over. You and Jim will have to go for a ride with me, and you'll, you'll have to wear masks. What? Masks? Now, Sheriff, you pr- promised. All right, then, I promise, and I'll see you through, but what are we going to do? Jim will, will tell you while I use the back room to change my clothes. I have other clothes here, better for riding. All right, go ahead. Now, what's this about masks, Jim? Sure. Sheriff, we got to pose as stage robbers and stop the westbound that's supposed to bring Mr. Tupping here. Hmm, for what? <laughs> Set a crook to ca- catch a crook. Critter that was to change clothes. You ought to be ready by this time. Come on, Sheriff. You! So you're the one, and you and the redskin. Why, I wondered why your voice was familiar. Come with me. Out on the horses are waiting in back of your office. We're going to stop the stage. So the westbound, rumbling along with a fast cliff, cliff, was suddenly overtaken by three masked men. Stand up, you heard us. He wants to get that seat. Now, wait. Don't shoot us. Don't shoot. We're stopping. Get out of that seat. Where are the passengers? Only got one. Get out, stranger. Uh, no, wait. Hold on. Hurry up. Get out, out of that stage. You guard, driver, passenger, the three of you line up. Hold on, on quickly. Uh, hold on. Now, let me speak. We've got our orders. Too bad that we can't let the big boss get into a jam by having survivors tell what we look like. Hold on, you doggone. Oh, don't you know who I am? What's the matter? Now, don't grill me. I'm working for the big boss, too. You? You don't even know who he is. Yes, I do. I'm working for Big Daniel, I tell you. You touch me and you wish you didn't. I'm in on things. Hey, take care of the garden driver. What are you doing on the stage if you're working for Big Dan? I got a pose as an Easterner to put through the deal. I suppose you'll direct this stage so the price will come down. Put through what deal? Ask Dan. You'll convince us that you're working for him or take hot land. You know the deal. He's going to buy the line. He's got to show up a buyer, and I'm riding to Ransfield. The pose is the same. Maybe you're the one that headed that last raid. Yeah, I am. Well, I guess this fellow's to go back to town with us, isn't he? You didn't handle it all alone, did you? Oh, sure not. The rest of the boys are in Amaranthi. I can get them and prove to you who I am. We've got to be sure of you, though. What did you do with the stage the last time? I burned it. 
Took the cash from the mail, then burned the mail, too. The same as you'll do this time. Is that enough? That's enough for me. Take off your mask, Jim. You dirty, ornery, murdering polecat. Jim. Jim Mosley. Get doggone right, and here's my badge. The sheriff. That's all we need. By Juniper, at last, we've got the goods on Big Dan. Let's get going. Big Ten, we want you. Uh, sheriff, Come on, Mr. Blackie. Uh, Here's your polecat, that killer, Dan. We took him from the stage. Just to make sure, Dan, then we look at the letter you said you had for Mr. Tuppy. Oh, no, no, yeah, there it is. Get the envelope, Jim. Here it is. Now, let me, let me see the postmark on, on the envelope. Oh, wait, Sheriff. Let me explain about that. Ah, this, never yet. mind. This explains everything. This letter was mailed a long time ago. You just faked a letter from Tupping and put it in this envelope from the East. You never thought to check the date on the postmark. Black has confessed, Dan. The deputies are getting the rest of his gang over to Amaranthe. And I, I'm going to keep my stage. And, and Big Dan, you're going to pay for all damages before you go on trial for planning a murder. Hey, that masked man, Sheriff, get him back. i got to thank him. And Gail wants to thank him. He's out there in the saddle. Wait! Wait, mister! Oh, oh, you have just heard is a copyrighted feature of the Lone Ranger Incorporated. 